This is Audible. A New World Sanctuary Written by John O'Brien Narrated by Mark Gagliardi Running Through the Jungle Part 1 Are you still alive? I need help. Those words, emblazoned on the small screen of my phone, knock me for a loop. The tiny words are in stark contrast to their meaning. I feel rocked, not only because of whom the text is from, but because of what it means. I had been prepared that we would start right away on creating a place of haven once we landed. The words on the screen mean another trip is necessary, in addition to everything else that needs to be done. Physically and mentally exhausted from this last trip, I slump into the pilot seat. I don't think I'll be able to stand for another minute. Mike, our rescued canine friend, is sitting by my side looking at the glowing screen as if he can read the text or help. And what do you think, boy? I ask, looking at his big head that is almost at the same level as mine. At the sound of my voice, he turns and licks my face once. I guess that's his idea of helping. I glance at the still glowing screen in disbelief, hoping the words will disappear, becoming just a hallucination. Nope, they're still there. The words above the text speak as loudly, if not more than, the text itself. From Kelly. That would be my second ex. Oh, boy. As if I didn't have enough going on. The additional stress that is suddenly built up inside with the arrival of the message is because there is so much to do in the immediate future. I have to check on Mom and bring her to safety. Plus, we have to find an immediate semblance of protection, as we can't just sit inside the aircraft every night. We must also find and gather supplies, as our water levels can only sustain us for a couple more days. So much to do. Yet the message on the screen beckons. We're sitting in the cockpit, exhausted from our trip halfway across the world and back. Jack? Robert? Is that someone out there? Michelle asks. Huh? I answer, looking up and out of the front cockpit window. Dark shapes move rapidly on the edge of the ramp through the moonlit night. My heart rate accelerates slightly. But the sight is not unexpected. We made enough noise coming in, and visitors at night are not uncommon based on our previous experiences. I slowly rise to head back and let Lynn and the others know that company is arriving. Just as I turn, my tired mind stops. It's one of those feelings that something is not or was not quite right with what I quickly glimpsed. I sit back down and slide the NVGs on, bringing the dark ramp and movement into more clarity. Shit, I say, surveying the scene in front. What, Robert asks, sitting alertly up and sliding his own NVGs down. Holy crap, he says, taking in the scene outside. What is it? Bree, Nick, and Michelle ask simultaneously. There are night runners chasing someone, Robert says as I scramble out of my seat. Bree, bring the electrical system up on battery. I move quickly past her and into the cargo compartment. Lynn, get yourself, Alpha, and Bravo teams armed and ready with NVGs on. There's someone in trouble outside, I shout, throwing on my own gear and checking for ammo. What's going on? Lynn asks after seeing to her own gear and making sure the teams are ready. Come up and I'll show you. In the cockpit, Robert is still looking out of the window through his NVGs. The instruments are dimly lit, confirming that the aircraft still has electrical power. I reach down and turn on the landing and taxi lights. The brilliant lights stab into the night and over the ramp, catching the unfolding scene. Scores of night runners are on the ramp, running across our line of sight, but still some distance away. The ones closest throw their arms up in front of their eyes in an attempt to block the blinding glare from our lights. Ahead of them, 
streaking across the ramp in desperation. A single person is running for their life. The night runners are a short distance behind and closing quickly. The person running looks at us as our lights spill into the night and changes direction toward us. The turn is more out of hope and desperation, as the night runners will close the distance and be upon them before they can make it to the source of the lights. Oh my God! Lynn exclaims, seeing the event firsthand, and darts back out of the cockpit. Robert, get the radios on the ground frequency, I tell him as I leave on Lynn's heels. Alpha and Bravo teams stand ready in the compartment as I enter. There's someone being chased by night runners outside, I say, upon entering. I have the landing lights on, and I'll have Robert turn them off once we're in position. We'll set up a firing line facing the front of the aircraft. Alpha, position yourselves closest to the doors. Bravo to their left. NVG's on once the lights go out. Watch your fire. The person is heading toward us. Let's move. I brief and open the crew door. Shouldn't we have all of the teams out? Lynn asks as the door lowers. No, we may have to return quickly, and having too many people outside will create a bottleneck at the door. Plus, we don't have enough goggles. The door hits the ground and the teams exit. Alpha Team forms a line directly outside near the open door, kneeling on the pavement. Bravo runs behind them, forming up alongside to their left. I exit with Lynn directly behind. My helmet is still on to give me night vision capability. The perspective from the ground is a touch different than the view from the cockpit. From the height of the cockpit, I could get an overall picture of the scene. On the ground, I only see the front line of night runners stretching across the ramp and heading our way. The brightness of the landing lights makes everything appear as if in black and white, with a few toned-down colors from the clothing. The gray skin of the night runners seems to glow in the light being reflected back. In front of the line, one man is running for all he's worth. Terror, fear, and determination are etched on his face. The look is one of knowing he has cast his lot on whatever is creating the bright light, that it will be his saving grace or his demise. His turning toward it has given the night runners an angle to cut him off. Robert, kill the lights, I radio. The lights wink out a moment later, leaving the ramp covered in darkness. Even the moon shining down doesn't compensate for the loss of vision caused by the bright lights, suddenly vanishing. Only the howls from the night runners and the sounds of their feet on the pavement remain. Goggles on! Open fire! I yell to the teams as I stand behind their kneeling forms. The sound of goggles clicking into place is followed a second later by the first rounds being fired into the mass of night runners closing in. The tarmac and side of the HC-130 blink rapidly from the strobe effect as the bullets leave the muzzles and streak outward. Captain Greg Peterson sits in the darkened room reflecting on the sudden change in the world. The sound of the night runners prowling the streets of the base reach his ears from time to time, reminding him of the reality of the current world. Everyone he knew is gone. He glances at the ranger tab on the shoulder of his ACUs, thinking how meaningless it and the other patches on his uniform are now. The world changes, and so does the importance of things that were once meaningful. His days are filled with scrounging for supplies, and his nights with avoiding being found by the night runners. He switched houses the other evening, choosing to be on McCord rather than Fort Lewis. The choice to move came about because he feels that any hope of finding anyone or help arriving will come from the air, thus his desire to be closer to the airfield. That choice was vindicated by the sound of an aircraft passing overhead a short time ago. That was a C-130, he thinks, knowing the sound well, and he's filled with hope. The sound of night runners on the street outside brings his mind back to the present. The noise of the aircraft has stirred them up. The barricades he placed across the doors and windows should slow them down some, 
but he knows it won't keep them out if they make a determined effort to get in. His best choice is to remain silent and try to find out what the aircraft was about once the sun comes up. The dark room and house mimics the darkness within him, the darkness of losing everyone and living day to day without hope. The darkness of thinking he might be the only one left. At least that's what he thought until he heard the roar of the aircraft arriving. He thinks if he can just live through the night, then the hope of rescue and deliverance will come with the daylight. His hopefulness is balanced with fear caused by the increased activity of the night runners outside. They've proven to be wily in finding him, and he knows he has been lucky so far. A few very close calls with the sun coming to his rescue on a number of them. The coldest part of the night comes just before sunrise, and that's how he feels inside. Hope looms just over the horizon, yet seems so far away. First, he has to endure the coldest part before hope has a chance. There's a certain fear that accompanies hope being so close. The door may shut before becoming reality. The sudden thump against the front door startles him out of his dark musings. Oh, God, no, he thinks, as he lunges for the M-16 lying on the floor next to him. Greg brings it to his shoulder and swings the barrel toward the front door his red dot centering on the boarded entrance. A loud shriek pierces the night as a solid thump jars the door and frame. More shrieks call out from the street and surrounding yards. I've got to do something quick or they will be all over this place. He's at a loss, though, as to what that something should be. There is death outside that will soon grow to include his sanctuary. He thinks over his options. One choice is to try for the airfield and the aircraft that landed recently. The illusion of security that the walls of the house provide keeps him kneeling in the room with his rifle pointed at the front door. If I leave out the back now, they may be too focused on gaining entrance through the front to notice, he thinks, looking over his shoulder at the faint outline of the back door. On the other hand, if it does come down to a fight... The house might be easier to defend. The jarring sound of breaking glass upstairs makes the decision for him. He's up and across the room to the back door before the tinkling of the shattered glass ends. Pausing momentarily to listen for sounds of night runners that may be in the back, he opens the door to the night air. The coolness of the evening brushes by his cheeks as he dashes out of the house and into the backyard. The glow from the moon provides a measure of light as he navigates quickly around a swing set and toys scattered on the lawn, grass grown long by neglect. The sounds of dull thumps against the house reach the backyard. Shrieks fill the night air as he rushes for the fence separating the individual housing units. Just prior to reaching the fence, Greg tosses his M-16 over it into the next yard and hears it land with a soft clatter. He takes a running leap at the fence, his fingers finding purchase on the top and his boots pounding against the side. The noise from his boots hitting the fence sounds like the continuing thuds coming from the front of the house. He vaults over and into the backyard of the neighboring house. A change in the intensity and tone of the howls from the night runners tells him that his escape has been discovered. Coming to rest on his feet, Greg scans the immediate area looking for his weapon. The shadows play havoc with locating his black rifle hidden in the grass, as there is very little color variance in the glow of the moonshine. All objects are in varying shades of gray. Fear takes hold as he knows the night runners are on his trail. Time is not on his side. His fear edges toward panic. He wants the security of his M-16, but knows that he needs to be on his way if he's to have any chance of making the tarmac. He knows this attempt to find sanctuary is a long shot, as those who landed earlier may not even be there anymore. They may have moved to a different location— if they stayed on the ground at all. There, a slight difference in the way the grass lies, 
He dashes over, retrieves his rifle, and is off across the yard. Running down the side of the housing unit, he enters the street to the sound of night runners behind him coming over the fence he vaulted moments ago. Identical housing units line the street on both sides, bathed in the silver glow of the moon. Vehicles of all types are parked in the shared driveways. A late model Mustang in the driveway to his immediate left, minivans that transported families when the world was normal in others, and a few late model pickups. He recalls the vehicle buying frenzy that went on when members of his unit returned from Afghanistan with deployment cash to spend. The sound of night runners vaulting the fence spurs him into action, and he takes off down the street in the general direction of the aircraft ramp. He avoids running through the housing units themselves, as he knows that the ones after him can scale the fences quicker than he can. His only hope is to reach the ramp ahead of the night runners, hoping also that they remain behind him and don't materialize ahead. If that happens, the chase is over. The sound of his boots on the paved streets is drowned out by the periodic shrieks of the night runners giving chase, drawing others into the area. There is no doubt in his mind that it will bring additional ones. He knows that from experience. His learning curve has been steep, coming in the short time since the bottom dropped out from the world he knew. Keeping a quick but steady pace, he turns left at the first cross street, knowing it's the only way out of the housing quarters and into the base proper. He scouted the area during the day after his move, knowing it's easy to get lost in the streets of housing neighborhoods. There's usually only one street out. If he were to take random turns, he would eventually get lost and become trapped. Rounding the corner, shrieks escalate, letting him know that night runners have entered the street behind. His feet respond to the increase in fear that fills his mind with those howls. He's close to a full block ahead of the pack, but knows how fast that distance can be eaten up. His only hope is to maintain his lead and get to the ramp ahead of them. For that, he'll need to get a lead of more than a block and keep making turns at each street, all while keeping a general direction toward the airfield. Weighing the need to increase the distance between them and the need to keep his wind with a steady pace, he knows that distance is his more immediate need. With this in mind, Greg streaks down the street and rounds the next corner. Thankful for the short street, he makes the corner just ahead of the horde reaching the one to his rear. His thought is that the night runners will slow momentarily without having witnessed which direction he went. He knows they'll be able to track him by scent and sound, but doesn't want to make it easier for them. Greg runs across the yard next to the street, knowing the grass will better hide the sound of his running. He imagines the mass behind him will hastily make for the intersection, having lost a visual on him, and hopes that it will take some time for them to locate him again. For that reason, he darts around the vehicles in the driveways, hoping that, with vehicles between him and the night runners, he'll become less easy to spot. The bright moon overhead momentarily casts his shadow across the hood of a sporty new Camaro as Greg continues his run along the yards heading toward the exit from the housing area. Shrieks intensify in the night air behind as the night runners pick up his scent. He's gained a little distance. It's not enough to make it all the way to the tarmac, but any distance won is beneficial. He still has his M16, but if it comes to the point of him having to use it to defend himself, he knows his time will be measured, measured by the number of rounds he has left. The three magazines that he has remaining will not sustain him long should it come to that, especially in the dark without any night vision capability. He'll be shooting at shadows until they get closer, in which case they'll overwhelm him within seconds. No, his best bet is to keep making for the airfield. Greg exits the housing area. Beads of sweat run down his forehead, causing the chill of the night air to cool his face and body even more. His fatigue top forms dark circles under his armpits and along his back. Ahead, a road cuts across his path, and beyond the street looms the shadows of the base golf course. 
He's still a mile from the base proper and approximately a mile and a half from the ramp. That's a lot closer than if I were still at Fort Lewis. A mile and a half, that's only a little less than twelve minutes, he thinks, sprinting across the street and entering the dark shadows of the trees lining the fairway. He keeps to the trees alongside the fairways, using the same strategy as with his run along the yards. The trees will hide him better and force the night runners to chase by scent. Hunting and tracking by scent alone is far slower than by sight. He's not sure how well the night runners can see in the dark, but it is the only measure he can think of. Running in the fairway will definitely allow them to visually chase him and close the distance. The moon and clear night provide enough illumination so he can steer clear of the trees. Running headlong into a tree that suddenly decides to jump out in front of him would not rank among the top of the ideal situations list. Memories surface of having been in these trees before, trying to find his errant golf balls. Their recollections of peaceful weekend outings with friends during the warmer months, of beer stacked in the cart and watching his ball arc off the tee and into the trees. That was a common occurrence whenever he was out with clubs in hand, and the fault of said clubs. The memories quickly dissolve, returning his focus on his dash through the trees. One advantage to the trees being part of the course is that the underbrush has been cleared. He reaches the end of the tree line, changes direction, and crosses the tee area of the next hole. Entering another line of trees, Greg hopes the change in direction will throw off the howling night runners. He hears them crashing through the trees behind. The shrieks, echoing through the woodland, suddenly taper off. A moment later, the screams rise again. His scent has been picked up. The fear that they have drawn closer and that others will respond ahead of him drives him forward. Low-lying branches whip against his face, but he's mindless to the stinging scratches. The faint reflected light allows him to see the limbs at the last second and to avoid catching one in his eyes. Being momentarily blinded would spell disaster. The silver of the moonlight on the fairway next to him looks peaceful in its radiance, in stark contrast to his fear-filled flight through the woods. Emerging from the line of trees, he quickly crosses another fairway with the feeling that the night runners are closing the distance. His race through the trees may not be allowing them to close in on him quickly, but they are nearing nonetheless. He enters the woods on the far side. He immediately senses that the tree line is thicker than the previous ones. Going in far enough so he can't be seen from the fairway, he quickly strips off his uniform jacket, tossing it as far as he can to his left. Greg then takes off at a ninety-degree angle to his right. There's no breeze, so using wind to help elude his pursuers is not an option. He hopes they will become confused about his scent coming from two directions and not know which way he actually went. At a minimum, he could perhaps lose a few of them. The ninety-degree turn will make the distance to the ramp a touch longer, but keeping the distance from the night runners is the greater priority. Shrieks emit from the fairway behind and to the right. He sincerely hopes the night runners can't see him running through the woods. With the sharp turn, he has just given them an angle to cut him off. Greg glances over his shoulder and sees nothing of the fairway, not even a glimpse of the moonlight shining down on it. The trees are spaced far enough apart that light filters in, and the dark outlines of those immediately around him can be seen. He feels winded, but the fear of being caught and ripped apart pushes him onward, closer to the airfield. He makes another ninety-degree turn to his left, heading once again to the northwest and toward the ramp. Howls echo in the woods around him, and he can't be certain of their exact direction. They're definitely coming from somewhere behind, but he can't tell if they are off to the side or directly to his rear. The trees open up onto another fairway, and he's across and through an adjacent tree line in moments. The golf course ends abruptly with a street running across his path. A little over half a mile to go, he thinks, eyeing another dark line of trees paralleling the road northward. 
He wants to stop and catch his breath, but knows that to do so will be the end. The night runners are still crashing through the trees behind him. A choice lies directly ahead. Take to the tree line along the road, or cut through the open fields of the base. There are few buildings within the open fields, and if he takes the latter option, he'll be sighted as soon as the night runners exit the trees. His lead is a short one, and he has the feeling that he'll be caught in those fields prior to reaching the camp. Tree line it is, he thinks, running across the street and disappearing into the shadows. Keeping well back from the road, Greg continues his evasion. His legs feel heavy with the exertion he has expended, but the calls from behind keep his adrenaline going. He knows he can't keep this up for much longer, but knowing there is only half a mile to go helps. He doesn't know what he'll do if he arrives and it turns out that no one is there. It's not that he really had a choice in the matter. They were on to him inside the house where he had been hiding, and there really wasn't much he could do. If there's no one there... I'll just have to hold out as long as I can. Greg also knows that he's been extremely fortunate that night runners haven't intercepted his course. It's not that they would know where he was headed in order to do so. He feels that any who respond to the yells will head to the location of the shrieks of those chasing him. Behind him, he hears the mass in the same line of trees. Their constant roars have partially diminished, and he hopes they're becoming as winded. Well... More winded than he. The trees end, and he's immediately bathed in the radiance of the moonlight. The little amount of protection afforded by the trees vanishes. There are only open fields with a scattering of buildings lying between him and the airfield proper. Poking above the hangars in the near distance, he sees the gray tips of aircraft tails, showing silver from the light streaming down. Without hesitation, Greg dashes across the fields. He contemplates tossing his rifle to the side to gain a little extra speed and endurance. But there's a certain security it affords having it with him. Across the first field, he hears a rise in the shrieks behind. He has been spotted. Ahead, he sees the opening to the ramp across another field. A glance behind him shows a multitude of night runners pouring across the field, their faces glowing in the light. Each night runner gives an illusion of speed as they streak across the grassy field. Oh, crap, I'm not going to make it, he thinks, putting every last bit of energy into his legs. The shrieks behind sound excited. Turn and shoot or toss my rifle. Either way, I'm not going to make it to the ramp with it. Tossing the M-16 to the side, he pumps his arms harder. His breathing is coming in gasps, but his legs respond. He leaves the grassy field, crosses the street, and emerges out onto the ramp. Not really knowing which way to go, he continues across, looking to both sides as he runs. There is nothing but the dark shapes of resting aircraft. No movement of people or anything that would indicate the recent landing of an aircraft. Well, I gave it my all, he thinks, feeling his boots rhythmically strike the pavement. I sure wish I had kept the gun. I'll just keep going as long as I can and go down fighting. Bright lights stab out across the ramp from his left, blinding in their intensity and ruining any night vision he had acquired. He instinctively heads toward them, knowing that the turn will give the night runners an angle to close the distance. There is a sound of movement coming from the direction of the lights, faintly heard above the roars of the horde on his heels. The light prevents him from seeing anything in that direction. As suddenly as they appeared, the lights vanish leaving only bright spots in his vision. He continues running in the same direction. Goggles on! Open fire! he hears someone shout. Flashes of light appear in his vision. They're firing. I hope not at me, he thinks, and changes course to his right to get out of the line of fire. The steel zipping through the air meets the first line of the night runners that are close on the heels of the soldier running toward us. The ones in front and to the side of the soldier are flung backward, as if they ran full tilt into a wire stretched across the ramp. The rounds strike their chest, shoulders, head, 
and limbs with tremendous force. Some are propelled backwards into the arms of the ones behind. Others spin around from the force of the bullets impacting their bodies off-center. The man running for his life angles to the side with the first rounds fired. It's apparent he's having trouble seeing us, but is angling away from the sound of the gunfire. The night runners are also having trouble identifying our exact location with the sudden extinguishment of the light. The bright light ruined their night vision, enhanced or not, and with it being turned off abruptly, they only see darkness. Some are running toward the opposite side of the aircraft, while others are heading farther off onto the ramp. A few still head directly at us. There are far too many to take down before they descend upon us, but we should be able to disengage in their current disorientated state. The echo of gunfire across the ramp is constant. Night runners continue to drop to the pavement. Some collapse and don't move again, while others fall and try to crawl away from their pain. The lone soldier is attempting to circle around to our lines, but it's apparent that he can't see our exact location and is venturing farther aft of the aircraft. Lynn, go get him and guide him back. Bravo, prepare to disengage and fall back to the aircraft, I shout, firing into the mass of night runners to our front. Roger that, sir, Cressman responds her voice carrying above the din of the firing. Lynn lowers her weapon, locates the running man, and takes off toward him. Alpha, prepare to board the aircraft once Bravo clears, I shout, seeing Lynn grab the soldier and guide him by the arm. The night runners are recovering from their disorientated state and begin to home in on us. In my peripheral, I see Lynn start up the stairs with the soldier. Bravo, clear out, I shout. The sound of gunfire diminishes as Bravo Team stands, runs behind Alpha, and begins to board the aircraft. The horde of night runners, scattered in all directions due to being previously blinded, are now converging on our positions. They are just scant yards ahead, and we only have seven rifles engaging. It'll be close as we begin to disengage Alpha. I pat the two soldiers to the left of the remaining line on their shoulders and direct their fire into our left front flank. I direct the two in the middle to our immediate front and the soldier closest to the stairs to make sure night runners don't get to us from under the aircraft. I pour my fire into those that are closest regardless of the direction. Magazines are ejected to the ground as the team members reload. The sound of the mags and empty cartridges hitting the ground is lost in the gunfire and screams. I see the last of Bravo team mount the stairs and shout for the two Alpha members on the far left to disengage, taking up their sector. My carbine and those of the rest of the Alpha send out constant rounds against the closing horde. Bodies continue to pile up on the ramp with moonlight catching an occasional spray of blood in its silver beams. I observe the two Alpha members mount the stairs and catch sight of Lynn firing her M4 from the doorway, lifting her carbine as the members enter in front of her. Go, 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 I shout to the three remaining Alpha team members. Robert, turn on the lights. I radio. Alpha rises and scrambles up the stairs. I stand at the bottom, firing into the night runners, but my rounds do little to slow their rapid advance. Above, I hear the popping of rounds from Lynn firing out the door. The landing lights flash brightly from the aircraft once again. Shrieks of rage, pain, and frustration come from the mass, the light blindingly painful. The night runners are only ten feet from the nose of the aircraft. Get your ass up here, Lynn yells from the top of the stairs. I scramble up the stairs two at a time and run through the entrance, slamming into the bulkhead with my shoulder. Lynn and Watkins pull the door closed behind me. As the door shuts, the cargo compartment darkens even more, the only light coming from the reflected glow outside through the cargo windows. In the dimness... I see our newest member bent over with his hands on his knees, catching his breath. Thumps and pounding begin against the aircraft fuselage, startling the newly rescued soldier. Don't worry, I tell him. They can't get in here. Or at least they haven't been able to as of yet. I ask Driscoll to put the blackout covers over the windows and for Michelle to draw the blackout curtains in the cockpit. 
When those are in place, I have Robert kill the lights outside and turn on the interior cargo lights. What about the battery, Dad? Bree calls down the cockpit stairs. Leave it on. It's not like we're going anywhere with this aircraft anyway, I reply. Dad, the new soldier inquires, raising his head but with his hands still on his knees. Yeah, looks like we have some stories to share, I say as the lights of the cargo interior come on. The soldier rises and puts out his hand. Greg Peterson. Jack Walker, I say, taking his hand. The introductions are made after the kids arrive from the cockpit. Noticing the captain's tabs on the field cap he's wearing, most address him as Sir. It's just Greg, folks, he says in response. The days of Sir are over. I want to thank all of you for saving my bacon. I seriously don't know what would have happened if you hadn't been here. Well, I do, and it wouldn't have been pretty. I'm just glad we were here, I say, as the shrieks and slams against the fuselage continue, some solid enough to cause us to jump. What was that about not going anywhere? Greg asks. And we lost an engine coming in, and this aircraft isn't going anywhere, I answer, feeling sad at the thought that this aircraft, our mobile sanctuary that has accompanied us through so much and kept us safe, will end its days here on the ramp becoming just another remnant of civilization as we knew it. What happened that you found yourself in the unfortunate circumstance of being outside at night? Frank asks. I heard the aircraft come in. They found me and started breaking in, so I figured I had no choice but to make a run for it, he answers. The airfield was my best shot. We settle in amidst the continued noise from outside and share our stories bringing Greg up to speed with our journey, structure, and knowledge. He, in turn, tells of his adventures over the past few days. We also fill him in on our plans, but reserve assigning him to a team until Lynn and I have a chance to talk about it. The fact that he's joining us is not in question. He already seems to mesh nicely with our group. Plus, his experience will be extremely beneficial. Okay, everyone. Let's get whatever rest is possible inside this noisy tin can. We have a very busy next few weeks coming up, I say. Lynn, would you mind coming up with me? We enter the cockpit, and I pick up my phone from the seat where I left it as I scrambled out. Lynn looks at me quizzically as I open it and pull up the text. With the glow of the phone shining brightly in a darkened cockpit, lit only by the glow of the instrument panels... I hand the device to her. She takes it and looks down at the screen, staring at it with furrowed brows for a few moments. Finally, looking up with a scowl, she says, You have got to be fucking kidding me. Hey, it's not like I planned this, I say defensively. What are you going to do? She asks. Contact her and go get her, I guess, I say while thinking, how is there any right answer to this one? I suppose you're right. There's really no other right choice. But I'm going with you. I have no problem with that, but I would like you here to keep control of things. There's a ton that needs to be done during the day before night falls. Yeah, I went along with your foolhardy plan and let you go into the CDC, but there's no way in hell you're going down there alone, Lynn says, hands on her hips. Uh, I was thinking about taking Robert and Bree, actually. Now why on earth would you do that? She asks, tilting her head to the side. The guard base down there has a couple of C-130s, and I was thinking about flying one back. It would be nice to know that we have one available just in case I'll need their help to fly it back up, I answer. Well, I'm still going with you, and that's the way it's going to be. You'll just have to get used to that idea, Lynn says adamantly. Okay, okay, I wave my hand in a warding-off gesture. We'll take a Humvee with just the four of us. Why not take a whole team or two, she asks, sounding slightly appeased but not completely happy. There's a lot we need to get done before night hits, and I think we'll need everyone here helping to set up a secure location, I respond. It'll be a quick down-and-back trip, depending on what the road conditions are like. 
Let me try and get a hold of Mom and then respond back to Kelly. We should then gather everyone together to quickly cover what we're going to do when morning arises. Lynn continues looking at me and makes the, well, go ahead, gesture, indicating she's not going anywhere. I nervously dial Mom's cell phone. I'm worried about her, but I don't get an answer which increases my worry even further. I leave a voicemail and try her home phone. There's no answer at that number, and I don't even get a voicemail recording. I send a thought of protection out to her, as I have periodically throughout our journey. Now, the interesting part. I'm here. Are you okay? I text and press the send button. Several minutes pass and Lynn comes to look over my shoulder. The phone vibrates in my hand and the screen comes to life. The words appear on the screen. OMG, you're alive? I'm so scared. Where are you? Fucking drama queen. I hear Lynn whisper by my side as she reads the message. Yeah, Lynn's not particularly fond of Kelly. I'm in Tacoma. Where are you? I text. I would call, but I don't know what her situation is, and the sound of her phone ringing could make it worse. I'm at my place with Jessica and Brian. Can you come help us? I'll be there tomorrow afternoon. Keep the lights off and stay quiet. Turn your phone off for now and then back on when it's light outside. I'll call you then. Okay. I try mom once again after the texting session, but I still don't get a reply. I'm extremely worried about her. I really have a hard time with worrying, and it eats at me until I find an answer one way or the other. I also notice Lynn displaying an edginess. I would normally attribute it to the text, but I understand her well enough to know that it goes deeper than that. She keeps biting her lip, and it's one of the signs that she's nervous or anxious about something. Is everything okay? I ask, noting her nervousness. I'm just thinking about Mom and Craig, and I'm worried about them, she answers. I pull her in close and wrap my arms around her. Well, I told him five days, and that isn't until tomorrow. Craig probably doesn't want to fly into a strange airfield at night, I whisper into her ear and continue to hold her close. We hold each other for a moment longer and then head down into the cargo compartment gathering everyone around as best as the confined space will allow. The thuds against the side of the fuselage continue sporadically as the night runners persist in their attempts to get us. Their howls are muted by the thin steel walls between them and us. I can't really say we're becoming accustomed to the night runners, as the bangs still startle us each time, but we're able to focus, to an extent. I just want to give a rundown on tomorrow. First of all, Bannerman, will you put together a list of our critical supply needs? The overall plan is to gather vehicles, raid the armories, and then caravan down to Cabela's. For that, we'll need a few cargo trucks and some bolt cutters. We'll also need several Humvees, so we can scout the area for any additional survivors. Make sure they're filled with fuel. Siphon if you have to. Once we get the vehicles, we'll head out and cover the area in teams. When we finish, we'll head down and make further plans once we see what we're up against. Lynn, will you please see to the assignments? I ask, finishing the quick briefing. Will do. Driscoll, take your team along with Alpha and Bravo teams to secure the vehicles. Horace, take your team and search the open maintenance hangars for bolt cutters. In the meantime, the rest of us will unload the supplies, Lynn says. Everyone nods at their assignments. There's two Humvees parked on the ramp. I'll be taking one. Dreskel, you can take the other one with your team to the front gate where there are two others parked. That should be enough for all of you, I add to Lynn's instructions. What are you doing with the other Humvee? Robert asks. I can't raise Mom on the phone, so I'm going to check on her. I'll be back by the time the vehicles are secured. Can I go? He asks. Yeah, that's fine. Bree, Nick, and Michelle... I want you to stay here with the others. The sound of boots shuffling and walking on the cargo floor fills the aircraft as everyone finds a place to settle in for the rest of the evening. 
Our rest is broken by the echoing of the hollow, metallic thuds periodically throughout the night. The night runners eventually give up close to dawn and were afforded a brief period of rest. Another dawn breaks over the cascades to our east, filling the cockpit with its radiance. My head is aching from all of the time spent at altitude with its low humidity. I'm dehydrated, coupled with a lack of sleep. Thinking about the busy day and times ahead, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed. There isn't time or room to take a break and deal with the issues another day. Lynn stirs beside me and heads into the back after a good morning kiss. I get up shortly thereafter, thankful I didn't have to plop right down into the pilot seat. My rear end could use the rest. The feeling of being a touch overwhelmed with all that needs to happen during the day almost brings me to a standstill. I'm not sure where to even start. One step at a time, I think, heading out into the chill of the morning air. The sun rising above the hills is refreshing and fills my low energy to an extent. It feels a little colder than it should be due to our spending the last few days in warmer climates, but it's rejuvenating. There isn't much talk amongst our group as most of us are lost in our own thoughts and are spent from our efforts to get to the Northwest. Feels like our arrival should have been a destination rather than a beginning. There's a prevalent feeling of wondering if any of us have the energy to embark on this endeavor. However, we also know we don't have the luxury of not doing anything. Standing in the light morning breeze, I try calling my mom once again and still get no answer. Dreskel, the rest of Green Team, and Robert stand beside me waiting to head out. I dial Kelly, getting several rings before she picks up. Jack, are you coming down to get us? Kelly asks without any preliminaries. Yeah, we'll be down, but I can't get there until later this afternoon. I'm not exactly sure when, but we'll be there, I answer. Who is we? she asks. Lynn, Robert, Bree, and me. Oh, okay. You mentioned Brian and Jessica are with you. Where's Carrie? I ask. The sun has fully risen and is casting our shadows long across the dark gray tarmac. She pauses before answering. She was with her dad, and I haven't heard from her. Can you go see if she's okay on your way down? My stress level increases as I don't think I'll be able to get all of the things accomplished that need to be done. Check on Mom, see about Carrie, and get down to Kelly. Even though the daylight hours are longer, there's much that needs to be done, and I'm not sure what condition our possible sanctuary is in. It may take some time to ensure it will provide the safe haven we need. There's someone who needs help, and I want to be able to do both. The time constraint makes this impossible. We're under a bit of a time crunch here, and I may not be able to do both. If there's time, I'll head over there. Otherwise, I'll head down and we'll see about her on the way back, I respond. What do you possibly have to do that you can't go see if she's okay? Kelly asks, a little irritation edging into her voice. I have a group of people here to see to, and we just landed yesterday. We have a lot to do to make sure we're safe for the evening. I'm sorry, but I have to see to them as well. I'll call you when we're on our way, and I'll go look for Carrie if there's time, I answer. Okay. Hurry. I'll go as fast as I can. Talk to you in a little while. Okay. Bye, she says, the click of the line disconnecting. I continue to be amazingly surprised that the phones still work at all. This would have been a great advertisement for them in times past. Coverage, smoverage, our lines last through an apocalypse. Ah, well, shall we get this party started? I say to those gathered around me. Dreskel merely nods his reply. My few interactions with Dreskel lead me to believe he has a strong, silent type of personality. Confident, yet quiet. Or maybe he just doesn't know how to interact with me. 
Although taller, he's a bit younger than I am, and with his being in the military for a number of years, that may equate to me being an authority figure in his mind. With what I have witnessed and how he's conducted himself from the stories Lynn told, he's stable, reliable, and knows what he's doing. I let Lynn know we're off. We gear up and head over to the Humvees parked by the remnants of our earlier outdoor luncheon. I really haven't heard much from you regarding our circumstance and plan. What do you think? I ask Dreskel as we stroll over to the vehicles. I think it's a good plan. It's as good as any as we could have come up with, and it makes sense, he answers. What do you think our chances are? I ask further. He pauses for a moment before answering as we talk with our shadows stretched out before us. We have a good group here, so we should be able to pull it off. I think any problems we might have will come if we find others out there and how well they fit in. A tight group like ours can weather through this, but if there's any dissension that arises, then stupid things can happen. That's also providing that we don't discover any further surprises regarding the night runners. The only thing I foresee are the problems with having to go into the buildings on a regular basis for supplies, carrying for anyone who gets injured, and, like you mentioned earlier, any diseases that crop up from all the dead. Those are the most words I have heard him say in the time since Kuwait. I agree. It's going to be up to the team leaders to keep things tight and set examples. My feeling is that if we can last through the summer, we should be okay. The future problem I see is when we have to adapt to the fact that there isn't any more manufacturing to take care of things that break, I say, enjoying the open-ended conversation with him. Can I be perfectly honest, Jack? Driscoll asks, coming to halt by one of the Humvees. You certainly can. I welcome it and expect no less, I answer, wondering where this is going. In my opinion, that was a foolish thing you did going back into the CDC like that. I just don't see that the information we came across was worth the risk. We would have figured it out eventually without it, he says, meeting my eyes. Well, I think the information we came across was worth it, especially knowing that we don't have to worry about the immunity aspect and turning into one of them if we're bit. I honestly didn't know what to do if that were true. That peace of mind alone was worth it to me. This heading down with just a couple of you fits the same category as far as I'm concerned, he adds. I would take others, but there's so much we have to do before the sun sets again. I think everyone will be needed up here, and the safety of a secure environment is more important. Well, you seem to know what you're doing, and that's good enough for me. I'm not saying saving others and getting the information isn't and wasn't important. It's just that folks are beginning to look to you for leadership. If something were to happen to you, I'm worried there might be a breakdown, Dreskel says in a lowered voice. You and Lynn can easily handle things if something were to happen to me. Probably, but not as efficiently, I think. Well, I hope you find your mom okay. He sticks his hand out. Thanks. I appreciate that. And you take care of yourself. There may be others around that may not take kindly to you borrowing their vehicles, I say, returning his shake. Follow me to the gate. Honk or flash your lights if you see something or you need to stop. Will do, he says, and climbs into the driver's seat with Green Team already seated within. Robert and I climb into the other Humvee. I check the battery and wait for the light signaling the glow plugs are warm before starting up. With a thumbs up from Dreskel beside us, we start off in the early morning light toward the front gate. Nothing much has changed since our journey into the base just a week ago. It still has the feel of a ghost town, the structures intact, but with no one home. This is where our journey began, so there's a bit of a homecoming sensation. The eeriness is not as prevalent as before, but there is no way it can completely disappear as we travel through the empty streets. Only the lonely feeling of a world abandoned follows us as we make our way past the desolate buildings. We used to get this feeling in times past, when we would travel through deserted villages where the people had long ago fled from various roving armed bands. 
the once busy dirt streets filled with the noises of villagers going about their daily lives, just echoes of the past. We keep a lookout among the buildings and streets as Greg couldn't have been the only remaining soul. Birds flit through the calm, warming air and over the brown grass fields, their life changing little in the aftermath. Their only adjustment is perhaps the registration of a new predator. Andrew, the first person we met following the death of the world, enters my thoughts, and I wonder if he made it to find his parents in Spokane. With the immunity seeming to be familial, it makes sense that one parent, if not both, would have survived the vaccine. Whether they survived the days following is altogether another story. I find myself hoping he at least survived and manages to find his way back. Passing by the hospital, I shudder recalling the close call within. The building carries a foreboding feeling similar to the CDC, that the facade is hiding a darkness and terror within. I remember the words Dreskel spoke just a short time ago when he mentioned having to care for the injured. The foreboding comes stronger knowing we'll possibly have to raid a hospital soon for medical supplies and equipment, understanding that it will not be a pleasurable operation. With the traffic surrounding the exit ramps to the hospital and the larger amount of vehicles in the parking lots, I have the distinct feeling that medical facilities will have a greater amount of dead within, complicating matters. It's not just from the nauseating stench, but from the onset of disease with so many dead, plus the knowledge that there may be quite a few night runners within those places. If we're going in, we'll have to do it soon, as the disease from the decaying bodies will only get worse with each passing day. Robert is quiet during our ride through the base. The smell of the decomposing bodies by the front gates reaches us before we catch sight of them. Again, we have to maneuver our way through them, avoiding the bodies as best we can. The stench is overwhelming, and my gut clenches with nausea. A few of the bodies have been picked at by the carrion. The sight and smell is disgustingly atrocious. That's just plain nasty, Robert says as we thread our way through and pull up to the front gate, parking by the two abandoned Humvees sitting crosswise at the rear of the booths. You're not shitting, I say, trying not to breathe. Dreskel pulls up and parks beside. Several green team members exit, heading over to the empty Humvees. Why don't you take this one as well, I say, walking over to his window. We'll take the Jeep. Just wait and make sure we can get it started. Okay, Jack. Good luck to you, he replies. You too. I'll see you in a couple hours. I grab the toolkit I brought with us from our supplies. Robert and I walk over to the Jeep that I left parked in the visitor's lot so many days ago, avoiding the booth with the boots still poking out from the doorway. Seeing the jeep parked brings a little comfort, a small sense of normalcy and familiarity in a world distinctly lacking in the normal. Climbing into the jeep, we start it up and pull out of the parking lot, waving to Dreskel and the others as we exit. Mom's house is only about a forty-minute drive. We should have no problems en route as we have traveled this way before and didn't notice any road blockages along the way. The lanes to the hospital in Olympia became congested, but the left lane was clear as far as I could tell. We drive out of the gate and turn south onto Interstate 5. What you thinking about? I ask Robert as we pick up speed. Nothing really, he answers. I'm just hoping Grandma is okay. I'm thinking about Mom. And I'm wondering if any of my friends made it. That sort of thing. Have you tried calling or... Texting any of your friends? I ask, avoiding any talk about his mom for the moment. In truth, I really don't know what to say other than I'm sorry. Yeah, but I haven't heard anything back. I'm really sorry about your mom, kiddo. I know that must really hurt. Do you want to talk about it? Not really, he answers. I can tell he's holding back the tears that want to come out with the sadness he's feeling. You know, the genetic change may not be a permanent thing, I tell him, 
keeping my eyes on the road ahead of us. I offer this as a hope, not really a false one, but in all honesty, I'm at a loss for words. There isn't really anything comforting to say when dealing with a loss that great. He looks over with a, you've got to be kidding, expression. Oh, seriously, Robert, we can't ever give up hope on something we want or wish for. At any rate, know that I'm here if you ever want to talk about that, or anything. I'm here for you. I know, Dad. I feel at a loss right now as to what to do or where I fit in. I mean, I was fine while we were flying. I knew what to do and had a place. Now, I feel like I don't know where that place is, he says, turning his face to the window. There is always a place for you, and there's plenty to do, Robert. You and the girls will always have a place with me, I reply, attempting to reassure his feelings of being uncertain. I understand and know that, but that's not what I really mean, he says. I guess I mean that I'm thinking you won't let me help, that you'll try to keep us safe and won't let me participate. There are guys on the teams that are close to my age, and I always get left behind. I completely understand. It's really hard for me to explain the protective nature of being a parent, the desire to keep your kids safe no matter what. But I'm not a kid anymore, he interjects. I know, and you're right in that I need to let go a little. I would like to wait until you're better trained, but, well, you know that it's hard for me to let you be put in a dangerous situation. But you also need to learn, and I understand that, I reply and pause for a moment to collect my thoughts. In truth... I've thought about this a great deal and haven't had any revelations regarding it. He needs to learn and gain self-confidence, but I'm also hesitant to put him in any situations where he can. I had been expecting a light bulb to go off showing me the correct decision, but that's remained dark to this point. You know, you're right. I need to let you go out more, but you still need training. Plus, I do need you in other situations. So, with that said, you can consider yourself officially a part of Red Team, but you'll be partnered with me, and, for now, you'll only go out when I do. I know I'll never reach a fully thought-out decision, but I also know I have to make one. Okay, Dad, he says, with a little more life in his voice. We pass Cabela's to our right as we continue traveling south. To me, it has taken on an aura similar to the Holy Grail. It sits there, mysterious and inviting, but with a hint of peril. The light brown walls hide whatever is within, our salvation or downfall. I'm wishing we were at its doors now, as the uncertainty is driving me crazy, like it isn't everyone else. For me, the unfamiliar always held an element of excitement, but not an unknown like this. This is definitely one of those times I would like for it to be known, clearly, sharp, and defined. I hey, remember when we used to go in there and browse forever, I ask as we both look at the structure passing by. Yeah, and the fudge we used to bring home, he answers. Those were the best times. The greatest sugar high and then crash ever, I say with a chuckle. This stuff lasted forever. Hey, I wonder if there's any left and if it's still good. I guess we'll find out soon enough, Robert replies. And we'll be able to do a little more than browse now, I say. I call dibs on that sniper rifle in the case, he says with a grin. That's yeah, yours. Although I think we'll find a little better if we can get into the armories on Fort Lewis. But if that one is there, it has your name on it. The gray pavement stretches before us as we continue south. The shadows of the fir trees lining both sides cast their shadows across the lonely interstate. Robert and I maintain a conversation about events in our past and some of the memories we shared together as we drive. The interstate turns off onto Highway 101 and the sun swings behind us as we head west, with the highway eventually turning to the north. The drive along the freeway becomes even more surreal knowing we passed this way just a week ago. During that time... 
We've both changed because of our experiences. We've returned with more knowledge and awareness, but also with added stress. The intense experiences make it seem like more time has passed since driving through in the opposite direction and adds to the dreamlike nature of our surroundings. Our conversation dies slowly as we near the turnoff to Mom's house, and the worry increases. I feel a great sense of loss as we turn off the highway toward the house. It comes from the memories of all the good times I had with Robert as we pulled onto this driveway, excited to be heading to one fun event or another, and realizing those drives won't happen again. The sun shines through the trees, forming ribbons of light across the gravel road as we approach the driveway. Drawing near, the anxiety and fear intensifies. I don't want to drive the last few feet for fear of the answer I might find. Gravel crunches under the jeep's tires, rebounding off the thick trees to the side of the road, and is the only sound. A terrible loneliness follows along with the slow crunch of rocks. I turn into the driveway and immediately begin laughing, both from the release of the nervous tension and from the sight in front of me. Mom is standing in the driveway, putting grain out for the squirrels and other wildlife. Only she would persist in feeding the deer and squirrels in the midst of civilization collapsing. She drops her large bowl of seed and runs toward us, throwing her arms around Robert and then me as we step out of the jeep. Oh, I thought I had lost you, she says with tears streaming down her cheeks. She looks around the jeep and her hand comes to her mouth as if a shock is coming. Oh no, please don't tell me. The girls are fine, Mom, I interject before she can complete her sentence. Tears in my own eyes. We found a few other survivors, and they're waiting at McCord. Oh, thank goodness. Did you find Lynn? She asks, still taking in the fact that we're standing in front of her. Yes, we did, along with a few of her friends, I answer. Oh, I'm glad you made it. I've been so worried for all of you. I've been worried about you, too. How have things been? I ask. Oh, it's been pretty quiet, actually. Oh, I've heard a few of those horrible yowls some evenings, but they seemed pretty far away. It was nothing like that first night, she answers. Well, that's good. We've come to pick you up, and we're planning on turning the Cabela's into a fortified haven. Oh, I can't leave Jack. This place will protect me, she says. I know it will, Mom, but I want you to come with us anyway. This is a lot worse than you can imagine, and we won't be far away, I respond. She looks over to Robert, who nods his head in affirmation. Okay, let me grab a few things. She picks up the bowl. Do you need any help? I ask. No, I think I have it. She heads inside and returns shortly with several bags in tow. A few times during the trip back to the airfield, I catch a glimpse of movement in the rear-view mirror. Looking back each time, the road is empty. I pull over to the side after the third time, waiting to see if something catches up to us. What are we doing? Robert asks. I think I keep seeing something behind us, I answer. What is it? he asks, turning to look out of the back window. I'm not sure. I just keep seeing a hint of movement out of the corner of my eye. It may be nothing, but I want to sit here and see if anything appears. We sit with the engine idling, but nothing materializes. I turn off the engine and step outside, listening for any sound that might give an indication that something is coming up behind us. Only the tinkling sound of the engine cooling disturbs this desolate stretch of road, I think about turning around and heading back, but the anxiety over time and the things we need to get done are weighing on me. I resume the drive after a moment, thinking it must be the play of shadows through the fir trees as the sun rises higher into the clear blue sky, or perhaps an occasional breeze shifting the branches. Our return trip is spent catching Mom up with our adventures and sharing the knowledge we've acquired— Silence fills the jeep as we turn north onto the interstate and retrace our previous route. 
Mom stares at the abandoned cars along the road. This is her first time seeing the emptiness of a world that should be filled with movement and noise. For her, like the trees and animals, not much really changed in her life, except having to secure the house and not bring notice to herself. Well, that and not being able to go to the store every once in a while to shop for food. We arrive back at the gate two hours after passing through on the way out. I radio Lynn, letting her know we're back. The flight line has undergone a transformation of sorts as I pull onto it. A mixture of olive drab and light brown transport trucks and Humvees are parked in a line at the rear of the aircraft. I glance about the ramp to see if Craig's aircraft has arrived, but there isn't any sign of a corporate jet. I was really hoping to see its presence upon landing. I know Lynn is worried, but she isn't overtly showing it as I see her directing the loading of supplies onto one of the transports. Parking by the other vehicles, I step out and walk over to where Bannerman is standing near the open aircraft ramp. Nick and Bree rush out of the back and over to Mom, wrapping their arms around her and giving her a big hug. I hear their excited voices behind me as they begin to tell their stories. The gray pavement at our feet is heating up as the sun wends its way higher into the early summer sky. The air is still without a breeze, the grass on the far side of the runway undisturbed. What do we have? I ask Bannerman as I watch soldiers unload the last of our supplies from the aircraft. He looks at a clipboard he found somewhere. Well, water is our most critical element. We have enough for a couple of days without having to find more. There's enough food for at least a week, although we may get tired of MREs. We have plenty of ammo for the weapons, but we don't have much for the M243s on the Humvees. Weapons, we have plenty of. Uh, one of the things we'll have to think about is clothing, depending on what you want to do with that. That shouldn't be a problem, depending on what Cabela's has, but if you want us to stay with uniforms, we should see about visiting the clothing store in the division supply. Okay. I think our best bet for getting water in the short term is to hit up the local stop and robs. I don't think we'll find much infestation in those locations. We'll set up for hitting the larger stores when I get back. That's a good point about the clothing, though. I really didn't think about that one. Thanks. We'll add clothing supply to our list when we hit the armories. I'd like you to go with the teams we put together for the main divisional armories and get everything that might be useful that we can fit into the transports. If you can, and time allows, try to get the weapon racks themselves so we can store the weapons neatly when we get to Cabela's. Will do, Jack, he says. Lynn walks over, dusting her hands off on her fatigue pants. We're all loaded up and ready to go. And we should hand out whatever antibiotics I pulled out of the hospital. They should be in the cardboard boxes I stored inside, I say. We should all be in a position to administer those quickly if someone gets scratched or bitten by a night runner. Okay, I'll see to it. The trucks are all gassed up. What do you want to do with this? Lynn asks, nodding at the 130 beside us. There's not much we can do, I guess. I'll grab the helmets with the NVGs and we'll just close it up. You never know. I answer. She nods and then asks, So, how do you want to do this? Well, you know where the armories are, right? I ask and Lynn nods. Okay, then we'll convoy over to the Special Forces Armory. Leave me Alpha and Red teams and you take the rest over to the other armories. Does that sound good to you, I ask? Sure. What about the goggles? We only have twelve, so let's split them between us. Did we find any bolt cutters? Yeah, Horace found a couple in the hangars, so we should be good to go, Lynn responds. What about the others? I'll take the kids and Mom with me. You take Kathy, Little Robert, and Kenneth. We'll also leave a team with a vehicle here for when Craig shows up, I answer. Little Robert appears at the top of the ramp with Mike beside him. Mike trots down and sits at my side. I guess I'll take Mike as well, I add, smiling. Lynn doesn't return the smile, but directs her gaze to the empty skies. If he can, he'll be here, I say, putting my arm around her. I know, she says, still staring into the blue expanse and wishing her brother and mom would materialize. We can fly over and see if we can find him after we get back, I say. No, I don't think that would do any good. It would be too dangerous anyhow, she sighs. 
Okay. I'm sure he'll show up, hon. When we're finished with the armories, Bannerman mentioned clothing, so if you wouldn't mind gathering those as well. Afterwards, drive the transports back here and head out in individual teams covering both McCord and Fort Lewis to check for any additional survivors. Concentrate on the housing areas, but don't enter any of them unless you absolutely have to. It's ten o'clock now, so let's plan to meet back here by 1400 and stay in radio contact, I say trying to divert her worry and anxious about the time. Explain to me why we're taking the civilians with us if we're leaving a team here, Lynn asks, taking her eyes from the sky and looking at me. A good point. I didn't really think about it and guess I'm a little focused on getting to Cabela's, I answer. The NVG's medical supplies and bolt cutters are distributed. Lynn gathers everyone, introduces Mom, and briefs the plan. I must admit, it feels a little strange being in this role with Mom here. I had always separated that aspect of my life from my family. Not that they didn't know or anything, but more like I didn't share much about it. It just feels a little odd, that's all. Grabbing the helmets from inside, I detail Bravo team to remain with the now-disabled aircraft and the civilians. I hop into the jeep with Robert as the other teams pile into the other waiting vehicles. We head across the ramp in a convoy with Lynn's Humvee in the lead. The radios are set on an agreed frequency, but we keep the airwaves silent. Lynn will make radio calls to try and raise any survivors as we proceed through McCord and on to Fort Lewis. We wind our way through the silent streets. At least with the other vehicles on the road with us, there isn't that lonely feeling of passing through a desolate place. And it gives a certain sense of normalcy. Well... Riding through a base in a convoy is not really normal for me. It's just nice to see others around, even if they aren't the crowds that used to inhabit these streets. Brake lights appear ahead, and the convoy comes to a stop. In a brown, grassy field to my left, a hillock sits surrounded by a chain-link fence topped with razor wire. Behind the fence, and nestled at the base of the mound... A heavy set of double steel doors sit embedded slightly into the hill. I park the jeep behind the transport vehicle in front and jump out. Red and Alpha teams exit their vehicle farther ahead, and Lynn walks back down the column in my direction. This is the main armory for the Special Forces Battalion. We'll make sure you get in before proceeding to the divisional armories, she says, standing in the shade of the transport. Okay, and we'll keep in contact with the personal radios. Give me a radio check once you get there. I'll have someone standing by the vehicle radios just in case. Good luck, and I love you, I say, feeling the heat of the truck exhaust against my pant legs. I love you, too. See you shortly, she replies, and begins her stroll back up to the lead Humvee. She stops at one of the other vehicles momentarily to talk about one thing or another. I walk to the double-wide gate in the chain-link fence, gathering red and alpha teams along the way. The fence has a tempered padlock holding the two gates closed. Watkins brings the heavy-duty bolt cutters and, with Calloway, attempts to cut the post on the lock. The two of them grunt and strain on the cutters until the lock gives way with a resounding snap. The bolt cutters and the strength of the two men have won the battle. Watkins removes the lock and swings the gates open. The other team members keep a lookout for anything in the surrounding area. I'm not too concerned with night runners inside the armory as the gate was locked, and from my vantage point, the razor wire running along the top is untouched. Remembering Lynn's story of the night runners gaining entrance to the tower in Kuwait, there would be ample evidence that they had been this way. The area would have been strewn with body parts lying on the ground. There's also the fact that there's an identical lock securing the armory doors. From experience, and I can't assume this to be the case in every instance, the night runners leave clues that they've gained entrance to a building. I worry about their presence, especially seeing as how we haven't secured a more permanent safe place yet, but I will be doubly worried if they gain the ability to enter into locked places. A paved drive leads from the gate to the armory doors. The sun is peeking above the tops of the nearby evergreens, casting ribbons of light across our path. 
The idling of the vehicle engines behind interrupts the serenity that might otherwise be found on this calm summer morning. I find it a little odd that I'm becoming used to the silence. The eeriness of the events is fading into the recesses of my mind. It still feels dreamlike, but not as much as it once did. Maybe because I'm worrying so much about everything that my consciousness is not recognizing it to the extent it did. Not that I didn't worry or wasn't fearful before. It's just that now I'm really feeling the time crunch. The scene at the gate repeats itself as the door lock snaps under the effort of Watkins and Calloway. Alpha Team keeps their weapons trained on the heavy steel doors for precautionary means as Watkins swings one of them open. The squeal of the hinges rises above the idling engines as the door pivots fully open. A cool breeze rushes out from the dark interior, cooling as it passes by. Seeing the dark interior, I expect to hear the shriek of a night runner even though the doors were tightly locked. Nothing. Calloway reaches in and swings the second door open to the sound of the metal hinges rubbing together. Mount up, I hear Lynn yell by the vehicles. The sound of doors slamming precedes the noise of engines revving up. A few gears grind as the convoy begins moving out. I turn and watch the procession move off. The convoy quickly disappears from view, and the sound diminishes into the distance until we're once again left with the silence I have come to expect. The only vehicles left are the Jeep, two Humvees, and a large transport truck sitting on the road by the open gate. She scrambles in the broken window, like she has done every night, before the bright light that brings the burning pain rises into the pre-dawn sky. Her hunt was successful, and she'll sleep without being hungry today. The four-legged one she chased down and cornered fed her for another night, and she's satisfied. Food is becoming harder to locate, and she finds herself having to wander farther afield to obtain it. Small packs roam the night, and she has not joined any of them for the moment. She feels like she can fend for herself better, although the picture messages sent from the others are becoming more insistent. She knows she'll not be able to avoid joining one for much longer, and it might be against her will. So far, her lair has not been found by the wandering male packs, and she has been left to herself. She empties her bladder and makes her way up to the darkened room where she sleeps. Her shoulder still hurts where she had to fight the four-legged one, but her agility and strength won out in the end. Curling up on the floor, she falls asleep and shuts her mind off from the other packs that are finding their way to their own lairs. She wakes suddenly in the midst of a picture-filled sleep, confused for a moment as to how or why she's lying on the floor. She sits up quickly, the thoughts and memories of the previous evening gone, unable to recall the last few days at all, other than to know that there had been a last few days. Oh my God, where are my kids? She thinks, scrambling out of the ink-black room, knocking her shoulder against the wall and wondering where and how she heard it. Checking the upstairs bedroom and finding their beds empty, she flies down the stairs in a panic, calling out their names, her voice echoing through the house. Barely noticing the carpet beneath her bare feet, she runs down the central hallway calling out their names, hoping for an answering shout. The house remains silent, except for her yells reverberating off the pale yellow walls and the soft pad of her feet on the floor filling the space between shouts. She runs to the basement, and throwing open the door, she shouts into the darkened area beneath the house— the light from outside sending a single streamer of brilliance across the room and onto the concrete floor. No answer returns. Closing the basement door, she turns toward the front door and notices the broken front window. What happened there? She thinks with an increased panic feeling. Did someone break in and take her kids? She reaches for the front door handle, feeling hesitant about opening it and confused as to why. The feeling of panic overrides the why and her fingers close around the knob. A veil closes over her mind like a mist seeping inland from the sea. 
the panic feeling is instantly erased and the picture images return. Those images convey confusion as to why she's away from her sleeping place. Her skin begins to tingle from the radiated light leaking in from the window. The panic feeling from before, although forgotten, is replaced by another seeing the light and feeling her skin itch and prickle. She has the feeling she was about to go outside into the pain of the daylight and can't figure out why. She dashes across the partially lit room and up the stairs. Finding her dark room once again, she curls up on the floor and falls asleep. Running Through the Jungle Part 2 I turn back to the open doors of the armory with silence settling around us. The doors open into a black hole. The light from outside spills a few yards inside, but illuminates only a concrete floor leading into the interior of the mounded-over armory. I must admit there is a hunger of sorts inside thinking about all of the neat toys that lie within, items that will hopefully give us an edge over the physical advantages the night runners possess. There's no question that we'll have to penetrate the domain of the night runners for our short-term supplies, so we'll have to go in with everything that will give us the best chance at surviving the encounters. Well, we can do this with goggles or flashlights. What do you think? I ask Watkins. Really, I don't think it makes a difference here, but I think we should sweep the place with the goggles first just to be sure, he answers. I agree, I say. We only have six plus the helmets. I'll go in with Red Team. Have Alpha ready with flashlights by the door, but keep an eye on the surrounding area. If it's all clear, we'll go in together with the flashlights and see what we have. Have one member back at the truck on the radio. Grab your helmet. You're going with us, I tell Robert. I will use one of the goggles since I can fit the earpiece from the radios inside it and I want to be able to communicate. I'll have Robert right by my side, so I'll be able to yell at him if I need to. The sound of his boots hitting the paved lane interrupts the silence as he runs back to the jeep to gather his helmet. He then rejoins the gathered teams. The interior appears to be long and narrow, judging from the shape of the hill. Robert and I will be in the front and middle as much as space allows. Henderson and Denton, you cover the right flank. Gonzalez and McCafferty, you have the left. Flankers keep ten feet behind so we all have clear lines of fire in any direction. Keep a watch to the rear so we don't get blindsided if anything is in there. Watkins, keep your lights on the ground just behind us to help keep an eye on our six. Questions? I say, donning the goggles. Everyone shakes their head, answering. Okay, let's lock and load. I'm eager now that we're at this point. That is coupled with an anxious feeling about entering into any dark place. The experience of past entries doesn't exactly leave me with warm and fuzzy feelings. Reaching just inside the armory doors to the right, I flick a bank of switches to the upward position. No corresponding lights flicker on. Well, it was worth a try, I think, stepping onto the concrete floor of the armory with Robert by my side, his helmet on and goggles up. I settle my goggles into place as I approach the light-dark demarcation line, the light fading quickly from light to gray to a smoky black. The interior gives off an oily, metallic smell that only a room full of metal parts has. The room comes alive as my goggles click into place. The once invisible parts of the room shine forth in a green glow. I look over to Robert and see he has lowered his NVGs as well. Racks of weapons line the walls to the left, stretching back into the room. To the right, cases are stacked on shelving units with crates lining parts of the wall. In the center of the armory, empty tables stand with small basins set within each, obviously cleaning stations. My vision doesn't stretch to include the entire length of the room, but I don't immediately see anywhere something could be hiding in wait. I motion Henderson and Denton around to the right side of the tables and start down the center. Gonzalez and McCafferty take up station to my left and behind. We proceed farther into the armory, slowly checking every inch until I at last see the rear of the building. Nothing shrieks or jumps out. I didn't expect anything from the locked condition of the building, but assuming something can get you or those around you killed. 
I turn us around and head back to Watkins. Exiting, I look at the vehicles and do one of those facepalm slaps. Watkins, can you bring the transport to the entrance and shine the lights inside? That'll help us see the inventory and gather what we want. I should have thought of that right off the bat, I say, shaking my head at my own stupidity, or at a lack of thinking. No problem, he answers, and directs Calloway to go to the truck. I notice the distinct lack of salutations, with the exception toward each other. Well, among the enlisted, anyway. Can I still call them that? Well, now that I think about it, it's really only gone when addressing me. I certainly don't mind. I just notice, that's all. Calloway drives the truck to the entrance, lighting up the interior with the headlight beams. I have Watkins keep two members of Alpha outside to maintain security, and we head in. Now that I'm not searching for night runners playing hide-and-seek, or seeking to serve me up on a plate, I see the treasure trove we have. Lines of M4s are on the left. I walk over to one, grabbing it from the rack. Looking at the selector switch, I feel the delight of a kid getting the exact present he wanted at Christmas. It's an M4A1, fully auto with an integrated rail system. Dozens of them line the wall. Looking closer, in the light cast by the idling truck, I see they are all equipped with Spectre DR sights. My thrill level increases substantially. These are optics that provide for close-up and ranged capabilities. This means this armory has the latest and greatest special ops modules. I turn toward the large cases stored on several of the shelf units. They must contain the remainder of the modules, and I hope they are fully equipped. If so, the modules will have suppressors, night vision sights, and infrared aiming devices, which are meant to be used with night vision goggles. I set the carbine back in the stand. I want to take it right there and then, but choose to keep the one that I have for the moment, as all of these weapons will have to be sighted in. Wow, Robert says beside me, holding one of the carbines. Yeah, we kind of struck the mother load, I say with a grin. Let's load up all of these. I turn to Watkins, pointing out the M4s. I walk farther toward the back along the weapons racks as the soldiers begin carting the M4s out. Next to the racks of M4s, I come across two dozen M110s, semi-automatic sniper rifles firing 7.62mm rounds and fitted with 3.5x10 scopes. Most of our engagements have been close quarters, and I'm not about to turn these buttes down. You never know when something like this will come in handy, and it's not like we're severely limited on space or limited to one overhead bag. I imagine we'll pretty much clean this place out. The rest of the tour is goodies in every location. The large cases do indeed have the module packages for the M4s, and dozens of cases have Gen 3 Dual Eye Dual 2 binocular night vision goggles, along with attachments and batteries. Other cases have M9s with suppressors. One of the biggest finds, at least in my opinion, are the individual radios with throat mics, plus unit radios helpful for transmitting across distances. There are large boxes with ACU, multicam, and black clothing in a variety of sizes. We also find a multitude of Ranger Green, ACU, multicam, and black tactical vests, complete with a variety of modular attachments. Crates upon crates of ammo for all weapon types are brought out and loaded, including C4 and grenades of all sorts, flashbangs, smoke, tear gas, and your regular, everyday, blow-stuff-up types. All in all, there's everything I imagined and more. We haul everything out, even taking the racks after removing the bolts holding them to the floor, filling the transport truck almost to capacity. The sun is at its zenith as the last case is loaded. The clang of the truck tailgate closing echoes across the silent enclosure. I call Lynn, letting her know we're finished, and give a quick rundown of what we found. She replies that they're about finished with two of the armories and will then head over to gather clothing. We agree to meet back at the aircraft prior to searching for survivors, so we can coordinate, making sure to cover everywhere without duplicating efforts. I feel oddly invigorated rather than the tired feeling I thought I would have, perhaps due to the stress, but that usually makes me more tired and have less energy. It could be that there's so much to do, and having things to do gives me energy. 
depending on what it is. It may also be that we have found these great tools that will even things up slightly. It's not that the things we have found will make the difference or really increase our capabilities much, but there are items that will make it easier for us. For one, with our night vision gear, the infrared aiming devices will add to our capability in darkened buildings. We secure the armory doors and gate, sliding the locks back into place without being able to actually lock them and climb into our respective vehicles. The area comes to life with the sound of starting engines. Our small convoy begins to drive back to the ramp, trying to retrace our route. We only have to turn around once after missing the correct turn to McCord. We finally pull onto the tarmac and park off to the side of the aircraft. The 130 sits on the ramp, looking sad and forlorn, as if it knows it has completed its last journey, but knowing that its final trip was perhaps the most important one in its long life, able to retire with pride. As I step out of the jeep, Mike runs from the back of the aircraft and across the ramp. I squat and put my arms around him as he licks my face, his hind end swaying from side to side. We're bonding well, and he acts like I haven't seen him in months rather than a couple of hours. I stand, staring at the cascades waiting for Lynn and the other teams to arrive. The hills are a subdued blue and partially hidden behind a haze. The other nice thing, if one can think of nice things associated with such a loss of human life, is that the air will clear up. I remember looking at those same hills many, many years ago, and I could see them with such clarity, able to see the actual trees residing on their slopes. Now they're just a blur of color. I begin to get impatient just standing here. With all there is to do, standing idly makes me feel like I'm wasting time. I want to be doing something, but honestly, there isn't anything to be done at this time. I know Lynn is moving as fast as she can, and what she's doing is important, but I'm eager for her to get here and for us to be off. We still have the search to do. It feels like I'm running in molasses. Time is passing, but I'm getting nowhere. Looking around, my vision settles on the transport truck filled with items, looking like Santa's sleigh. All I need is reindeer to attach to the front. Time passes slowly. Lynn finally calls that they are finished and on their way. My impatience has increased to the point that I want to start pacing just to do something when I hear the sound of the convoy approaching. The sun overhead passes its highest point and begins its downward trek, beginning the second half of the day by the time the first of the vehicles enter the ramp. They are all in a line as they transit the ramp and pull up next to the already parked vehicles, shutting down individually as they park in a row. The sound of doors closing resonates in the still of the early afternoon and brings finality to their arrival. Lynn's face falls slightly as she looks around the ramp, obviously hoping to see Craig's jet. I feel her heartache and wish I could just make the jet appear. She gathers herself and walks over, giving a rundown of what they found and brought. Her face is streaked with dirt where the sweat has evaporated. How do you want to do this? Lynn asks, referring to the search for survivors. I think we should head off in teams and assign areas to each one, have them cruise through their areas slowly, calling out and making noise as best they can, I answer. I'll stay here with the others who aren't assigned to teams in case someone shows up, alerted by our noise, I continue, purposely not adding that I'm also staying to wait for her brother and mom. Okay, I don't have a map to go by, so I'll just give general area assignments if that's okay with you, she says. Sounds good. How long do you think it'll take to cover the entire area with what we have? I ask. I would guess two hours to do it right, she replies. Two hours? Fuck. Well, it can't be helped. And if we're going to do it, then we should do it right, I say, with my impatience coming to the front. Lynn shrugs and smiles, not taking it personally, knowing that I'm just frustrated. It's a tight smile, but one nonetheless. Oh, okay. Would you mind making the assignments and I'll just find a rock to go hide under? It's almost 1300 now, so have everyone make sure to be back at 1500. The day is moving on and we need to get to Cabela's, let alone to Kelly. 
I would like to distribute the gear and go to the firing range to sight in the weapons, but now I'm not sure we'll have time to do that, I add. No problem. I'll see to it. There's plenty of light left, so we should be okay, she says. I know, I'm just impatient. Sorry. If we have to, we'll stay one more night in the aircraft, but I'd rather not. I would suggest I head down with a couple of teams to clear the building and meet you there later, but the place is huge. We would be too vulnerable searching it with so few of us, I say, just as a light bulb goes off in my head, like an explosion of brilliance. I withdraw inside, thinking of possibilities, completely oblivious to my surroundings. What you thinking? Lynn asks, noticing my withdrawal and bringing me back to the present. I was thinking I could take Bannerman, Wilson, and Red Team and just scout the area. We could also take the measurements on the entrance doors and go find some security doors that we'll be able to mount. I'm thinking of the ones you pull down and lock. We could head over to the armory first and see if those doors might work as well, I say. Sounds like a plan if you want to do that, she replies. Yeah, I think we'll do that. I want to head back to the armory to take measurements and see how hard it will be to remove the doors. Then we'll head to the range to sight in our weapons and meet you at Cabela's. We'll be out of radio range, so we won't be able to communicate, but call when you get close. Okay. Don't you go in without the rest of us there, Jack, Lynn says, looking directly into my eyes. I won't. I mean it, Jack. I know you, so promise me you won't, she says, keeping the direct eye contact. Okay, I promise. We'll just scout around. We'll leave you our transport so you can hand out the equipment prior to your heading to the range. I think we should use the weapons and gear we pulled out of the Special Forces Armory. There's enough to go around tenfold. Leave a team here on the ramp, I say. Remember, you promised, she says. I know, I'll be good. Just leave us three Humvees. Okay, Jack, she says and turns, beginning to issue instructions. Hey. I say, interrupting her yells. What? Lynn turns around. I love you, I say so that only she hears. I love you too. Smiling, she turns and picks up where she left off. I gather Red Team, Bannerman, Frank, and all of the others who are coming with me, meaning my family, Kathy, Little Robert, Kenneth, and, of course, Mike. I give them a rundown on our plans. Then they follow me to the transport truck, and I begin issuing gear, ensuring everyone has one of the M4s and night vision goggles. I also distribute the infrared aiming units. We sort through the black fatigues and tack vests, heading into the aircraft in shifts to change. I issue the gear to Red Team, Bannerman, Wilson, and Robert, taking one of each for myself. I gather a few spares, set them in the jeep, and send Red Team into the open hangars to gather any sets of tools they can find. I have Nick, Bree, and Michelle find dark fatigues that fit and head in to change after everyone else finishes. They haven't changed in some time, and I'm sure they would like to, regardless of what the clothing may be. While they're in the aircraft, I wave Robert over to join me, and we walk over to the base operations building, slinging my new M4 across my back. I also keep my current one because I know it is sighted in and want it handy just in case something comes up. The black uniform and vest are soaking up the heat as the sun's rays stream down. In the shadow of the building, with Robert at my side, I peer in the glass panel set in the door, checking out the hallway beyond. The corridor, as before, is partially lit from the ambient light shining through the glass panels. Nothing is moving, and I open the door. Stepping inside, I look into the weather shop to my immediate left through a sizable pane in a wooden door. The interior is well lit from light filtering in through the large windows on the building's front. The room looks the same as before. A small amount of dust is gathered on the floor. I don't see any tracks in the dust, so I know this room has not been entered since my last visit. I proceed in. Dust stirs faintly from the breeze created by the opening of the door. Robert is behind as I walk into the room proper. A rank smell of decomposition rises to my nose. Not overpowering, but it is unmistakable. Whew, 
Robert says quietly. I know. That's something you never get used to. I'm guessing it must be the ones I shot in the back room last week, I say, waving my hand in front of my face, trying to fan the smell away. We walk over to the desk amid the dust and odor of death. Peering over the counter, I see phone books off to the side. I can barely reach them over the counter, but paw through, pushing some to the side until I come up with one for the Olympia area. Grabbing it, I look through it until I find a place down south that has the type of security doors I want to use as our main line of defense at Cabela's. I take the phone book and we exit onto the ramp. The girls have finished changing by the time we return. Voices and the noise of doors shutting permeate the area as the other teams get ready to head out on their search. Vehicles start up and proceed off the ramp individually, heading to the areas Lynn assigned them. My thoughts go with them, and I hope we can find some still holding out, hoping also that there are a few of them. It's a funny thing, sometimes I think we have quite a few people with us, while at other times I think we're woefully inadequate. Billions of people have been reduced to, well, as far as I know, us. That is mind-boggling. The last of the vehicles depart, their sound fading into the early afternoon. Mullen's second group is left behind to guard the transport trucks. I give them instructions to make sure the aircraft is closed up before leaving. I look around at Red Team, currently setting large cases of tools in the back of a Humvee, along with some of the ammo cases and those going with me. I have to tell you, it is very strange seeing Nick and Bree dressed in black fatigues. The dire situation we're in comes into a greater light seeing them clad like that. It really makes me realize how far we've come, and also how far we have to go. Without the services we've become accustomed to, we'll slide further into another potential dark age. That could be either a good or bad thing. All I really know is that it will be different. Piling into the Humvees in the Jeep, we begin our trip. I have Mike jump in the back of the Jeep, and Robert climbs in the passenger side. The 130 is sitting on the tarmac with the rear ramp still open, the sun's rays reflecting off of the surfaces of the wings and fuselage. With a last look, and giving the old bird a silent thanks, I close the door and drive off the ramp heading to the armory the three Humvees carrying the others in my wake. We stop briefly at the armory and take measurements of the doors. Looking at the hinges, it will be work getting them out, but not impossible. They're basically bolted into the thick concrete walls. We'll just have to make sure we have the right tools. Those we gathered from the hangar should suffice, and, of course, lots of people to lift them along with something to transport them. Gonzalez and Henderson were based here prior, so they know the way to one of the firing ranges. We drive that way with the sun slowly making its way across the western sky and me trying to will it to stop. It doesn't listen. We find one of the ranges and park close to the firing line. I step out and dust eddies around my boots as they hit the ground. The range itself is surrounded by trees with the all-too-familiar dirt berm set up at the far end. Several covered sheds dot the firing line, individual positions marked with small, white, box-like indicators. The range itself is quite wide, but the downrange targets are shorter, which is okay as our engagements have been short-range ones, and it's best to sight in at the engagement distances we'll be facing. Everyone affixes the aiming devices and attaches the suppressors. The M4, as do other weapons, has a different ballistic trajectory with a suppressor attached, so it's important that we sight in with them on. We spread out on the firing line, and I give a lesson on the operation of the aiming devices and Spectre DR sights. I gather the spare carbines I threw in the Jeep and hand them to Nick, Bree, Michelle, and Mom. Dad? Nick says, holding up the carbine. You need to learn, and I'll be more comfortable knowing you have them and can use them. I'll show you how they work and the nuances, I say, assigning them places on the line next to the rest. They had a small lesson with the M16 back in Kuwait, but I want them to become more proficient. 
I hand the remaining spares to Kathy and Kenneth. Little Robert's a bit young to be handling a weapon of this size, so I leave him out. I give the okay to commence firing. The soft sound of suppressed rounds being fired on semi-automatic fills the range. I make sure the girls' and mom's carbines are set on semi and show them how to sight in using the Spectre DR, how to change the magnification and to make adjustments until the reticle is matched to the bullet's point of impact. After getting the sights correct, I have them switch to the aiming device, setting it to the visual laser. The infrared laser will track the same point as the visual one. I show them how to change magazines and to reload individual mags, letting them shoot through a couple of mags until they become comfortable firing the M4. Robert lies on the ground, popping around and then making an adjustment on the sight. He fires a few times without stopping to adjust and then nods with satisfaction. He goes through the same process with the aiming device attached to the top front of the rail, nodding once again as he becomes satisfied with his settings. With the girls now feeling marginally comfortable, I kneel with Mike at my side and begin sighting in my own M4. We switch to the M9s and begin the sighting in process again. The sounds of firing eventually diminish and come to stop. Everybody good? I ask in the resulting silence. A smattering of good here and nods answer. We disassemble and clean our guns teaching how to break the weapons down and clean them to those that don't know how at covered tables set along the rear of the long firing line. Reassembling them, we pile back into the vehicles and chase the sun, beginning our journey out of the base and toward the interstate south. We retrace our route back to McCord, wanting to go out of the gate there. I would take the more direct route to the gates of Fort Lewis, but I remember those gates being barricaded. I'm not sure how blocked they are and what it will take to clear a route, so I take the route I know is open. Time still weighs heavily on me, and I don't want to come across anything else that will impede our progress. We come to the guard booths, once again having to traverse over and around the now highly decomposing corpses. The phone in my pocket vibrates. Are you coming? The text appears. Yes. It's from Kelly. I radio Lynn, letting her know we're exiting the base and heading south. Okay, Jack, be careful. See you soon, she replies over the airwaves. Roger that. You too, I reply. The afternoon is passing quickly as I begin typing my response to Kelly. We'll be leaving in a few hours, thinking around eight tonight. Might have to stay the night. Have water and scent-free candles handy. The phone vibrates again a short time later as we're coming up on the outer gates. That late? Ugh, I swear, I think, starting to reply. I'm moving as fast as I can. You can drive up if you want, I text back. No, we'll wait for you here, Kelly texts. Okay, call you when we're on the way, I type, and press the send button. Hitting the interstate, we turn southward once again. This is beginning to feel like I'm driving a mail route. The sun is far too low in the sky for my taste, given all that needs to happen between now and when it dips below the western horizon. It's almost literally shooting across the sky. Continuing south, we drive past the lower marshlands of the Nisqually Basin. The tide is out, revealing a vast expanse of mud flats. Cranes line the water's edge, standing elegantly on their long legs and occasionally dipping their beaks when they find something that interests them. I look over the waters of South Puget Sound, glistening and sparkling with reflections of the sun on its surface, and see a bald eagle sitting on a tall post jutting out of the water. The eagle leaps from the post and soars across the water, climbing higher into the afternoon sky. My heart goes out, and I wish I could soar along with it. Climbing the hill on the far side of the basin, with the exit we want lying just beyond the ridge, I look anxiously ahead. The tops of the fir trees lining the tall embankment sway slightly in an afternoon breeze. I see the Humvee directly behind me trudge up the slope in my rear view. Cresting the hill, I take the exit and turn onto a recently paved road. 
Passing by two roundabouts and taking a side street, I turn into the drive leading to the outdoor store. The store is hidden by a slope in the long driveway, slowly showing more of itself the closer I get. First the green metal roof, then the large yellow sign before the reddish-brown. As we top the small hill, the wooden building comes fully into view. Large paved parking lots encircle the store with light poles set in a scattered pattern throughout. The building exhibits both the feeling of hidden danger behind its walls and one of safety. The danger comes from my experience within buildings, and the safety from my thought that this will provide a sanctuary for us. I pull up to the front of the store, staying back from the covered drive through area situated by the front doors. Four sets of double glass doors, two on the left and two on the right, with two large panes of glass between them make up the front entrance. A small foyer exists inside with a second set of entrance doors identical to the first ones across a small tiled vestibule. My heart leaps into my throat looking at the entrance. Shards of glass litter the wide concrete sidewalk. One of the large panes of glass is broken, and very little glass remains in its frame. That's not good, I say as we gather on the pavement by the drive through the familiar pattern of faint footprints, marked by dried blood, lie on the light gray sidewalk, disappearing as they hit the darker gray pavement of the drive. My heart sinks at the sight. I have brought everyone to this place, and now it seems like it is occupied. The size of the building makes me believe that multitudes lie within. We have yet to find signs like these into a building where hordes of night runners haven't lain within. I feel at a loss as to what to do. Thoughts enter of retiring back to the aircraft for the night and the sanctuary it affords. Yes, we'll have all of the teams available, but the risk is great. Looking at the store, I still think this gives us the best option given its size and limited entrances. I was really hoping we wouldn't see something like that, Gonzalez says. But, sir, we'll clean them out right quick. I'm really thankful for her support and mark of confidence. A quick gust ruffles my clothing and then is gone. The scent feels clean, carrying only the odors of the surrounding grass fields and the evergreens farther away. I'm thankful the breeze wasn't coming from the direction of town, as it would probably carry an entirely different scent. We're here, so we may have to fight for our place of refuge. If it gets too bad, we can retreat and find another. Thanks. I needed to hear that, I say, turning from the building and the implications that broken glass and footprints indicate. Henderson, Denton, stay here with the others. Robert, Gonzalez, McCafferty with me. Bannerman, would you get a measurement of the front doors? We'll want to put the pull-down security doors on both the inside and outside of both sets of entrance doors. Keep in mind the possibility of using the armory doors in the future. Attaching the throat mic with my new M4 cradled in my arm, I head to tour the exterior in order to get an idea of what we're looking at. The building is basically a large rectangular structure with reddish-brown wooden sides giving it the look of an enormous log cabin. A river rock wall about three feet high is built up along the sides. Looking by the entrance doors, I notice that the wood and rock wall is built against a sturdier concrete structure. Robert is at my side, with Gonzalez and McCafferty tailing behind as we round the first corner. Walking along the long side of the structure, we come across a set of double glass doors, a side entrance set approximately at the midpoint. The doors are intact and unlocked. This is handy as it will give us the option of having an immediate second exit or entry point for when we go inside. Bannerman, there's another set of doors along the side that I'd like you to measure when you finish, I say into the radio. Will do, Jack. We continue along the side and round the corner to the shaded rear of the structure. A large enclosed overhang is set against the building. My nod in appreciation. I was hoping to find this. 
Walking to the enclosure, I see the open part is secured by a chain-link fence across its entirety, with a double gate set in the middle. The gate is padlocked. Behind the fence, bolted onto a concrete pad, sit two very large generators. Each has large tanks with a green diesel placard plastered on the exterior. Would you two mind heading back and driving one of the Humvees over? Grab the bolt cutters and you'll find a couple of green hoses in the back of the Jeep. If you could grab those, I'd be most appreciative. Oh, and grab the gas cans there as well, I say, addressing the two women clad in black fatigues and tack vests. Sure, no prob, sir, McCafferty says. They trot along the back and disappear around the corner. What do you think? Robert asks, referring to the generators. I think they ran out of fuel. It could be that the lights might have been left on inside, judging from the unlocked doors. If not, then we can check and see if they at least work. Wherever we go, we'll need power, I answer. Hey, Dad, Robert says. Yeah, I respond, continuing to stare at the mammoth diesel engines. Thanks for including me and letting me be a part. You may not thank me later, but you bet. I put my arm around his shoulder. Do you think this place will work out? He asks, nodding toward the store. I really hope so. We may have quite a fight on our hands clearing it out. I'm not a fan of its open interior and with it having the second story open to the bottom. We have plenty of teams, so if we play it right and do it smart, we should be okay, I answer. I hear the sound of birds chirping in our vicinity before the noise of an approaching vehicle overrides their calls. The Humvee appears at the corner and is driven up over the curb. Gonzalez brings the vehicle to rest a few feet from the fenced-in generators and both women exit. Opening the rear, McCafferty extracts bolt cutters and the hose while Gonzalez hoists the two metal gas cans. The silver-colored padlock is cut off and the gate swung open. I step into the enclosure and tap down the sides of the tanks. A hollow sound follows my tapping down to the bottom of both tanks. Empty, as I thought. I unscrew the cap on the top of one tank, inserting a metal pole sitting by my side. It comes out with a minuscule amount of fuel on the bottom. The second tank indicates the same. We siphon a few gallons from the Humvee, filling the gas cans a few times and emptying their contents into the dry tanks. Resealing the caps, I hit the green run button on the first generator. The generator cranks for a moment, coughs and sputters, and then comes to life with a roar. The second generator follows. I head to the side with the noise from the generators fading as I round the corner. Bannerman is by the side doors, measuring them with the others gathered nearby. I walk to the glass doors and peer in. Crap, I say, my head still pressed against the glass and my hands cupped around my eyes. What? Robert asks. Darkness still reigns inside, although I'm able to see the green exit lights glowing above the entrance doors far to my right. And the lights are still off, I answer pulling back from the door. Do you have the measurements? I ask Bannerman. As best I can. Okay, I'll turn the generators off and meet you out front, I say. With our original group, I return to the generators and hit the red off button on both of them. They sputter and die. Closing the fence and putting the padlock through the gate, we reload the gear and I send Gonzalez and McCafferty to the front with the Humvee. Robert and I continue around the rest of the exterior, finding only three large service bay doors that are closed and locked. I do note that the roof is flat, but can't see any easy way up from the outside. Gathered at the front with the others, I notice windows set into the second story. I point to the windows and tell Bannerman, and we'll need something to cover those. He looks upward. The windows are regular-sized and set into the wall on either side of the entrance. I think Mars might be best for something like that, he says. Maybe a set on both sides? Good idea, I tell him. Hopefully they'll have something like that at the same place where we find the doors. I get the phone book we secured from the weather shop and open it to the yellow pages, where I found the security door manufacturer, taking note of the address. 
The rays from the sun cast a shadow from my finger across a map of the city as I find the location and trace a route. I look toward the western sky and judge the travel of the sun across the light blue sky. We have quite a few hours of daylight left, but it doesn't feel like it. I look at my watch and see it's a little after three in the afternoon. I figure we should have enough time to get the doors and be back before Lynn shows up, providing everything goes well, that is. I would like to leave those without training behind, but we have scant few to guard them. You never know what the circumstances are at a location, or what we may run into, and I'd like to have every able body just in case. All right, everyone, let's mount up, I say. Slumping into the jeep seat, the invigoration I felt earlier is fading and is replaced by an oncoming tiredness. The warmth of the day, although much cooler and less humid than the previous days, is adding to a feeling of lethargy. Oh, for a peaceful night of sleep, I think, starting the vehicle. I hear the other vehicles crank up, and we backtrack to the interstate. We drive down the black-topped road and take an exit south of town. Subsequent country lanes eventually lead to a medium-sized metal prefabricated building set behind a chain-link fence. I stop by a short gravel driveway leading in. A wide-open, dirt-filled yard encircles the structure, with scrap pieces of metal scattered and strewn throughout. A couple of rusting trailers sit in one of the corners, and three large panel vans are parked toward the front. The gate to the facility is open, making it easy to drive up to the entrance. The blue metal building is plain but large. Two windows and a white door adorn the right side of the building with a large roll-type garage door in the middle. All are shut, and the place looks vacated. It has a quiet, desolate feel to it. With our engines shut down, that feeling only intensifies. A warm breeze blows through, causing the dirt to eddy about the abandoned yard, giving it its only life. The dust twirls upward, forming a small funnel that moves across the forlorn enclosure. The others exit the vehicles after the swirl of dust passes out of the gate like a customer leaving. The air is calm following the short dust storm, settling into the warm summer day once again. The rays beat down from a sun hovering above the top of the trees across the road. For once, time seems to stand still in this little lot. Not a breath of air stirs or sound is made. It's like we stepped out of the world we were placed in and into a separate piece of reality. Even the degree of tension about the time seems to have ebbed. The feeling of separation from the rest of the world suddenly vanishes, and we're left just standing in a dusty, litter-strewn lot with an aging, prefabricated metal building in the middle of it. Clumps of brown grass grow among and around where the larger metal parts have been scattered. The others in our group are standing adjacent to their vehicles in much the same manner, perhaps feeling the same way, maybe lost in other thoughts. I think there are times of great stress when the mind just has to rest itself, or maybe when it's about to embark on something of great stress. I certainly remember folding into another world prior to a mission, but that was more on a conscious level of focusing the mind, eliminating distractions that may interfere with being centered. Henderson and Denton with me. Robert, you as well. Gonzalez and McCafferty stay with the vehicles, I say, breaking the silence that seems to have stretched for an eternity. The others are startled from their trances by the sound of my voice bouncing off the metallic building. As at Cabela's, Robert and I take the lead, with Henderson and Denton behind. I want to do a circuit around the structure prior to going in. The aging sides are streaked with rust where they join the overhanging roof. It's just another sign of neglect that the lot has already shown. I just hope they did a better job with the security doors they built. Weeds, long dead, stick out of the ground up against the sides of the structure. Gravel fills some of the larger potholes, crunching under our boots as we make our way along the longer-than-it-seemed side of the building. 
The front of my boot catches one of the stones and sends it skipping across the dirt lot, kicking up small puffs of dust where it hits. The heat radiates off the sheet metal as we continue toward the rear. Rounding the corner, the back end of the structure looks similar to the front, but without the windows or door. A large roll-type door, identical to the one in front, is open, revealing a concrete floor with dust swirled across it. With this side of the building in the shade, the light isn't penetrating far inside. I wave Robert and the others behind me, sidling against the outside wall until I come to the opening without revealing myself. I stand for a moment, listening. The fact that the door is open alerts me to the possibility that night runners could be lurking inside. The additional fact that we're out of the city a little ways may mean that there aren't many of them around, although I'm sure they will expand out into the country as the food within the cities begins to get scarce. I don't hear any sounds coming from inside, except for the occasional pop of metal heating and expanding. None of the panting I heard in the hospital is present. I look to the ground in front of the door looking for tracks, but the breeze blowing the dust has rendered the ground smooth, effectively removing any tracks if there were any to begin with. There aren't any tracks in the dust on the floor, either. I kneel and poke my head around the corner, looking into the building proper. I don't like being backlit by the daylight, but there isn't really an option if I want a glimpse inside. The light at the door fades into a deeper gray, and then darkness farther into the interior. The sides are hidden in that same inky black. The only exception is a thin line of light showing on the other side at ground level from the opposite door. Nothing stirs. I'd go in now with those with me, but I'm not comfortable with how the rest of our small group is still sitting at the front. If something were to happen, our rounds would easily go through the sheet metal sides, and they would be in the line of fire. Pulling back from the open door, we retrace our steps to the front and describe what we saw. I'll be taking Red Team and Robert in with me. Frank, you take everyone and the vehicles back up the road a little ways. Leave one of the Humvees here. If something does happen inside, I don't want anyone to be in the line of fire or in a position to catch a ricochet. Those walls won't stop a bullet, I say. Sure, no problem, Jack, he answers. Mom catches my eye, and I know she has something she wants to say by her look. I nod my head and we step aside from the rest. Are you sure about taking Robert in? She asks in a hushed voice. Yeah, Mom, he went in with me at the BX in the Azores and did a great job in a hellish environment. He has to learn, and he'll be okay, I reply. Okay, you know what's best. I don't know about Bree and Nick carrying weapons, though, she says. I know. Me either, really, but they have to learn, too, Mom. The luxury of having that kind of choice is gone. Okay, but... Know that their minds are still developing, and things can be taken to an extreme at their age. I know. I wish it were different. We return to the others. Why do kids always say, I know, to their parents, no matter what age they are? I think, watching the others load into the Humvees and Jeep. They drive through the open gate and onto the country road, disappearing quickly behind large blackberry vines that border it. I hear the squeal of brakes shortly after and then the muted sound of engines idling a short distance away. The remaining Humvee looks lonely sitting in the dusty yard after being surrounded by other vehicles only moments ago. All right, McCafferty, take the Humvee around and park so that the interior is lit up by the headlights. We'll meet you there and formulate a plan based upon what we see, I say. The rest of us start walking to the rear entrance, reaching the side as McCafferty climbs in and shuts the door. The loud shutting of the door is followed by the sound of something metallic hitting the floor and bouncing a couple of times inside the building. What was that? Did something just fall off a shelf, or is something in there? Is it occupied? And if so, why didn't it happen before? I think knowing we made a lot of noise on our arrival and since. Everyone freezes from the sound on the other side of the wall. Well, 
We have to assume there's company in there, I say, and Radio McCafferty telling her the same. She slows and drives the Humvee alongside, keeping pace with us. I round the corner and stand by the opening again. McCafferty parks off to the side and behind us. I call out to see if anyone is inside. It's pretty obvious that if anything is there, they or it already know we're here, so I feel comfortable calling out. It's not like we were being sneaky. There's no reply. We'll form a line in front of the door fifteen feet back and have the Humvee come between us. Henderson, Denton, and Gonzalez on the right. Robert on the left with me, I say, and relay our plan over the radio. The Humvee pulls between us, shining its lights into the interior. A shriek answers the glare of the headlights on the concrete floor, which is otherwise bare and empty in the middle. I catch a fleeting glimpse of a shadow moving off into the darker recesses of the interior. We stand with weapons at the ready, scanning the inside, fully ready for anything that might sweep out toward us. And nothing comes, and I don't see any additional movement. The one shriek is all that's heard. The inside falls back into its silent state. McCafferty exits the Humvee. The sound of the door shutting echoes across the dusty lot, and she stands next to Robert. I walk over and lean against the front of the vehicle, both feeling and hearing the idling engine behind me. God, I hate this urban stuff, I think, scanning the interior. Tall shelves reaching almost to the ceiling are filled with miscellaneous materials. They extend away into darkness on the left and right, their edges lit from the glow of the headlights but fading quickly into the obscurity of the dark. I would just as soon leave considering that the building is obviously occupied, but we need these doors. Just how occupied it is still remains in question. My phone vibrates. I take it out and see it's a text from Kelly. Turning it off, I snap the cover shut without responding and return it to my pocket, focusing back on the building. I don't want any interruptions and can't afford to make any mistakes. My thought process has to be on the here and now. Standing from my leaning position, I turn on my flashlight and focus the beam on the rafters above. My light immediately catches a night runner poised on one of the steel girders spanning the width of the building. It's squatting with one hand on a support beam, glaring at us. It gives a piercing yell as my light centers on it. Oh, hell no, you don't. I know that trick, I say, bringing my M4 to my shoulder and fire a short burst. The noise of my sudden firing jars the still air. My rounds impact its chest and shoulder propelling it backward and off the girder. The night runner shrieks as it falls through the lit part of the interior and hits the concrete floor with a loud thump, silencing its scream. The once bare concrete turns red around the still body as blood begins to slowly pool around it. Another shriek and scuffling is heard from the left farther back in the shop. My light pans to the source of the noise, but the shelves and the items on them prevent me from seeing what lies in the lanes between. Well, we know there's at least one more in there, I say to the others. Yeah, and I thought I heard something off to the right, but I'm not sure, Henderson states. Well, we can't assume anything. Why is it that every building I want to go in seems to be occupied with night runners? I ask rhetorically. I'm beginning to think it's some sort of conspiracy. And not sure, but it certainly seems that way. Maybe you're just unlucky, Gonzalez answers with a grin on her face. Yeah, maybe we should ask for a transfer, McCafferty says, grinning as well. I guess I know who the first two in are, I respond to their good-natured ribbing. Talking and joking like this brings back memories of prepping for missions and the bantering just before jumping off. It seemed to bring a certain amount of humanity into what we were about to embark on, as well as cover some of the nerves. That is exactly what this little bit of joking does. It calms all of us and seems to reassure us that all will be fine. I continue standing at the entrance, debating on whether to use the night vision goggles or not. If we use them, we'll have to turn the headlights off, and the glow of the day's light through the entrance may interfere with their functionality. 
I decide to go in with flashlights rather than risk a chance of being blinded if we have to face toward the open door. McCafferty, did we bring any of those flashbangs with us? I ask. Yes, sir. I believe we have a few in the back. Okay, the interior's not that large, so this is going to go by fast. Henderson and Denton, you'll have the right. Henderson, cover the lanes as we come to them, and Denton, watch overhead. Gonzalez and McCafferty, the left. Gonzalez the lanes, and McCafferty up top, I say. Hua, sir, they respond. Robert and I will be out front in the middle. Make sure everyone stays behind us to allow clear lanes of fire. Robert, take the right front, and I'll take the left. Watch the shelves above and keep an eye on the rafters. We'll toss a couple of flashbangs inside just prior to entering and move at a quick walking pace. Any questions? No, sir, Henderson, Denton, and McCafferty answer. Good to go, sir, Gonzalez replies. Okay, Dad, Robert says. McCafferty gathers two flashbangs from the rear of the Humvee as I make sure the rafters are clear of any night runners. I still don't detect any further movement from within. There are six of the large shelves to each side, each piled with gear and boxes blocking any view of the lanes themselves. Workbenches line the far wall adjacent to the closed roller door and run the width, as far as I can tell. McCafferty returns. I take one of the flashbangs and hand the other to Robert, showing him the pin to pull. Henderson and Denton position themselves against the outside wall on the right, near the entrance. The rest of us crouch against the one on the left, with Robert and me in front. Toss yours about midway in by the shelves to the right. I'll put mine in the same place on the left, I say to Robert over my shoulder. Okay, he replies. Ready, ladies and gents? We're in on the flash, I ask, getting nods for answers. Robert edges to my right so he can get into a better position. Let's do this, I say. We pull the pins and toss the canisters inside, quickly pulling back to the outside wall. The metallic clinking of the cans bouncing across the concrete seem to bounce in slow motion, a prelude to the explosion and activity to follow. Clink. 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 The canisters roll on the hard floor before two simultaneous flashes of light exit the opening, accompanied by thunderous bangs. The building walls shake from the explosion of light and noise. Robert and I roll immediately around the corner and into the building, taking our places in the middle. Henderson and Denton roll in immediately after, with Gonzalez and McCafferty on our heels. Our lights pan over the rafters, the top of the shelves, and along the sides of the interior. Seeing nothing, Robert and I proceed up the middle at a quick walk, checking our front and sides. Something slides along a shelf to my immediate right. A scream follows. Gunfire erupts from behind to the right. I sharply turn to see Denton with his carbine pointed upward to the shelf immediately to the right. Looking, I see the last vestiges of blood spraying in the air as a night runner tumbles off the top, hitting the shelf across the lane before continuing its fall and slamming into the aisle floor. Keep moving, I say, the night runner remaining motionless on the concrete. The interior is hot, stifling and stuffy from the sun baking the metal walls all day, turning the inside into a sauna. This is barely noticed as the moment fully occupies my mind. Reaching the dead night runner that had fallen from the rafters, a flash of movement appears in my peripheral to the right front. A night runner darts from a darkened corner and runs into the faint beams emitting from the headlights. Our long shadows on the floor from the light blends with the shadow of the night runner. Robert's flashlight catches it full on and his M4 barks on full automatic. His rounds stitch across the metal wall to our front, going through the thin metal sheeting. Pencil-thin beams of light show where his bullets encounter the metal and punch through. The points of light catch up and merge with the fleeing night runner, hitting it on the arm, shoulder, and then head. The night runner is thrown sideways into the far end door with a loud, clanging thump. It hangs for a moment before collapsing to the ground against the door. Another quick burst issues from Robert's M4, and the rounds streak for the slumped night runner. The steel impacts the flesh with solid thuds, 
spraying blood in patterns on the door both above and to the sides of the now very dead Night Runner. There are small tinks of metal on metal as some of his rounds pass through the body and hit the door itself. Thin rays of light, picking up small motes of dust, shine into the building from the bullet holes where Robert chased the Night Runner with his rounds. I'm thankful I didn't decide to use the NVGs as all of the light differentials would most likely have rendered them ineffective and could have been a hindrance. I step over the dead night runner at my feet and continue farther into the shop. I want to clear the building before any disoriented night runners that may be remaining can gain their composure and assault us. Any advantage the flashbang gave us will be wearing off quickly, if it hasn't already. Passing the third lane between the shelves, I quickly shine the beam of my light down the aisle, picking up a night runner heading my way. I fire a short burst into the creature launching toward me. My first round impacts on the left side of its chest, the bullet catching a rib and shattering it, spreading the pieces of bone along with the now fragmented round into the chest cavity. The bone and metal tear through the vessels and lung. The light blue denim overalls absorb the blood flowing from the entry wound, creating a splotch of blood. The second round hits just below the left clavicle, destroying the bone before exiting out the back. A third round hits the night runner square in the throat and sprays blood in all directions, a splash of it hitting on my cheeks and forehead. The momentum carries it on toward me. I sidestep to the right, bringing the stock of my carbine around, hitting the back of its head with a hard whack as it passes. It tumbles to the floor beside me. I stomp my boot down solidly against its neck as it hits the floor, feeling the neck break and shatter beneath my heel. It spasms twice before falling limp. I wheel around quickly, checking the lane again, only to find it empty. We reach the far door without encountering any more night runners, and I have Red Team form a semicircle around the closed door. Their lights pan around the room like mini spotlights shining from an event as I undo the latches on the side of the door. I move the night runner's body to the side and raise the door, blinking with the increase of light from the afternoon sun that pours into the shop. The interior is now fully lit with the lanes now visible in shades of gray. We head back down the interior in the same formation, ensuring the shop is indeed clear. Robert stands behind his dad with the olive drab canister in his hand, waiting for the word to toss the flashbang. He hopes for a good toss, as he doesn't want to screw up now that he's been given the chance to become part of the team. He feels tense and nervous, moving the canister up and down, testing its weight to coordinate his mind with the physical aspect in order to make a good toss inside. The past few days have been a roller coaster of feelings, emotions, and dealing with the sensation as if this is all a dream, both good and bad. The bad is obvious, but there is a part of him that has wanted to test himself in a stressful situation, to prove himself, as it were. It doesn't get any more stressful than this, he thinks, looking at the entrance and waiting. Ready, ladies and gents? We're in on the flash, he hears his dad say by his side. Robert nods in reply. He then edges to the right, directly beside his dad, so he can get into a good position. Let's do this, his dad says. Robert pulls the pin and tosses the canister inside, quickly pulling back alongside the outside wall. He hears the cans bounce against the concrete floor and tenses, anticipating the explosion of light and sound. He has never seen a real flashbang go off other than the movie renditions, so he doesn't know what to expect. So far, a lot of things that have happened have been very different than he imagined. The detail necessary to survive along with the fear, nervousness, and sheer adrenaline rush of actually being in combat, some things just taking over naturally. That is the greatest surprise of all, the automatic responses coming regardless of the fear, standing ready, anticipating the coming explosion and subsequent entry. He feels a deep thankfulness for all the time he spent with his dad. Light flashes out of the open entrance, accompanied by a thunderous roar. 
Now that's like the movies, he thinks, as he sees his dad rise and rush in. Robert follows directly beside him with his M4 up and ready. His light pans around the front and to the side, catching only shelves and equipment. Walking farther into the building, gunfire erupts directly off to his right and behind him. The sudden noise startles him, and he turns quickly and catches a night runner falling to the floor with a heavy thump. Denton stands in his peripheral with his carbine raised. Keep moving, his dad says, and Robert focuses on his area once again. He walks beside his dad, and it feels like the old times when they were out in the woods playing airsoft, stalking behind the opposing team lines together. He feels a quiet confidence come over him. The times with his dad, whether adventuring into the woods together, hiking and biking, camping, or airsofting, have given him a solid and deep confidence in his abilities. He carries a certain calm inside that comes from this. The only break in this solid feeling is his wanting to prove himself. He doesn't want to let anyone down. A sudden movement to his front. A shape detaches itself from the shadowy depths, transforming into a night runner as it runs into the light cast by the Humvee headlights. He quickly raises his M4 and begins firing at the quickly moving creature. The carbine kicks against his shoulder and he sees pinpoints of light materialize just behind the fleet night runner. He instantly knows these are his rounds drilling through the wall. He hasn't put enough lead on the darting shape. With his finger still pressed down on the trigger, he moves his barrel to his left, walking his rounds quickly toward the night runner. He sees the small points of light catch up. The sound of his impacting rounds changes from a metallic pinking to the more solid thuds of steel hitting flesh. The night runner is thrown to the side against the metal door and slides downward. He thinks he still sees movement and puts another burst into the slumped body. Robert looks from the still body to his dad, who nods at him with the affirmation of a good job. He feels his self-confidence solidify even more from that nod and the realization that he acted in a quick and decisive manner, keeping in mind that he needs to lead his target a little more. He throws that knowledge into his bag of tricks. His dad steps forward again and Robert walks to keep in line. Another shriek penetrates the still and hot interior, followed by a subsequent burst of gunfire from his dad. He turns quickly to see his dad step to the side as a night runner stumbles into view. He watches his dad deliver a stroke with his M4 to the back of the night runner's head, and it falls to the floor. His dad then raises his boot and brings it back down on the neck of the fallen body, the crunch and crack of its neck shattering. He watches the night runner twitch before it becomes still, and blood begins to surround it on the floor. They reach the far end, and he mans a small perimeter with the rest of the red team as his dad opens the door, flooding the interior space with light. That light brings a sense of relief. One, because he senses that this particular action is over, and two, because the fear and nervousness he felt regarding whether he would let anyone down has been answered. Pride wells up, knowing he acted well, and, for the first time, he feels very much a part of the team. McCafferty, will you pull the Humvee around to the front? I ask as we reach our starting point. Call the others and have them come back. Yes, sir, she responds. Gotta lead him a little, huh? I say, chuckling to Robert as we walk back to the front along the outside with the sun in our eyes. Yeah, it startled me and I thought I had enough of a lead, he answers with a chuckle of his own. I saw he was hitting behind and just swept over to it. Well, they're pretty quick, but that's the way to do it. Just keep in mind not to let the kick lead you up and over it. You hit it and that's what counts. Plus, nice making sure it stayed dead. Gonzalez walks over to Robert and pats him on the back. Nice job in there. Good shooting, she says with a nod. Thanks, Robert says, with no small amount of pride surfacing. He's walking a little straighter, and I can tell he's beaming. The vests add to the heat of the day, and with the sun shining upon us, 
and the after-effects of the adrenaline, sweat is streaming down our cheeks and forehead. The others pull up in the vehicles, parking in front. I pull the jeep into the now-lit shop, stopping just shy of the night runner bodies lying on the floor. Several already-made security pull-down doors line the wall to the left. Will you see if there are some that fit what we need? I ask Bannerman and point to the doors. You bet, he answers and heads over to the doors with Frank. I see Mom, Nick, Bree, and Michelle with Robert and assume they're seeing if he's okay. He's using his hands while talking and I watch him as he describes the action. Michelle moves closer to him and gives him a hug as he apparently finishes his story. The rest of Red Team squats by the entrance door taking a rest and talking amongst themselves. And we found some that'll work, Bannerman says, coming up behind me. We even found the mounting brackets and hardware. That's great. Let's load them onto the jeep rack, I say, and motion for Red Team to help. Uh, we even found some shutters that should work for the windows, Bannerman adds. Even better. Will they fit in the Humvees? They should. Okay, let's get loaded up and head back. Are you okay? Mom asks, walking over. Yeah, Mom, I'm fine, thanks, I answer. I was worried when we pulled up and I saw blood on your face, she says, staring at my forehead. Oh, I wipe an arm across my face, but only manage to smear it more because of the sweat already formed. We finish loading the Jeep and the Humvee, tying the doors down with 550 cord. Piling back into the vehicles, we caravan back to Cabela's, arriving just before 1630. The sun is wending its way across the sky quickly, and I'm thankful for the summer days allowing us longer periods of daylight. This would have been impossible if all of this happened in the winter. I'm still worried about getting finished here and being able to get down to Portland to help Kelly. So much to do and so little time. The night will come, whether I want it to or not, and with it, the night runners. If we don't have a secure place, by the time the sun goes down, we'll be screwed. We can head back and stay another night in the 130, but I'd rather not. The Rat's Nest I'm a little concerned that Lynn hasn't shown up yet, We'll have to clear this building, or at least see if it can be cleared. We have enough people to do this, but the inside doesn't really support a section-by-section -section clearing. The open interior and the fact that a second floor overlooks the main floor won't be an easy task if a multitude of night runners are housed within, as the footprint seemed to indicate. I turn my phone back on and check on Kelly's text. She wanted to know if I was on my way, so I text back, soon. While the others offload the equipment and lay it on the ground, I lean against the jeep and stare at the structure, waiting for an answer or plan to spring forth. The only thing I know at this point is that it will be dark inside, so the NVGs and gear we picked up from the armory will be extremely useful. All of the nooks and crannies created by the racks of clothes and shelves of equipment scattered throughout the facility will make it very dicey to keep all angles covered. I wish I could tell better just how many are inside by the tracks near the door, but that just isn't possible. If they were made in the dirt or some other soft substance, then yes, but the fact that they're all over each other and made with dried blood makes it a difficult task. I'm rather hoping they aren't in the numbers they were in the CDC. If they are, then we're in trouble, and might have to find another place. I was really hoping this would be easier. A plan for the inside begins to form in my mind, just as I hear the sound of approaching vehicles. Turning around, I see the nose of a Humvee cresting the hill on the long driveway. This is followed by a host of other vehicles. Lynn has arrived. I notice the transport trucks piled high with equipment as the convoy pulls up and parks in the large lot by the other vehicles. Doors opening and closing resound across the lot. Lynn steps up and tilts her head to the side, quizzically looking at me. You have blood on you. Did you go in anyway? She asks, 
referring to my promise not to go into Cabela's without the rest of the teams. Nope, I answer, wiping my face with my arm once again. Better? Not really, she says, and looks over at the doors by the jeep. I take it the building where you obtained those was occupied. No, and by that I mean, yeah, I answer. Lynn gives a soft sigh before saying, Jack, I can tell I'm going to have to be very specific in getting those promises. Well, we needed the doors and really couldn't wait, I say. Any word from Craig? She hangs her head and shakes it. No, but I left a note by the aircraft before we left, she says. I don't say anything since there isn't really much to say. We stand in the afternoon sun briefing each other on the different events that occurred during the day. The search teams found five soldiers and six civilians holding out in various locations on the military installations. Lynn tells me they were all found individually and in different places. That leads me to believe that some people are just holing up and trying to survive as best they can, not trying to go out and band together. I'm sure some are grouping together, as was evidenced by the marauders at Brunswick, but it also seems like others are not venturing out. We'll have to search everywhere to find whatever survivors might be left. The night runners have strength in their numbers, and I feel we will need that as well. What do you say we put the additional soldiers you found in a team with Greg leading them? I ask Lynn after introductions with the newcomers are made. Yeah, I already thought about that, but wanted to clear it with you first, she answers. I guess we'll keep with the phonetic designations as we seem to have run out of colors. I mean, I don't really want to say magenta or lavender team over the radio. I'll just flat out forget, I say. Roger that. I think we're up to Echo. What's the plan? Lynn asks. Well, there are obviously night runners that we'll have to clear out, I respond, having told her of the tracks by the door. Let's get the team leaders together and talk over a plan. Okay, folks, this isn't going to be a walk in the park, especially if there are night runners in abundance inside, I say to the group once the team leaders are gathered. The inside is cluttered with small shelves and aisles scattered throughout, along with clothes racks. This will make visibility limited in many areas and prevent clear lanes of fire for any distances. We're going in with all of the teams, and it's important to listen up on the radios and keep communication short. We need to keep the channel clear. Everyone nods, and I continue. We'll be going in with goggles on, so that means all flashlights off. There are two floors with the second floor overlooking the first floor in the middle. There's also a large centerpiece on the first floor that prevents any line of sight to the rear of the store. I walk over and grab a notebook out of the Jeep. Robert hasn't joined us for the brief and isn't with Red Team, so I wave him over. I'm still not certain about taking him in, but he has shown himself to be capable, and I did promise him that he would be a part of Red Team. I want him to at least be at the briefing so he can learn. Centering on the group again as we both arrive, I draw the basic layout of the store. All right, the structure is rectangular, with bathrooms to the immediate left, and a small enclosed snack shop against the right wall. Echo Team will enter first and cover the immediate front just inside the interior doors. Red and Charlie Teams will enter on your heels, Red covering the immediate left and Charlie covering the right. I haven't checked to see if the front doors are unlocked as yet. I know the side doors are. A Cressman, would you go quickly check and see if they're unlocked, I ask. She stands and trots over to the front. I see the doors swing open as she pulls on each set. She then disappears quickly inside, emerging a few seconds later. Both the outside and inside sets are unlocked, she reports upon returning. Now that'll make it easier. Echo, enter through the left doors and Charlie through the right. Red will go in on Echo's heels. Alpha and Bravo teams will then enter. Alpha through the left and Bravo through the right. Move past Echo and take positions in the middle to the left and right, respectively. There's a large set of stairs to the left by the centerpiece that leads to the second floor balcony. In addition, there is an escalator on the far left side. Don't go past the second floor overhang on the entry side. Alpha, you cover the left side balcony and far side escalator. 
Bravo, you cover the right and far side balcony. Any questions so far? I ask, drawing the annotations and positions on the paper. No, sir, everyone responds. I notice Watkins' salutation. It's perhaps him resorting back to the habit in the tension of what we're about to embark upon. Okay, blue team, you'll follow behind Alpha and take position at the foot of the first set of stairs and cover them. Delta, I want you to follow Bravo through the right, link up with Charlie, and then you both move out to the right, covering the right side under the overhang. Black and green teams, you'll then move in and do the same for the left side. Once everyone is in position, Echo, move up to the centerpiece and cover the near side balcony. Are we clear so far? I ask, pointing to the various positions and entry sequence on the drawn map. The team leaders look up from the map and nod. I don't bother talking about silence or the need for it, as it is next to impossible for 54 men and women to keep silent while deploying. That's one reason why recon teams are kept small. A small number of people can remain much more silent. After we're in position, Red Team will clear the bathrooms and Charlie will clear the small store to the right. Red Team will fold back to the middle and act as a reserve while Charlie meets back up with Delta. Following that, black and green teams will head down, clearing the left side of the first floor. Charlie and Delta will do the same on the right, keeping in line as best you can. Halt at the left and right corners, respectively. If we don't see anything at that point, then black and green teams will sweep the back with Charlie and Delta, pulling back out of the line of fire. All other teams will keep watch on your assigned sectors. We'll cover the second floor sweep after clearing the first one. Are we still clear on what everyone's assignment and positions are? I ask. Yes, sir, the responses echo. Lynn and Dreskel, keep in mind that the side doors are open as an escape route. If that happens, then Red will move to the left and cover your area. Okay, go brief your teams and then we'll do a quick walkthrough, I say. We haven't worked together before, so it's important we get this down and start learning how each team and its members respond. With the teams together and everyone briefed, we walk through the entry procedure in the parking lot. The others not assigned to teams, and the birds flitting about the area look on. Only, the birds don't seem overly interested in what we're doing. They're off performing whatever birds do on this warm summer day. The afternoon breeze blows across the tall brown grass surrounding the parking lots. A soft whistling comes with it as it blows through the tall firs by the driveway entrance. I look across to the hills of the Cascades for a moment as we regroup and see that the air has become more clear, even in the short time since our carbon footprint on this earth decreased dramatically. It's not that I see them clearly, but the purplish smudge that they used to be, when you could see them at all, has become a brighter blue. They even look closer, and Mount Rainier looms over the city with the sunlight gleaming off its snow-covered slopes. Lynn, would you see to it that everyone has been issued the latest gear? I ask, coming back to the moment. Already done, Jack, she answers. The next few minutes are spent going over instructions on the gear and how it functions. We don our earpieces and throat mics, and each team member tests their radios. Loading up on magazines, we head to the front doors in team formations and line up in order at the entrance. I stop at the shattered door on the left and listen for a moment. An occasional gust of wind blows, rustling my pant legs, but it does nothing to soothe the pounding in my chest. Pre-action jitters are racing through my body— Robert is by my side with the rest of Red Team, and I have a tense feeling in my stomach about taking him in. Not a precognizant feeling, just one of worry. We'll be in the background in reserve for the most part, so I'm not overly worried. I don't hear anything other than the sound of the wind rustling our clothes. The portion of the building in front of the doors is covered, so light doesn't penetrate far inside. The small foyer between the sets of entry doors receives light from outside, but the interior beyond is pitch black, a dark abyss. Charlie, Bravo, and Delta teams are lined up across the entrance doors from us. 
I take a step back with Red Team following and allow Echo Team to take its place, first in line, by the broken glass door. Okay, let's do this, I say into the radio. Go! A soft explosion of noise and movement follows my command as Echo and Charlie teams enter through their respective doors and rush inside. The boots of Echo Team crunch over the broken glass near the entry doors. The swish of clothing grows louder as they proceed in as teams. The clink of metal on metal of sling attachment points adds to the soft rush of noise. Pulling my NVGs down and turning them on, I rush in as the last member of Echo enters. Red Team rolls in behind me. I spy Bravo Team entering alongside and rush through the second set of doors into the darkness. The interior shows crisply through the goggles, cast in a green glow. Echo has taken kneeling positions in line, twenty feet in front of the door. Their infrared aiming lasers reach out into the darkened building, waving from side to side as they search for any sign of night runners. Red Team forms next to them, facing left, and covers their area. Standing behind them, I glance over to see Charlie set up in a similar manner on the other side. No explosion of night runners or their shrieks greets us. It's all good, so far. Alpha, bravo, go, I say, pressing the mic button at my throat. Another soft explosion of noise is heard as both teams enter and rush by Echo to take position farther into the building. The structure stands silent to the assault being conducted within it. Delta rushes in on the heels of Bravo, heads to Charlie, and they both head farther to the right by the cashier stands. Black and green rush immediately behind and past me. Their boots, pounding on the linoleum-tiled floor, cease as they take up positions on the left. Thin beams of light move around the inside like a laser light show. The interior falls silent except for the whisper of cloth rubbing, the team members moving as they search the interior. I feel like we have entered a long, vacated, and empty tomb. Scanning the interior with the rest, I see the great centerpiece looming large in the middle. Created to look like a rocky hillside, stuffed animals of all kinds stand on and along its surface. Short shelving units, filled with an assortment of boating and fishing goods, cover the left side of the store, creating a multitude of aisles and lanes. To the left, front, and right, clothing racks are crowded together, limiting the visibility. Cashier stands are to our immediate right. Charlie team, start clearing the small store. Delta be ready to back them up. Red team will be searching the bathrooms, I say. Roger that. Charlie moving, Mullins responds. Okay, Red team, let's move. I whispered to the team just in front. Robert and I will cover the outside. The rest of you go into each bathroom and clear everything. Remember, these night runners can be tricky, so check everywhere. We don't want to be blindsided. Red team rises and advances down the short hall to the first door. Gonzalez, McCafferty, Henderson, and Denton ease the men's room door open and proceed inside with Robert and me keeping watch on the other restroom. They emerge a couple of minutes later and report it's clear, before doing the same with the women's. We move to the center behind Echo Team. Charlie Team reports the food store clear a few minutes later. All right, folks, we're moving up. Echo, cover the near side balcony. Alpha, Bravo, move up alongside them and cover the other balconies. Alpha, don't forget the far escalator. Blue, you have the near stairs. Move, I radio. The teams rush into position with a swish of movement and the sound of boots on the hard floor, the noise unnaturally loud in the stillness. They take their position seconds later. Seeking targets, pinpoints of light flash in every portion of the large building. Nothing moves in the green glow of our goggles, nor does the air erupt with a symphony of shrieks. The tomb-like atmosphere prevails. Making sure everyone is in position, I say, All right, everyone, here comes the fun part. Lynn, Dreskel, start up the left side. Mullins, guide Charlie and Delta up the right. Go slow and cover everything. Moving out, Lynn responds. 
on the way, Mullins says. I look to the flanks and see the teams begin to advance down the sides of the first floor, making sure they stay under the balcony overhang. Both Green and Charlie swing farther to the sides of the building in their respective areas. Everyone else, keep your areas covered no matter what, unless I tell you different. Listen up on the radios, I say as the teams penetrate farther. I monitor their progress while checking the balcony sides and far end, watching as they swing into small aisles or check between clothing racks. Their progress is slow, but thorough. There's a whisper of wind blowing in through the broken doors behind. Other than a hint of movement from the side teams, or the occasional, check that area over there, or cover me, on the radio, the black abyss we have entered remains still. There is a tension prevailing within the silence. It's not a matter of if night runners are in here, but a matter of when they will show themselves, or when we'll find them. The signs by the entrance doors are unmistakable. Our previous experiences have taught us that much. The teams are a quarter of the way up the side when Cressman whispers over the radio, Night Runner on the far balcony, second floor. I look and see it against the metal bar railing that encircles the top balcony ledge. With both hands gripping the upper surface, the Night Runner is leaning against the railing, peering down in the direction of Delta. Although invisible to the Night Runner, six laser beams of light instantly focus on its chest and head from Bravo centering their weapons on it. The Night Runner lifts its nose in the air and begins sniffing, testing the air for our scent. It sniffs, looks around, and then repeats the process. It knows we're here. All teams hold position. Cressman, take it out. I whisper into the radio. From the Night Runner's behavior, it's pretty obvious it doesn't know our exact location. I want it gone before it finds us and issues a shriek of warning. We'll have to deal with them at some point, but I would rather come upon them rather than having to fold back into defensive positions, especially with the limited visibility through the clothing racks. I would also rather not have a body just lying around waiting to be discovered, but it is, once again, a matter of a certainty versus probability. I know the night runner in view will eventually scream out, and, by the looks of it, very soon. The suppressors we're using aren't the Hollywood type of suppressors. Those don't really exist. The size of the suppressor required for that would be like carrying a tank cannon— yeah, try wielding that around. However, it does reduce the volume from a bang to a subdued pop. The M4 isn't a loud weapon as far as weapons go to begin with. However, it's also not like it goes unnoticed, especially not in a silent room. There was always weighing the danger of noise versus needing to take out a guard in order to advance in times past. That's one reason why I always liked carrying a silence twenty-two. But then there was the danger of the round not being effective at distances. It was definitely a very close quarters weapon. All but one of the laser points of light leave the night runner, except for the single one centered on the head. A soft pop is accompanied by the metallic sound of a bolt being blown to the rear and cycling, the mag spring pushing another 5.56 millimeter subsonic round into the chamber. The spent shell ejected from Cressman's M4 clinks across the floor, bouncing several times before coming to rest. The steel core round leaves the barrel with a flash of light and reaches out for the night runner, the bullet's path intersecting with it split seconds later. The steel hits the lower jaw. The round tumbles upward by the force of it hitting solid bone, the angle of the shot and the fact that 5.56 millimeter rounds are designed to tumble on impact. The mandible shatters, and the now partially splintered round is propelled through the soft tissue of the roof of the night runner's mouth, entering the cranium and exploding out of the top with a shower of blood. The air above is filled with meteor chunks of flesh, brain, and shards of bone. The night runner dies instantly, staggering backwards before dropping from view. 
A hush resumes with a faint smell of spent gunpowder lingering. Nice shot, Cressman. All teams, continue your advance, I say after a moment of surveying the area and realizing we haven't raised the ire of any night runners. Thank you, sir, Cressman replies. That was louder than I thought, Robert whispers in my ear. Yeah, it's always louder inside. Natural outside noise in a more open area always makes it seem quieter, I whisper back. Green, black, Charlie, and Delta teams make it to the halfway point toward the rear of the store when Cressman whispers again that she spotted another night runner, this one on the balcony above and to the right. I quickly halt all the teams in place and snap my head in the direction she indicated. Again, several thin beams converge and dance on the night runner standing by the second floor railing on the right side. The gray-skinned creature, seeming to glow in my goggles, lifts its nose in the air and snaps its head to the right. It leaves the railing quickly and trots over to where the first night runner was, disappearing from view. All of this happens too quickly to issue a command to fire. A loud shriek reverberates within the interior. The night runner has discovered its fallen comrade. Well, it was bound to happen sooner or later, I think, waiting for events to unfold. Time comes to a halt. The last vestiges of the scream fade, and a palpable tension grips the air. The release of adrenaline from the fifty-four soldiers standing and kneeling can almost be sensed. My own heart kick-starts with a boom. It's game time, and the opening kickoff is away. Choruses of screams suddenly erupt from the darker depths of the building, the first shriek fading off, just a prelude to the rising symphony. The escalation of noise is like a ghostly crowd cheering a touchdown in an enclosed stadium. However, the sound is piercing rather than booming. Everyone hold positions and focus on your areas, cleared to engage at will, I say, searching the upper and lower levels for movement, knowing it will not be long in coming. Night runners on the top floor, Cressman calls. I catch glimpses of numerous shapes darting from right to left along the second floor on the far side, possibly heading toward the escalator. A host of night runners suddenly appear at the upper balcony, both ahead and to the far right, pausing momentarily before vaulting the rail and leaping to the first floor. The sound of clothing racks falling to the floor or thrust aside rises out from the din of the yells. Flashes of light emit from Bravo team as they begin firing into the night runners who are pouring like a waterfall over the balcony railing. The coughs from their suppressed M4s add to the noises already filling the interior. Bravo's rounds collide with the horde streaming over the railing, knocking many askew of their downward path, but many more of the shrieking beasts reach the first floor unscathed. The loud coughs and metallic clinks of expelled rounds hitting the tile to their sides are continuous. The only pause of fire with each member is with the changing of empty mags. Delta, wheel left. They're coming over the balcony edge. Charlie, cover to their rear, I shout into the radio. I see intermediate flashes of light coming from the right under the overhang as Delta begins to engage those who make it past the curtain of fire put up by Bravo. The flashes and an increase of sounds ring out from the right as Delta and Charlie find themselves under a sudden rush of night runners. Night runners on the first floor coming from the rear, Mullins radios. The soldiers from Alpha start firing at night runners, beginning to make their way down the escalator stairs to the left rear. Some are vaulting down over the left side balcony. Lynn, orient to your right. Can you get an angle on the ones coming over the balcony? I call amidst this rapid and sudden onslaught. No, the stairs and a wall of some sort are blocking our line of sight, she answers. We're starting to get night runners on the first floor on the left, Dreskel calls. I see quick flashes of light bouncing off the ceiling in Lynn and Dreskel's direction as they begin engaging night runners coming down the left flank, the sound of their shots adding to the din of the battle. Night runners continue leaping over the rails on the right and the far side by the corner of the balcony. It's a tide that Bravo team can't hope to stop and can only put a small dent into. 
Echo, peel off three to help Bravo, I say. I would divert more, but the last thing we need right now is night runners dropping directly into our base of fire. Greg turns and taps three members of his team. They peel off and turn, joining Bravo team and add their additional fire into the jumping masses. Thin lines of light extend out from Bravo into the avalanche of bodies. Some within the horde fall sideways with shrieks of pain and fall to the floor with hard thumps, injured or dead. Alpha is pouring fire into the ones trying to get down via the escalator, their massed fire holding the night runners at bay for the moment. The small number of night runners that do make it over the side run directly into black team and are brought down. The muzzles of blue team covering the near stairs send their deadly projectiles upward as small groups of night runners appear at the top. The wall of steel they laid down doesn't allow a single creature to make it to the first step. The ones that appear at the top are propelled backwards, vanishing out of sight into the dark recesses of the second floor. The laser-aiming devices from Bravo and Alpha are steady as they fire into their appointed areas. The lights from Charlie and Delta on the right waver as they seek out targets and defend themselves. The poor visibility from the numerous racks of clothes makes it difficult to have clear lanes of fire. I see the same on the left with black and green teams, although to a lesser extent. The rapid development of the firefight and the limited visibility makes it hard to determine exactly what we're facing on the first floor. The time from discovery to this point of determined defense has been short, only a matter of moments. I would like to throw red team into the fray, but I'm worried by what I don't yet know or see. Becoming engaged will make us unavailable should something crop up that needs our immediate attention. If something were to happen and no one was available, our line could quickly fail, and we could find ourselves trapped in small pockets of defense, which would then be easily overwhelmed. The carbines from the three Echo Team members remaining begin flashing at intervals as they keep our backside clear on the second floor. A body falls into view, dropping from the nearside balcony, and lands in front of Red Team with a thud so hard it is both heard and felt. Red Team startles, and all weapons immediately round to the body, but it doesn't move or rise from the cream-colored linoleum. The surge of night runners flowing over the far railings is steady. We have walked into a hornet's nest with hundreds of them in here. The short minutes of our fight seem both elongated and compressed. Night runners pile high on the escalator stairs as Alpha renders that area a deadly place to venture. The bodies tumble over the others as new groups appear, attempting to get down to us, and come to rest at angles on the metal stairs, some falling all of the way down to the very bottom. Others slump as if they're taking a seat and resting on the cool aluminum and steel. A few bodies have tumbled partway down the near stairs, lying sideways on the wide, light-colored wooden steps. Some lie face down with their arms outstretched, as if trying to fly. One lies with its leg bent forward and its toes almost in its mouth, its femur broken, either from the fall or an impacting round. Even in the green of the goggles, I see rivulets of blood running over the edges of the steps and pooling on the steps below. A faint haze hovers over our line from the volume of fire, not seen in clarity through my goggles, but observed more as a blurring of objects. The firefight being waged inside our desired sanctuary is an assault on the senses. The smell of gunpowder fills the air along with the reek of bodies being torn asunder. Internals are being ripped apart and exposed along with bowels being emptied. The sight of night runners pouring toward our positions and soldiers firing into their midst, attempting to stem the tide, the fine lines of light dancing above the green-lit interior and the sharper flashes of strobes, loud coughs from over fifty carbines firing, echoing off the concrete walls, mix with the shrieks of the multitude of night runners, shouts from the soldiers of, Reloading! To the right! Or, Watch the left! And other commands or warnings rise above the din. A loud, human scream issues from the right. It's followed immediately by another, definitely human, or rather non-night runner, 
I walked to the right behind Red Team to get a better picture of events, telling Robert to stay in position. A lot of the clothes racks have been thrown to the floor. Night runners move quickly through and over them as they hit the floor from above, launching themselves toward Delta and Charlie teams. From my new vantage point, I see some of Delta as it appears they have correctly oriented themselves toward the middle of the building and the night runners leaping from the overhead balcony. The night runners are almost among them, with more pressing hard behind. I see a surge among the mass, and another scream of pain rises above the tumult. They're in amongst Delta! They're being overrun! Mullen shouts over the radio. Standing by the cash register stands, I see heads from a dense mob of night runners over the clothing racks that remain standing. They are in the area where Delta had been positioned and surging toward Charlie. Some of the heads disappear below the stands, and I assume those are dropping to where some of the members of Delta have fallen. I can't see any of Delta remaining. Charlie now has night runners to the front and side. Charlie, Delta, pull back to the cashier stands, I shout into the radio while witnessing Charlie about to be overrun. Negative, we're going for Delta, Mullins calls back. No, you'll be surrounded and overrun as well if you stay there. I said, pull back. Copy that, Mullins responds, and I see Charlie begin a fighting withdrawal in my direction. Red team, on me. Lynn, Dreskel, pull back on the left, I say amidst an interior filled with growls, snarls, shouts, and subdued gunfire. Pulling back, Lynn replies. I step out from under the second floor ledge above. The night runners have stopped coming over the balcony, resulting in diminished fire from Bravo. Flashes still rebound off the ceiling on the left from black and green teams as they fight their way back. An occasional volley of fire comes from Alpha as some night runners continue their attempt to make it down the escalator, itself piled to the handrails with bodies. Some of the night runners are merely injured and move in the heap, only to be stilled moments later by shots from Watkins's group. It's the same with Horace's blue team covering the near stairs, only an occasional flash of gunfire. Red team arrives quickly and we set up behind the register stands. Red team, fire only into the flanks. Watch for Charlie and Delta, I say, as Robert positions himself by my side. Charlie fights their way back, rushing through the checkout aisle and forming up alongside Red. The aisles will funnel them, I shout to Robert and Mullins. I don't see anyone from Delta in with Charlie and ask Mullins if he saw anyone make it. He hangs his head and shakes it answering negatively. Bravo, orient to the right, but keep the overhead balcony clear. Be ready to hit them from the side, I say, with an internal sigh. I fucked up, and others have paid. Night runners pour out in mass from the clothing area to our front and are greeted by a torrent of gunfire from our line. Our bullets reach out and knock the first wave backwards to the sides or drop them straight down as our steel meets their flesh. Bravo, open up and hit them in the side, I say, pausing momentarily from firing bursts into the solid wall of night runners. An increase in muted gunfire is heard as Cressman and Bravo team unleash their fire into the bunched-up mass, catching them in a deadly crossfire. We're clear. Do you need help? Lynn asks over the radio. Lynn, pull into the middle and act as reserve. Dreskel, remain in position, I answer. I hear something over the radio but the press of night runners calls my attention. The surge is drawing closer, and they have entered the narrow aisles. The floor to the front is covered with bodies, and the runners coming after us have to leap over them. Some vault upon the register stands, trying to push by the ones stalled in the aisles, but they're dropped quickly by the fire from both teams. I contemplate pulling everyone back outside, as we're close to being overrun. The fighting is at a distance of thirty feet and closing. Showers of blood and matter fill the air as rounds meet with bodies. Jets of blood spurt out from severed arteries, coating the cash registers and stands in patterns and dripping in streams where it hits with thick splotches. Cressman, can you advance any? 
We'll try, sir, she answers. A storm of steel fills our small area within the store, coming from two sides. I'm about to call out to evacuate when a strange and startling sight suddenly materializes. There aren't any night runners rushing us. I look to the sides and farther into the large building, but can't see anything moving. Our fire tapers off as others realize the same thing. Cease fire. Bravo, move back into your original position. Everyone remain alert. They may just be changing tactics, I say, as a silence descends. The quiet is surreal. It's like a fierce windstorm that has hammered us for days, suddenly relenting. One moment, extremely violent, and the next, strangely calm, as if it never happened. The evidence of our fight is all around us, however. The haze, that was only faintly prevalent before, is now quite visible along with the tremendous stench. Bodies lie in heaps before us. I hear a moan and an attempted growl coming from our front. A shot sounds from Robert's carbine. The single round speeds from his barrel and strikes a night runner in the side of the head, entering just above the ear. Other moans and cries of pain now drift into our deafened ears, along with stirs of the injured crawling or moving, like the spirits of this darkened tomb have come alive. Anticipating a change of tactics and another rush of night runners, as we have seen in the past, we stay in our positions. The only movements are lasers moving about in the green glow. Does anyone see or hear anything? I ask, after a moment of searching and listening. Nothing here, Cressman reports. Same here, I hear from Driscoll, with all other team leaders reporting the same. Anyone from Delta still on? I ask, only to be met with silence. I call for an ammo check. Blue, Charlie, and Alpha report that they're down to just a few mags. The rest report that they're okay. I have the others share some of their remaining mags with those that are low. The action inside was intense, but it didn't encompass a lot of time. Okay. Charlie and Red Team are going to advance up to Delta on the right. Stay sharp and be aware that there are injured night runners out there, I say. I coordinate with Mullins and both Red and Charlie begin moving up on the right side of the first floor. We have to step over the many bodies lying in the checkout aisles and just beyond. It's slow going as we check over each body to make sure it is indeed visiting whatever afterlife it has in store. There are several night runners that are injured, some barely hanging on and others that are a little feistier. The slow advance is accompanied by the occasional shot as the injured are put to rest. The slow pace is also due to checking each body on the ground for Delta Team members and to make sure we're only shooting night runners. Once past the registers, we spread farther out on line and continue up to where Delta had been positioned. Night runner corpses litter the ground, some entangled within the fallen racks and the clothes. It's a very confused, scattered mess. Bodies are moved after first checking to make sure they're dead as we search the area for the members of Delta. Any hope we had of finding them alive is quickly erased as we wade through the entwined bodies. The reek of bowels and bodies that have been ripped open hangs in the air. We find the first Delta team member and see it has been torn apart by the night runners in their frenzy. The flesh has been ripped off in many places, with gouges where teeth tore into it. Blood covers everything. It is apparent from the scores of bodies on the ground that Delta put up a valiant defense, but the quickness of the assault, the numbers of night runners materializing, the limited visibility, and the fact that I put them too close to the overhang didn't give them much of a chance. Searching through the rest of the piles, after putting a number of night runners down for good, we find the rest of Delta and lay them to the side. 
I notice Robert grimace a few times while searching. Heck, we all do. But he continues with the process anyway. Only a few faint moans now drift through the structure coming from the escalator and top of the stairs near the entrance. I have Mullins set up a defensive line and call for Lynn on the radio. Lynn, can you bring Black Team up and help us carry the bodies out? Sure. We'll be right there, she answers. Black Team makes their way through the bodies and reaches our position. Did you find any of them still alive? Lynn asks as she reaches my side, referring to Delta. No. They were overwhelmed pretty quick. I answer softly. You know you did the right thing pulling Charlie back when you did, right? She says. Otherwise we'd be pulling a few more bodies out of the piles, and we might not have had enough to keep them in check on this side. We could have been completely cut off. Yeah, I know. But it doesn't make it better or easier, I reply. Yeah, I know. It never does, she says and moves over to help the others from Black Team carry the slain members of Delta out of the building. Bree stands by a Humvee in the bright afternoon light. The rays of the sun beat down and strike her shoulders and back, warming her in her baggy black fatigues. But as she stares at the front entrance to Cabela's, she doesn't notice. Black-clad team members press against the outside walls of the structure, tense, ready, and waiting to go in. She sees her dad and brother standing by the shattered glass door on the left, peering into the building. Worry courses through her. She knows her dad can take care of himself and knows he'll do everything he can to make sure Robert is safe. But she's also heard the stories of the attacks in other buildings. It's much different hearing those stories versus witnessing one, she thinks, watching the scene before her. And perhaps it's because the story is being told by the survivors, and I know the ending comes out well. She looks to the side and sees Nick, Michelle, and her grandmother with the same tightness around their eyes. The M4 in her hand feels heavy and unfamiliar, yet reassuring in a way. She makes sure there isn't a mag in the lower receiver and pulls the charging handle back, like she'd been taught, to make sure there isn't a round in the chamber. Taking a few steps away from the Humvee into the clear, she raises the carbine and looks through the sight. Reaching up, she turns it to the 1X setting and looks around the empty field surrounding her, putting her red dot on one object after another. She fired this M4 at the range with the others and found that the kick, although there, was negligible. That was one fear she had, that it would buck hard against her shoulder. The red dot wobbles slightly as she tries to hold it on a clump of dry grass near the edge of the parking lot. Bree notices the gun isn't as unwieldy as the first time she fired it, yet it still is hard to hold steady. Much better than the M16 I fired briefly in Kuwait. She switches the zoom control and the red dot changes to a crosshair. She continues to play with sighting in before turning it off. She steps back into her previous position, making sure her radio is on, and focuses once again on the entrance. Bree sees her dad and brother step away from the entrance, and another group moves quickly up to take that position. Okay, let's do this, she hears her dad say into the radio. Go! The teams by the doors quickly rush in and disappear from sight. She watches as her dad and brother vanish into the building immediately after and sends a prayer in with them. Please let them be okay, she whispers. Without knowing where her mom is or what happened to her, watching her dad and brother disappear into the building like that brings the quick fear and thought that if something were to happen to her dad, she and Nick would be orphaned and alone. She hears a small gasp from Nick. Bree looks at the others and notices that they, like her, seem to be holding their breath. Alpha, bravo, go, she hears her dad call, and the rest of the people outside of the building flow inside like a mist 
everyone vanishing from sight. She's been inside numerous times before with her dad and follows their progress in her mind from the radio calls. Noticing that she's been rubbing the trigger guard of her M4 with her finger, she pulls it away, takes in a deep breath, and tries to calm her nerves. Her thoughts, while following the initial entry and progress inside, fold back to the events of the past. She finds it hard to believe that she was in class just over a week ago, and her biggest concerns were what she was going to wear and what friend's house she was going to go to after school. The whirlwind adventure of this past week seems very unreal to her. Or really the time before this is the one that seems surreal. It still seems like an adventure, but with terrifying events mixed in. It was a lot of fun flying around and being the flight engineer, she thinks, but then turns to thoughts of her mom and friends. A tear leaks out and runs down her face. The thought of her mom and what happened brings a stark reality of their situation. Bree thinks back to that terrifying morning. Robert rushing into her room and rousing her. Her being pissed at him for waking her up early as she had stayed up late texting with her friends. Bree, get up. Something's wrong and we've got to get out of here, Robert said with an urgent whisper. What? Where are Mom and Nick? she asked. Shh, keep it down, damn it, he said with a tense whisper and finger to his lips. Nick is in the hallway by the door. Where's Mom? she asked more quietly. She remembers Robert just staring at her with an unreadable expression. Just get up, now, he answered. She pushed the covers off and felt the cold floor beneath her feet. Her phone was on the sheets next to her where it had tumbled when she had fallen asleep in the middle of texting. She grabbed it and followed Robert to the door. Nick, who was standing outside looking down the hall and stairs, gave her a quick hug before turning back to her focus. What now? Nick asked Robert. We need to make it downstairs and outside and keep it quiet. I'll go first with you two right behind, he answered. What's going on? Bree asked quietly. There's something or someone downstairs, Robert answered. They had all read and watched the news of the quickly escalating situation and had somewhat put the pieces together and knew something wasn't right. There was the news of the increasing flu pandemic and subsequent vaccine. People were dying in droves, and the reports of people attacking each other were startling. The world seemed to be coming apart at the seams. Robert started off, and it was then that Bree noticed the knife in his hand. It was one of the boot knives their dad had given him. Seeing Robert stalking ahead with the knife had made her realize that their situation was dangerous, as Robert wasn't one to be overly dramatic. They made their way to the stairs and began to creep down. Reaching the corner, she could see where the stairs emptied into the living room. Robert reached the bottom step and peered around signaling them to follow after a moment. They stepped into the living room and crept toward the front door. It was locked fast with multiple deadlocks and a contraption of boards against it. Robert had stepped into the hallway in front of the door when a loud shriek erupted from near the back door, along with the sound of feet rapidly slapping against the floor. Quick, into the basement, Robert said, knowing he would never get the front door open in time. Throwing the basement door open, they flew inside. Robert shut and locked it just as something big slammed into it. They fled down the basement steps and hid behind boxes of mementos stacked on the floor. What was that? Bree asked. I don't know, Robert answered. Robert's phone vibrated and he answered, talking briefly. It vibrated again a short time later and again the conversation was short. That was Dad. He says to be quiet, that he loves you, and that he's on his way, Robert said, closing his phone. Night runner on the far balcony, second floor, Bree hears a female voice radio, jarring her mind back to the present. The radio call brings an increased tension within her. She thinks of her dad inside as he issues an order for Cressman to take out a night runner. She remembers the times when her days were filled with being with her friends, Missing her dad, but thinking she had time to connect and see him later. 
It was always later. An overwhelming feeling of sadness envelops her while thinking of those missed opportunities, and how fun it had been when they would all go to the drive-in, how free and open those times were. She sends another prayer outward, hoping they will see this through, and she'll see her dad again. She follows the events inside with the radio calls. Suddenly, shrieks emit through the entrance door, faintly reaching her ears. The radio calls take on a frantic tone, and gunfire is heard in the background. Her heart beats faster, and she hopes that everyone is okay. After a short time, she hears her dad calling for teams to pull back. The noise radiating from inside is constant. Looking to the sky with another tear forming, she whispers, Please, please anything, but let them be okay. Nick steps over and puts her arm around her, knocking her earpiece out. She doesn't bother putting it back, as the feel of her sister's arm around her is comforting. The sounds being emitted through the shattered entrance suddenly cease without warning. Her heart jumps up a notch. Several minutes pass, and she sees soldiers appear at the door, hauling limp forms between them. She gasps loudly and runs toward where they are laying the bodies near the side of the door. She peers anxiously at each of them, but they're so ruined that she can't make out the features well enough to identify. Her stomach turns, but she continues to look, hoping to find something that will tell her that none of these are her dad or brother. She stifles a sob and looks up to see Lynn arranging a sixth body beside her. Their eyes meet. Lynn's blue eyes are red from a lack of sleep and tension, breeze from the forming tears and anxiety. Is my dad okay? Bree asks, looking at Lynn hopefully. Lynn stands and wraps her in a hug. Yeah, he's okay, sweetheart. And Robert? Bree asks into Lynn's shoulder. Yes, hon. They're both okay, Lynn answers. Bree sobs once in relief and thanks any spirits listening for an answer to her prayers. The bodies of Delta are carried outside and laid by the front door. The soft moaning carries throughout the building at intervals. No other attacks, shrieks, or screams are heard. The few minutes of violence that once filled this space will be forever remembered, but it is now just a blip on the passing line of time. This place will forever hold the fierce battle, the shouts, the screams, the gunfire and bloodshed that were created in this space and time. But the world moves on, as does the passage of time. Red Team will join with Charlie. Lynn and Dreskel, move on up to the left as before. We'll try to stay in line with you. We still need to clear the building. Watch out for night runners that may be hiding and for the injured ones, I say, getting ready to finish what we started. We'll move to the corner and then you sweep the back. Notify us when you turn the corner. Copy that. Moving out, Lynn responds. We'll do, Dreskel replies. Echo, cover your area. You'll also be the reserve team, I say. Roger, Greg's voice responds in the radio. We complete the sweep of the first floor without further large-scale attacks, or any for that matter. A few suppressed shots echo within as more night runners are put to rest, with the added result that fewer moans and cries of pain are heard. Meeting up with Lynn and Dreskel in the back corner, I have them take positions on the first floor to cover the balconies while sending Horace and Watkins with Blue and Alpha teams up the entrance stairs to begin clearing the second floor. I take Red and Charlie up the escalator stairs, stepping over the pile of night runner bodies in the process. The climb to the second floor is difficult, as the steps are crowded with corpses. We have to step on them in order to make our way to the top as no part of the stairs is visible. The bodies moving and sliding beneath our boots make us stumble at times. Only a couple night runners still move of their own volition, and they're quickly silenced. By the time we reach the second floor, silence once more settles within the facility. Horace and Watkins meet up with us by the escalator, and we continue across the second floor, finding only dead bodies. 
Numerous shelves are filled with camping gear, archery supplies, gun cases, and other outdoor equipment. The far end wall, behind a gun counter, is lined with rifles of every kind, and a glass counter houses handguns of all makes and models. Passing by a display rack, I point out the M4 base DMR setup that Robert envied the many times we visited. He nods. It would normally have been accompanied by a grin, but we've just lost a lot of friends, and that weighs heavily on us. We carefully check in every nook and cranny, but don't find any hidden night runners lurking within. Assured that this part of the second floor is clear, I send Echo and Bravo to clear out the loading dock area. Rounding the last corner upstairs, I notice a trail of smeared blood leading away toward the restaurant that is set into the corner of the building. It looks like one of the injured night runners crawled away. The trail shows as a dark smear in my goggles, and I point it out to the members of the sweeping teams. Still slowly checking the aisles and tents that are set up for display, we follow the trail as it disappears into the eating area of the restaurant. Setting Horace and Watkins in a perimeter around the restaurant, I step inside with Red and Charlie team. Light-colored wooden tables sit within the medium-sized rectangular restaurant. Some stand askew, others are tipped over and lying on the floor. Plastic brown and orange chairs add to the mess in the area. The restaurant is open to the rest of the store, and the wet trail continues. Stepping carefully between the tables and chairs... I hear a low growl just to my front, coming from behind one of the upended tables. Stepping to the table, with my M4 at the ready and fully expecting a night runner to launch at me, I look over the edge. A female night runner lies on the linoleum tiled floor. It looks up at me and emits another low growl that turns into a whimper. Its light colored blouse is dark with blood and the jeans are soaked. The trail we were following leads directly to her. She was obviously injured at the railing and crawled here. Her eyes are full of pain as she looks up and meets my gaze. I lower my carbine a touch, and we just stare at each other. I direct Charlie to search the kitchen area without taking my gaze from the night runner almost at my feet, with only a table separating us. She must have been shot in the abdomen, judging from the soaked blouse and the amount of blood lost. I haven't seen a live night runner this close before, without being pumped full of adrenaline and fighting for my life. The eyes still have a humanistic look, as much as I can tell through the night vision goggles, and they reflect in the greenish glow like a night animal. The light gray skin glows and I make out pulsing, dark gray veins beneath a translucent skin. I hear her shallow, panting breath over the noises of Charlie team clearing the kitchen area. Mullins reports that it's all clear, as do Horace and Cressman from the loading docks. I nod an okay to Mullins, Roger the call from Bravo and Echo, and look back to the night runner. Her pain-filled eyes continue to meet mine, and she attempts another growl or moan, but it comes out as a gurgling sound and blood runs out of the corner of her mouth. The fact that the night runner is a female gnaws at me somewhat, but I raise my M4. I swear she looks through the pain and knows what is coming and is thankful. A muted cough echoes in the enclosed area. My round enters her left eye, and explodes out the back of her head. A large amount of blood, tissue, and bone splatters across the floor, and her head pitches back before slumping to the floor. With that final shot, the sanctuary is ours, for the time being. By Candlelight Told you we'd clear them out, sir. Gonzalez says as we stand in darkened silence. Although I certainly didn't expect it to be like that, she adds, shaking her head. Yeah, me either. It sure came at a cost, I say. 
Gonzalez and the rest of Red Team just nod as there really isn't much else to say in that regard. A search through the offices and customer service area yields the keys to the facility. I pull the teams out and send Horace and her team to turn the generator on. Walking back inside with Lynn and our two teams, I insert the key into the lights and the building comes alive, awakening from its prior dormant state. The aftermath of our quick but intense battle unfolds with more clarity, and the inside, especially on the right side, looks as if a hurricane swept through. Clothes racks and clothing are mingled amidst a multitude of bodies with more dead night runners filling the area near the cash register aisles. A haze hangs in the air, drifting upward toward the tall ceiling. The reek of gunpowder and a slaughterhouse mixes together, seeming to form a different odor with each breath. Outside again, I look at the bodies lying on the concrete walkway, reminders of the world we live in now, reminders that we can't afford mistakes. Mullins walks over and kneels by the bodies with his head hung. I wonder if he thinks he made a mistake coming with us. They were with him longer than they were with us, but they were our friends as well, other soldiers drift over to where they lie. I catch Lynn's eye and nod toward the bodies, which she returns. We don't have the luxury of a proper service for them. They gave their lives fighting so that we can have a safe place to live and deserve better. Time is pressing, so we gather around the bodies to pay our respects, each in his or her way. Finishing with our service and saying goodbye to our comrades, I gather Lynn, Bannerman, and Frank. Our biggest priority is to get the doors and window coverings installed, along with removing the bodies from inside. We also need to get some diesel fuel for the generators and lay our fallen to rest. Bannerman, will you see to the security doors? How many people will you need? I add. I think I can get them up pretty quick with two teams, assuming they have a maintenance department on site with the right tools, he answers. Okay, take Mullins and Greg. Oh, and if there's time, we need to set up the base radio. Frank, take Alpha and find us some fuel. There should be gas cans and such inside if you need. Sounds good, Frank responds. I'd like to put Kathy and Kenneth with you, Frank, and the others with you, Bannerman, to help out with whatever you need. The rest of the teams can start removing the bodies. We need to make sure one team provides overwatch inside at all times. And one team can find some shovels inside and start digging as well, I say, looking at the sun settling farther down toward the horizon. The other thing I'd like to do is offer our cell phones to everyone to try to reach their families. Robert, Bree, Nick, and I have working ones, so anyone is welcome to use them. I'm amazed that we've actually done so much with the day. I truly didn't feel we would be this far along. Although there is still so much to do and still a trip down south, I feel relatively okay with where we are. If the doors and shutters were installed and working, I would feel even better. There is a time crunch, however, and we may not be able to make the trip to Portland and get back before nightfall. There's a good possibility that we may have to stay down there overnight. I'll see to the assignments and notify everyone that phones are available. Then we can be on our way, Lynn says as Bannerman and Frank move off to start their tasks. Lynn, I really want you to come with, but I feel like I need you here to make sure things get handled, I say once we're alone. Yeah, that's all fine and dandy, Jack, but that's not happening, she says, looking me in the eye. I see her mentally digging her heels in and completely understand how she feels. Seriously, I do trust whomever we would leave in charge, whether that's Dreskel, Frank, or anyone else. But I'm also leaving Nick here, and will feel better knowing you are here seeing to the security. I know the others will do their best to get things done, but I absolutely know you'll make sure they do, I say. I'm not entirely comfortable with not going with you for two reasons. One, well, that one is obvious, and two, without me, there's only you and your kids, and you don't know how secure the place is down there. I'd, she adds with even more emphasis, 
feel more comfortable if I was with you. We have over 48 armed soldiers here, Jack, and my being here or not isn't going to make a lick of difference. What you say is true. My only concern is making sure that this place is secure and prioritizing that, I say. Look, Jack, Dreskel can see to that. He'll make sure things get done and that they get done correctly. He's a good sort, and I absolutely trust him, Lynn says. Hun, I totally hear you, and, like I said, know what you say is true. But I also would feel so much better if you were here overseeing everything. I look into her eyes and see her stubbornness. Well, Jack, here's the part where you don't get your way. I'm going with you, and that's just that, she says, planting her hands on her hips and taking a step toward me. Okay, okay, okay. You're going with me, I say with a chuckle, taking a defensive step backwards. That's what I thought. I'll talk with Dreskel, give people a chance with the phones, and then we can go, she says, and turns to brief Dreskel. I stare after her departing back and wonder just who really is in charge. Shaking my head with some degree of resignation, I gather Robert and Bree for our journey south. We load supplies of food, water, and ammo into one of the Humvees, checking to make sure it has plenty of fuel. Robert and I also replenish our empty mags and slide them into our vest pouches. One of the other Humvees starts up nearby. Frank and Alpha Team drive out in search of fuel. Most of our small group come by and use the phones to try and reach their families and loved ones. There's no response from any of the numbers dialed, with most not even receiving a ring or a voicemail. As we finish with the last of the loading... Lynn walks over with Michelle, Nick, and Mom behind her. Ready to go? Lynn asks on arriving. Ready. I shut the rear hatch. I turn to give Nick a hug. We'll be back soon, hun. I love you. I love you too, Dad, she says into my shoulder. I give her a kiss on the head and turn to hug Mom. Be safe and take care of the kids, she says. I will, Mom. I love you. I respond. I love you, too. Robert, you're driving, I state. Okay, he says, releasing a hug with Michelle. We climb in and settle into the seats. The sun is continuing its march across the clear blue sky toward its inevitable meeting with the western horizon. I look at my watch and am surprised to find it's just a touch after 1800. I'm amazed at how the day has flown by. Robert starts the vehicle and pulls out of the lot. I watch Cabela's grow smaller in the rear view. We have our sanctuary, or at least a major start to one, but it came at a great cost. We lost a whole team in the process, and I have a sick feeling in my stomach thinking about it. I still wonder if we did the right thing with staying and taking it, rather than just finding another place once we spotted the tracks. It all happened so fast that there wasn't much time to analyze it other than to just react. But a whole team, I think, watching the building recede. That's just too costly and we can't afford a loss rate like that. Or any for that matter. We lost over 10% of our force in a matter of minutes. In normal military terms... That is referred to as being decimated. Valiant soldiers, all good men and women, gone in the blink of an eye. This really makes me realize just how tenuous our situation is, or can become. The thing to do is make sure we add this lesson to our future endeavors, I think, as we turn onto the interstate southbound. I pull out my cell phone as Robert drives us past Olympia and down the lonely road. We're the only vehicle on the highway. A moving vehicle, that is. There's an occasional car or pickup parked on the shoulder of the interstate. We pass by a rest area and see only a few cars in the lot. A body lies stretched out over one of the green picnic tables. Too far to be seen clearly, but obviously not moving. I dial Kelly's number as the scene slides behind us. 
We're on our way, I say, once she answers and the hellos are out of the way. Did you go see about Carrie? Kelly asks. I'm sorry, but we didn't have the time. We'll check on her when we get back, I answer. What have you been doing all day, then? She asks in an exasperated tone. We've been busy setting up a safe place. We're about two hours out and may have to stay there for the night, I reply. Okay, but there's still a lot of daylight left. Yeah, but there may be not enough to get back before dark, I say. Put some unscented candles in the bathroom so we'll have light. Why do we... And that's all, as I hear the beep of a signal lost from my phone. I look at the screen and see, searching for signal, dance across the screen. No bars show on the signal strength meter. I ask Bree to check her phone, and it's the same. I guess the days of cell service have seen their last. I'm surprised it's lasted this long. It's just one more technology that has failed, and it certainly won't be the last. I close the phone and look out at the passing fields. There are quite a few that have cows silently standing where they always have. A few have their heads down, eating. I wonder if they have even noticed the change about them. The complete lack of automobiles passing by, or the decrease of noise. I wonder if they notice that the ranchers are no longer coming to check on them. There are several bridges to cross on the way down, and I'm worried they may be obstructed. There's no way to contact Kelly now if we find our route blocked. If even one of them is impassable, it could take hours to find a way around, if at all. Although each one is crucial, the ones I'm particularly concerned about are the ones spanning the wide Columbia River. Those are the ones most likely to be blocked as they connect two major cities. We won't have much time to either find a way around or find a safe place to hole up if we can't get across. We pass through one of the larger country towns and the interstate becomes blocked by cars that were trying to get off one of the on-ramps. Robert slows and stops before driving across the grass median between the north and southbound lanes, pulling onto the northbound lanes to circumvent the block. The smell of decomposing bodies becomes strong as we pass. So strong, my stomach turns and I almost gag. Oh my God, that stinks, Bree says with a disgusted tone. Hold your breath, hon, we'll be by it in a bit. I tell her in a whispery voice as I try to hold mine as well. During the drive down, Lynn and I talk about some of the things we need to do when we get back, and the organization needed to do them, with Robert and Bree participating in the conversations. The bridges so far don't present any obstacles as we pull close to the I-5 Columbia River crossing, with the sun just a few fingers above the horizon. The vehicles on the road have increased to a degree as we enter Vancouver, but haven't blocked the interstate fully. Crows hop among several of the cars looking for morsels. I don't even want to think about what they may be finding. Finally, I see the towers of the drawbridge rise above the downtown buildings, and the congestion increases as we draw nearer. Robert slows as we thread our way through the line of cars, a major Portland hospital exit lies down the road a ways, and it may be that this jam is from people that were trying to get there. I just hope the bridge isn't completely inundated with cars. We get to within a mile of the bridge when my fears materialize, and the route becomes completely blocked. My anxiety increases, thinking we're so close yet not able to complete the distance, at least not at this crossing. Uh, let's backtrack to the other freeway and try the bridge there, I say to Robert. Uh, how do we get there? He asks. Uh, just back up until we can turn around and we'll drive to the I-205 exit. That'll take us to another bridge, and if that one's blocked, then I'm out of ideas, I answer. Robert backs up slowly, threading his way through the snarl until we reach a point where we can turn our beast around. We make our way to the convergence of the highways and turn off the exit. The roads are much more clear along the secondary route, and we find the bridge mostly unobstructed. We pass over the long, light gray, concrete bridge spanning the wide river. The sun reflects off the water's surface with a bright shimmer. Sailboats dot the marinas by the shore, 
but none plow the waterway. The river that once was busy with sailboats slowly meandering along, sails unfurled, skiers enjoying a day in the sun, and jet skis creating waves, is now as empty as the roads. The sun is tipping to the horizon, beginning to fill the late afternoon, evening sky with orange colors as we pull into Kelly's apartment complex. I have Robert pull into the main lot outside of her apartment and park with the Humvee pointed toward the entrance just in case we need to get away quickly. Of course, if it comes to that, we would most likely have trouble getting to the vehicle, but one can never be too proactive. I step out of the vehicle, my butt sore from once again sitting for multiple hours, and look around at the complex. Three-story apartments encircle the lot, silent, yet giving the impression that they're holding a secret. The silence gives off a feeling of peace and serenity, but the dark windows staring out present an underlying menacing feel, and the sound of the Humvee doors closing reverberates off the white wooden walls. The shadow of the building next to us stretches across the lot as the day begins to close. Now let's grab our gear and head in, I say, worriedly eyeing the deepening blue sky. Toting our weapons, ammo, goggles, and water, we walk to Kelly's apartment door. The apartments are built on a hill, so that her second-floor apartment door is actually level with the parking lot. And it's on the other side, toward the back, that the second-floor nature of it is revealed. I knock and hear the deadbolt slide. The door opens, and Kelly stands framed by the entry looking disheveled. Her normally kempt black hair hangs limply, with strands sticking out in places. Dark circles surround her almost black eyes and show clearly on her lightly tanned skin. "'Thank goodness you're here. I was so scared.' Kelly says, opening the door wider. I hear Lynn's heavy sigh behind me. We're here. Did you put the candles in the bathroom? I ask, walking inside with Robert, Bree, and Lynn following. Yeah, but I don't get why there, she answers. Because that's where we're going to hole up. It doesn't have direct access to the outside, and therefore our light and noise will be diminished. They are scentless, right? I ask. Most of them, she replies. Well, take the scented ones out. I walk from the small entry foyer and into where the kitchen is separated from the living room. Robert, make sure the windows and doors are closed and locked, I tell him over my shoulder. They're already locked, I hear someone say from the kitchen. I turn to see Brian standing by the sink. He looks as disheveled as Kelly with his short brown hair sticking up in places. His paler skin looks akin to a night runner, but more on the pink side rather than gray and without the translucent nature. His tan, docker-style slacks and long sleeve button-up blue shirt are wrinkled and dirty. Now, you can never be too careful, and the more eyes on something, the better. I nod at Robert to continue. Whatever, do what you want, but I'm telling you everything is locked, Brian says. I shake my head and turn to Lynn. Let's check the bathroom out. Bree, go with Robert. Okay, Dad, Bree replies. I watch her walk toward Robert, who is checking the living room windows that overlook the back side of the apartments, and have a very strange feeling settle inside. I'm watching her nonchalantly walk across the room in her loose, black, tactical uniform, with her long, blonde hair flowing down the back and casually carrying an M4 by her side. I tell you, it's such a strange sight to see with your fifteen-year-old daughter. Now, the apartment itself is set up like most any other apartment. The front door opens into a small foyer, which makes a ninety-degree turn, opening up to a small kitchen on the left and a living room stretching ahead to a set of Oriel windows looking out on the setting sun. A hallway extends to the immediate right of the kitchen, terminating at the master bedroom, with a bedroom off to the kitchen side of the hallway. An interior bathroom opens to the left about halfway down the hall. To the far right of the living room, another bedroom opens. Lynn and I walk into the central bathroom with Kelly following. It's a very small bathroom with a single sink, shower, and toilet. 
It's going to be a little cozy in here tonight. I remove the top of the toilet and disconnect the flush lever. Yeah, you're not kidding, Lynn replies. Why are you doing that? Kelly asks, referring to my disconnecting the toilet. We need to keep absolutely quiet, so no flushing. This is going to make sure someone doesn't forget. Oh, Kelly says. Candles of various sizes sit on the counter. I make sure that only unscented ones remain and hand any scented ones to Kelly to put back wherever she keeps them. There should be enough left to keep lit for the night. Kelly looks quizzically at the ones I handed her. The night runners, the creatures, have a terrific sense of smell and may well be able to pick out the odor of scented candles burning. We can't afford to take the chance that they can, I answer her look. Robert and Bree walk down the hallway. We follow them out and meet in the living room. All closed and locked, Robert says. I hear the front door open, and in walks a tall, lithe brunette carrying several bottles of water. She stops in her tracks, shocked by the presentation of several armed people standing in her living room. Jessica, Kelly's daughter and my once stepdaughter, stares at Robert and Bree standing in their dark fatigues and sporting M4s as if the picture doesn't match. She hasn't seen them in a while, and I'm certain she never expected them to appear before her fully armed and with looks of determination. The experiences we've had over the past week or so have changed them. They're confident and fully aware of the situation we find ourselves in. A little over a week ago, they were attending school— and now have flown halfway across the world, meeting with countless night runners. In that time, Robert has learned to fly a 130, has done so with a high degree of skill, in addition to being involved in several skirmishes and intense firefights. Bree has been an integral part of flying the 130, learning the systems, and is able to do the flight engineer job in her sleep. She has also seen several encounters— those experiences have put an added confidence and wisdom in their eyes. Uh, hi, Jack, Jessica says, turning her dark brown eyes toward me with a little uncertainty in her voice. It's been a while since we've seen each other. We were close once, but time and the separation saw a change to that. She must be about twenty now, I think, seeing her standing in the kitchen entry. Hi, Jessica. Nice to see you again, I say with a touch of self-consciousness as well. I only found a few bottles of water left at the gas station, Jessica says, turning to Kelly and Brian, depositing the bottles on the kitchen counter. Wait, what? Lynn exclaims. Are you telling me you let her go out and into a building by herself? Now, we've been in there before, so it's okay, Brian responds. You do understand what's going on and what we're dealing with, right? Lynn counters. Yes, Brian answers. Lynn hangs her head and shakes it from side to side before looking up at me. Tell me why we came down here again, she asks. That's my Lynn, blunt and to the point. Well, let's just focus and get ready for tonight, although that wasn't the greatest of ideas, I add, looking at Kelly. We need to talk about tonight's plan. What do we need to do? Kelly asks. Well, first of all, we need to barricade the front door and put something up to block the kitchen window, I say, thinking that those are the two most prevalent entrances at ground level. I'm not too keen on blocking our only exit routes, but I don't really see much of an alternative. What about using the couch for the door? Bree asks. I look over at the larger of the two couches in the living room, thinking it may indeed fit in the entrance foyer against the door and opposing wall. A good idea, Bree. Why don't you, Robert, and Brian see if you can wedge it into place? As they begin moving the couch, I look around the rest of the apartment for something to block the kitchen window that overlooks the front entryway. It's not the easiest solution, finding something to put over the sink that will hold— but I eventually settle on a small bookcase in one of the bedrooms. Pulling the books and knickknacks off the shelves, Lynn and I lift the bookcase up against the window with the back to the outside. We also grab the smaller couch and wedge it between the shelves and the kitchen counter, 
pulling and pushing to make sure it is pressed firmly against the shelves, wedging it in place. Robert, Bree, and Brian manage to fit the couch against the front door. We gather in the now couchless living room. An orange glow peeks around the closed blinds, announcing that the day is rapidly drawing to a close. I notice a not-so-faint aroma rising from my clothes. Yeah, the confined space we'll be in tonight should be interesting in that regard, and I wish I had brought a change. You know that bathroom isn't very defensible, Lynn says. I know. What do you think about using the back bedroom if something goes down tonight? I think that's probably our best bet, she answers. Let's go take a look, then. As a group, we move to the back bedroom down a narrow hallway filled with framed family pictures on the walls. The bedroom is mostly filled with a bed and a dresser. To the left and back side of the apartment, long, white, slat-like blinds hang vertically over a sliding glass door leading to a small patio. The patio itself stands a good ten feet off another paved driveway and parking places. To the right, a good-sized walk-in closet opens off the room with a larger bathroom just past it. The frosted window in the bathroom leading outside is too small for anyone or anything to gain entrance. The walk-in closet is filled with clothing in every available space, with shoeboxes and shoes lining the floor underneath. Kelly, can you clean off the closet floor? I ask. Kelly and Jessica remove the shoes and boxes, stuffing them under the bed and on the floor by the dresser. While they are busy with that, Robert, Lynn, Bree, and I don our NVGs and test our radios, making sure they're off to conserve the batteries. The nice thing about these units is that the battery packs are rechargeable. However, there isn't any electrical power here and I didn't bring the chargers with us. Our actions throughout the day have drained them to an extent. The orange glow that was peeking around the living room blinds now changes to a deepening blue-gray around the bedroom blinds. Uh, what now? Robert asks as we pile into the interior bathroom. Now we wait the night out, I answer. If something happens... We'll move quickly into the bedroom with everyone in the closet. I'll cover the hallway. I'll be with you, Lynn says. I'd rather you be with everyone else and cover my back, watching over the back patio door. It's an enclosed space, and I don't want to have to second-guess what I'm shooting at. I wish we had the IFF tabs we could attach to our uniforms. A thought for later. Okay, Jack, she replies. What about me? Robert asks. The same. Keep my backside clear and protect the others, I answer. The bathroom is indeed crowded with the seven of us crammed in. I take a seat on the counter by the sink with Robert next to me. Lynn squats by the hallway door, and Bree sits herself on the bathtub rim. Brian sits on the floor under the towel rack, with Kelly by the other door leading to the far bedroom, and Jessica sitting on the toilet seat. We light the candles and place towels under the door. What's with the towels? Kelly asks. So the light doesn't leak out, I answer. Well, I for one don't want to wait the night out in here, Brian says. We don't have much choice, I respond. We've stayed out in the living room and bedrooms every night and have been just fine, he retorts. Look, Brian, we have to become a deep dark hole in the fabric of space and time. You have no idea what these night runners are capable of, I state in a whisper, and keep your voice down. What, just because you come in here wearing SWAT gear and trying to look badass doesn't mean that you know everything and have all the answers, he says, still keeping his normal tone. Weren't you just a pilot anyway? There are very few people in this room who know exactly what I did, and that's irrelevant. All of us here have had a bit of experience with the Night Runners, so we do know a bit. I don't think you fully grasp what we're dealing with, I whisper. There are what, like over two million people in the Portland area? Or were? Yeah, something like that, I guess, he says, keeping his voice at normal volumes. Shh. 
keep your voice down, damn it, I whisper sharply. Just so you understand, there is something like 30% of the population that turned into night runners. That means there are about 700,000 of them around this area. 700,000, Brian. That is a fuck of a lot. As if to emphasize my point, a very faint, distant, yet distinct shriek of a night runner, or perhaps a few of them, penetrates the inner walls. Yeah, I'll be fucked if I'm going to be told what to do in my own place, and will talk as loud as I want, he says, his voice rising. That's a surprise to me, as I didn't know Kelly and him were living together. But then again, there's been no contact with Kelly since we split up many years ago. There's an obvious alpha male thing going on. I'm getting that Brian is feeling a little insecure, which could stem from a number of reasons. He may be jealous and feel the need to assert himself, seeing as how Kelly and I were together at one point, or it may be from the fact that we were asked to help, leaving him feeling inadequate, that his manhood is in question. I just don't have the time or patience for his insecurities, especially if they are endangering the rest of us. I can also tell by the tightness of her lips and the narrowing of her eyes that Lynn is getting fairly perturbed. Brian starts to rise as another shriek rises in the night, closer this time. Sit the fuck down and shut up! You're endangering us all, fuckwit! Lynn says with a sharp whisper, finally having had enough. Brian pauses in his movement. What, are you going to shoot me? He asks, not lowering his voice one whit. If I have to, and if that's what it takes, Lynn says, raising her M4 a notch. I see by the lightness around his eyes that Robert is pretty upset as well. Along with Lynn, he raises his weapon a touch. Bree and Jessica are watching the exchange with wide eyes, although Bree has more of a this is interesting, expression on her face. Brian, please sit down. They know what they're doing, and I trust them. Brian does indeed plant himself back on the floor, but continues to glare. How about lending one of your guns, then? He asks. Have you been trained? I ask in return. I've shot a gun before, he answers. But I mean trained, as in any military-type experience. I ask. No? Then no. I don't want the added risk of someone not knowing what they're doing and maybe shooting in a moment of excitement and injuring one of us. You have your kids toting around weapons, and I know they weren't in the military, Brian states. Yeah, they've had some training, and I trust them, I respond. A scream cuts sharply into the night, intruding upon our conversation. Footsteps thump across the ceiling from the apartment above. The sound and vibration of the footsteps are accompanied by voices, too dim to make out the actual words, but it's apparent they are from people and sound like female voices. Who's that? I ask quietly. I think they're the daughters from the couple upstairs, Kelly answers. Have you talked with them? I ask. No, she replies. Another loud shriek penetrates, sounding like it's coming from the parking lot in front. This is followed by an additional one from the same area. The voices upstairs continue. They better be quiet or they're going to invite the night runners, Lynn says. As if her words were the catalyst, a pounding of footsteps on the concrete steps outside heads upstairs, vibrating the apartment. Shrieks dominate the night and the first slamming of bodies into the upstairs apartment door causes the people there to scream as well. This only serves to agitate the night runners more. Can we help them or do anything? Jessica asks as we all look to the ceiling above. I glance to make sure the towels are securely barring any light emitting from our small bathroom enclave. If we'd have known someone was up there, we could have brought them down with us. But there's nothing we can do now without endangering us all, I answer. The assault on the upstairs door continues, and then, with a crash and the sound of splintering wood, the door gives way. 
Loud shrieks and rapid footfalls race across the ceiling just a few feet over our heads. No! erupts from above. Cries resonate, filling our tiny space. A loud thump shakes the apartment, and agonizing screams rise above and mix with the screeches from the night runners. I can almost make out the sound of flesh being bitten into and torn from the bodies, but that is mostly coming from my imagination. The flames from the candles around us waver, as if dancing in tune to the horrific scene being enacted above, making our shadows dance across the walls to the same macabre beat. The screams stop, and only a muted growling and snarling reach our ears. My finger caresses the trigger guard, both from nervousness with having the night runners so close, and a sick feeling hearing that horrible end to the people upstairs. With the scene fresh in my mind, I don't think there can be too many other survivors. Our one percent has most likely decreased to a marginal level. What in the fuck was that? Brian asks loudly. You have got to be fucking kidding me, I think, looking at him incredulously with a touch of fear and panic washing through me. I can't believe he just spoke that loudly. Again. Especially after what we just heard. He just doesn't get it. Several loud screeches come from above, and footsteps thump rapidly across the ceiling. You fucker! Lynn sharply whispers and begins to stand. Everyone in the closet, now! I whisper on the heels of her statement. We rise and Lynn opens the bathroom door as I blow out the candles, plunging the interior into darkness. Lynn steps into the hall, ushering the others out of the door. I snap down my goggles and turn them on, bringing on the familiar glow of night vision. The pattern of steps on the stairs outside mixes with the shuffle of our group in the hallway as we head to the back bedroom and closet. Lynn follows after the others pass. Robert, who has waited in the bathroom with me until everyone else has exited, pulls his NVGs on as well and looks at me. I can't read his expression due to the goggles. We've been through worse, I tell him, guessing at his thoughts. Yeah, but we don't have an exit to retreat to this time, he says. True, I say with a sigh, but we'll be fine. Keep my backside clear. I will, Dad, he says, and gives me a quick hug as best he can while holding his M4. I return the hug, and he heads out the door and down the hall. Was that him thinking the worst is about to happen, given what we heard above us just a few moments ago? and wanting to get a last hug in, I think, closing the bathroom door and heading down the hall. Or was it for reassurance? The first hard slam against the front door sounds, startling me, even though I expected it. I stop and kneel in the hall close to the bedroom door, with a direct line of sight to the front door. Turning my sight to the 1X setting, I look through and set the dot on the center of the door. I'm hoping the couch holds the entryway long enough for the night runners to grow tired and move on. I'm also hoping they can't get in through the kitchen window, since I can't see that very well. If they do get through, they can run around and get through the bathroom, which will give me a very limited amount of time to react. The same goes for being able to scale the building on the outside and get into the far bedroom. I'm taking nothing for granted as to what the night runners can and can't do. They've surprised me more times than I care to recall. There is no way of telling how many of them are gathered, but, judging from the shrieks and the pounding on the door, there are quite a few. I look toward the closet, but can only see the opening from this angle. I picture them all with their backs to the wall, with dresses, shirts, and pants dangling about their heads. I'm in the hall by the bedroom door, I say, pressing the mic button at my throat wanting to let them know exactly where I'm positioned. Is everyone okay? Copy that, and we're doing fine, Lynn answers. How does it look out there? So far, so good, I reply. I look back to the front, keeping both eyes open and using a parallax view. This allows a greater width and depth of field while being able to see the target and aiming dot at the same time. 
The front door jars and shakes with each successive thump against it. It is holding, and I imagine that the night runners are getting pretty sore shoulders, but the couch is against the jam rather than the door itself, so there's a little give with each collision. The glass from the kitchen window breaks, and I see the couch wedging the bookcase shake, but it also holds firm for the time being. My heart is pounding, and I have a trapped feeling. I always like having a way out if things go awry, but I don't see an option here. We can't escape through the patio door as the drop, although livable, will take us out into the night with no protection. It's also on the other side from where we parked the Humvee, so that option offers nothing. Kind of fucked up where I parked on that one, I think. I suddenly hear loud, heavy breathing through my earpiece. It sounds like Bree. She must have just turned on her radio and set her radio to Vox, voice activated, which makes her mic activate and transmit with any sound. Or she may be accidentally holding the mic button down. It'll hold up the frequency if we need to communicate, so I rise to tell her. A particularly loud bang hammers the front door, and I hear her take a deep, sharp breath in. It's okay, Bree. We'll be fine, I hear Robert say, dimly coming through Bree's mic. That's Dad out there, and we're here. It'll all be okay. Bree, your mic's on, I whisper into the closet standing by the entrance. I hear some moving around inside, and, with a click, the breathing in my ear stops. Another terrific thump sounds against the door as I settle back into position. The front door shakes even more. My breath quickens as I see it rock backwards with the next hit. There is a pattern of a shriek and then a slam. My hope that they would tire quickly is not coming to fruition. If they do manage to get the door down, at least they will have to funnel through one or two at a time. I pat the mags in my vest, comforting myself that they are there and available. Taking two out, I set them by my knee. I would have taped two together end to end for quicker reloads, but that makes it difficult to carry in the pouches. A slam comes against the door for about the hundredth time, and the jam by the latch splinters. Oh, fuck, I think, watching the jam itself beginning to give way. That's the last thing I wanted to see, and my thought quickly goes toward my kids and Lynn. I should never have come down. I quickly turn my radio to Vox. I may not be able to take the time to reach up and click the mic as my hands may be too busy. I want to stay in communication regardless of what happens. My adrenaline rate increases, but a deeper calm settles in at the same time. The jam gives way, but the door stops against the couch, and it doesn't open any farther. It's not even a door width open, but the latch is no longer secure. The screeches outside intensify as if the night runners know they are almost inside. The interval between bangs against the door increases. The jam where the hinges are screwed in begins to splinter as the latch did moments before. The trapped feeling intensifies. A part of my mind searches for an avenue of escape, but realizes that none exist. Very well, motherfuckers. Bring it, I whisper to myself getting myself in the frame of mind needed, stealing myself for the inevitable. Another solid thud and the top hinge gives way, with the sound of wood cracking and a screech of metal being torn. The door caves inward, the top falling across the couch at an angle. The night runner shrieks, no longer muted by a closed door, rise in volume as our little bit of sanctuary becomes open to the outside. I see movement through the small cracks the angled door leaves, though not enough to get a shot through. The door is picked up, twisted, and pulled outside. Now, we're fully exposed. They're in, I call, seeing the first night runners enter into the now open doorway. I rub my thumb over the selector switch to verify I'm on auto and put my dot on the first to enter as it scrambles over the couch still sitting in front of the door. I opt for the auto-selection in case any of my rounds miss or glance off. There's a chance they'll hit and slow up any night runners that are behind. The entryway outside is congested with night runners waiting to get in. Pulling the trigger lightly, my carbine pushes against my shoulder as I send three rounds streaking outward. The hallway flashes with pulses of light. The muted coughs resonate loudly in the enclosed hall. 
My three steel core bullets close with the target in a tight pattern, with speed and power, hitting the night runner full in the face. The force of the round striking destroys the bone structure and knocks the lower jaw loose before ricocheting inside its cranium and exiting, taking the entire back of its head off. A massive, chunky mist sprays out from behind as it collapses face forward onto the couch. The cream-colored couch absorbs the blood trickling from the night runner, turning red where the night runner's head comes to rest, making the couch look like a tissue after being dabbed on an open cut. Two night runners jostle at the door before entering and climb over their fallen cohort. More shove from behind, and the entire doorway is filled with pushing night runners. The multitude of screams outside tells me there are many more. The vast number is more than I anticipated, although I know I should quit anticipating anything with them. Worrying about ammo, I switch my M4 to semi. Running low has happened too many times now and once being too many. I center my dot on one coming over the body and couch and put just enough pressure on the trigger to break it. A flash in the hallway signals another bullet exiting the suppressor. The round speeds toward the night runner and hits it in its left cheek, entering the cavity of the mouth as if unobstructed. The back molars and side teeth splinter into tiny shards, leaving just the stumps and roots attached to the gums. The round angles upward slightly before slamming into the lower part of the skull and breaking apart, with the largest part of the bullet exiting just above the ear. The skin flaps open and splatters a coating of blood on the foyer wall. The night runner's head is slammed against the same wall with a solid thud, and it slumps backward, coming to rest on its back along the back of the couch. Only registering the hit in the back of my mind, I switch to the second night runner scrambling over the couch and discharge another projectile. The shot hits the clavicle and angles upward into its throat. Blood splashes outward in all directions as major arteries and veins are hit, sending the night runner falling forward, its head hitting the tiled entryway with a solid smack. It lies still, with its feet resting on the first night runner and blood quickly forms a large puddle on the floor. Night runners pour in behind the first three. I'm not going to be able to hold them back with mere single shots. I switch to auto again and hope that my rounds last longer than the night runners. The roar from the host is deafening as the sound waves concentrate down the narrow hallway. I begin placing bursts into the crowd that is pushing its way inside, no longer worrying about killing shots. Bodies are piling up on the couch and by the kitchen entry, but their entry is coming faster than I can put them down. Like an incoming tide, they are slowly gaining ground. I faintly register the sound of my spent cartridges hitting the wall next to me. Each time I reload, they gain even more ground. The empty mags are accumulating at my knee like the night runners piling up on the couch and floor beyond. How many of you fuckers are there? I say under my breath. Jack, are you okay? Lynn asks. I kind of forgot I had set my radio to Vox. Yeah, I think they're fucking breeding out here, I reply, not interrupting my fire or diverting my attention. The night runners gain ground to the hallway entry. Seriously, how many are there? I think, jamming another mag into the lower receiver. The time distortion, which comes on when it seemingly feels like it, is sorely missing here. I would so love for things to slow down, but they seem to be speeding up instead. I notice a couple of night runners race behind the front line and off into the living room to the right. Uh-oh. If they get into the bathroom and come out the door just a scant few feet in front of me, I'm done for. The mass enters the hallway and are met by the steel propelled from my carbine. I reach for another mag and slam it home, allowing them to gain a few additional feet. The stink of unwashed bodies and gunpowder fills the small apartment. The glow of the night runner's skin in my goggles and the shine from their night vision enhanced eyes is downright spooky. Even scarier is how many there are and how close they have gotten. A slam against the bathroom door just in front jars me. As if that were not bad enough, shattering glass behind me catches my immediate and direct attention. 
I stand and take a step back into the bedroom without altering my fire. I hear two bursts of fire come from the closet. Glancing to my side, I see a night runner that had somehow climbed onto the patio, pitch back through the hanging blinds. The blinds part as the night runner blows through them, and then they swing back together immediately as if wanting to keep the result a secret, making the night runner appear as if it dove into a pool and disappeared beneath the surface. The only proof that anything happened at all is the blind still swinging back and forth. Thanks, I say, focusing back on the hall. You're welcome, Dad, Robert says. No worries, Jack, Lynn responds. How's it going out there? It's getting a little sporty, I reply. The glance only took a moment. Looking back down the hall, the bathroom door bows and then explodes outward. I'm standing at the bedroom door and see multiple heads crowding the hallway but can't ascertain how many. Some is all my mind registers. Night runners emerge from the bathroom and into the hallway ahead of the line already there. Oh, hell no. You don't get to do that, I say out loud and squeeze a burst into the first one. It takes the burst in the side of its chest. Blood erupts from its mouth and nostrils as the rounds devastate its lungs and interior of its chest. It pitches forward into the opposite wall, face first, and falls to the floor, leaving a smear of blood trailing down. The night runner behind trips over the fallen one's legs as more rounds leave my barrel and rush toward it. The strobing flashes light up the hallway and the creatures showing the surprise and pain registering on the stumbling night runner's face as the fast-moving rounds connect. The power of the impacting bullets launches it backwards into the ones trying to get closer. My bolt locks to the rear. Oh, fuck. Not good. I don't have time to reload. I drop the M4 and step backwards, reaching for the M9 at my side. Bringing it up, I get one shot off before being body-slammed by a running night runner. The impact knocks me off my feet and I'm driven backwards. The pistol is knocked from my grasp by the strength of the collision. The surprise is complete, as my mind only records the fact that I'm on my way to the floor with a night runner on me. My mind screams, No! as the additional thought registers that my kids are now exposed to this danger and I am not up and able to help them. The great fear turns to anger as I hit the ground on my back. The impact with the floor nearly knocks the wind out of me. My left arm is between me and the night runner on top. I slide my forearm up to its throat to keep the snarling and growling face from me. Putrid breath launches an assault of its own against my senses. I push upward with all my might, but the night runner has a good position on me, and I can't get any leverage. The only thing I can do is attempt to keep its gnashing teeth from penetrating my skin. My right leg is free. I bend my knee and reach down to grab the knife strapped to the outside of my ankle. The leverage is tough to hold while reaching down, but I manage to pull the knife free of its sheath. I hear a small scream and several bursts from other M4s. The thought that my kids are in trouble angers me even further. I plunge the knife in under the ribs and twist. The writhing night runner on top of me howls as I withdraw the knife and plunge it in again. A spurt of blood comes out of its mouth that is only inches away from my face. It pushes down against my arm, growls once more, and then goes limp. Get the fuck off of me, I push the night runner to the side. Sitting up, I'm immediately slammed to the ground again. Fear, adrenaline, and anger course through me. Another night runner has slammed me onto my back and is on top with its head by my chest. My left arm is trapped between the night runner and myself. It claws at my neck and I feel the stinging pain of my skin being ripped on the left side. I feel the weight on top of me double as another night runner's face appears over the shoulder of the one immediately above me. I can't move and can barely breathe. My jaw clenches and I feel a surge of anger. Okay, you're seriously starting to piss me off, I yell and stab my knife into the closest one's neck. The top of my blade emerges from the other side of its neck, cutting through tendons and cartilage. Blood leaks out of its mouth and nose, dripping onto me. 
Its growling turns into a gargle, and I feel the warm blood gush over my hand and flow onto my chest. I remove the knife, and a jet of blood spurts twice before I feel the night runner become a dead weight. The other night runner is trying to get down to me, but isn't able with the dead one between us. I also don't have a very good angle on it. It reaches over its dead comrade, attempting to claw my face and neck. As it reaches its hand up toward me, I stab up and under its armpit. The howling shriek turns into a scream of pain as my knife penetrates that very tender place. The armpit is a source of many nerves, and the arteries of the arm run just under the surface of the skin. I twist the blade and feel jets of warm blood spray against my hand. I twist and push my knife blade again. The night runner arches up, howling, and struggles to get away from the point of my blade buried deep under its arm. Its yells of agony fade, and it collapses across me to the side. Get the fuck off me, I mumble, straining to push the night runners off me. Dad, are you okay? Robert asks. Yeah, I'm just fucking peachy, I answer, giving a final push. I finally manage to heave them to the side and scramble back to my feet. A few night runners lie on the floor in front of the closet entrance with one half in and one half out of the entryway. Two more night runners stand by the bedroom door. A glance behind them shows the hallway clear. Hold your fire, I say, as the two start for me, my roar meeting with theirs. The two night runners rush, one behind the other. I take a step forward and meet them, going to crouch just prior to contact. I rise forcefully and drive my shoulder into the front one's chest, halting its forward momentum. I grab the night runner by the neck, drive it backward into the one behind, and thrust my knife under its sternum. I feel the warm sensation of blood run down the haft and onto my hand once again, tightening my grip as the handle has become slippery. A turn of the blade, and I move the night runner to the side. I duck under the swiping reach of the second one behind. Coming up as its arm sweeps over my head, I drive my knife into its neck. I lower my head just prior to my blade penetrating to prevent splashes of blood coating the lenses of my goggles. I feel a slight resistance in my arm as my point meets the tender skin and drives inward. Blood splashes across my forehead. Putting my shoulder into the thrust, my knife plunges farther into the night runner's neck and comes to a stop against its spine. I withdraw the blade, step forward, putting my right leg behind its right ankle, and push with my shoulder. My push trips it and sends it to the floor where it hits with a thump flat on its back. It lies gargling for a moment and then is silent. I turn to the sound of the patio door blind stirring. Another night runner darts into the room. I'm blocking the closet door so Robert and Lynn can't fire at the new intruder. It stops a couple of feet inside, thrusts its head forward, and shrieks. The scream fills the smallish room to the point that the walls shake with its intensity. Rage and adrenaline still fill me with a heated glow, but there is a numbness and calm accompanying it as well. I feel like I'm wrapped in a warm void. I hold my arms out to the side with my knife dripping blood, thrust myself forward in a similar manner, and roar back at it. A startled look crosses its features as I step toward it. It turns and darts back through the blinds. I hear a sickening thud and crack issue mutely from outside, followed by a scream of pain. I check the hall and front doorway to find them empty of any further attempts to invade the apartment. Walking to the patio, I step through the shattered glass door and look down at the driveway to the rear. The night is silent. Below, the night runner that fled is crawling slowly across the pavement, having apparently leapt off the balcony and broken one or both of its legs on impact. I walk back in, grab my M4 off the floor where I dropped it, and put a fresh mag in. My last one. Flicking the release, the bolt drives home, chambering around. Returning outside and clearing the area, I put the sight on 4X and center the crosshairs on the night runner. I continue to stare at the creature slowly and painfully crawling across the dark pavement for a moment. 
The thought of leaving it to deal with the dawn coming a few hours away runs through my mind. The fear turned to anger is rapidly disappearing as the danger recedes, and I feel a little sorry for the night runner below me. Regardless of the situation prior, no person, animal, or other deserves to be in pain or suffer needlessly. With the crosshair centered, I send a fast-moving projectile into its head, bringing its crawling and agony to a sudden halt. Looking out the narrow view of the bed and patio blinds, Robert drops to one knee in the center of the group, his back against the wall of the walk-in closet. Clothing hangs down to either side of him, his heart thumps solidly as the thuds echo inside the apartment from Night Runner slamming into the front door. A particularly loud bang shakes the walls around him, and he hears Bree gasp beside him. It's okay, Bree. We'll be fine. That's Dad out there, and we're here. It'll all be okay, he reassures her. His dad whispers at the door that Bree's mic is on. In his peripheral, he sees Bree scramble, trying to find the right switch, and notices her look up at him. He reaches over and moves the switch on her mic cord. The breathing in his ears, that he assumed was his dad's, falls silent. Several more slams resonate. Very well, motherfuckers. Bring it, he hears his dad whisper through his earpiece. His heart rate quickens, knowing his dad and his idioms. Those words mean something is about to happen, and his dad is stealing himself for it. He looks at Lynn kneeling beside him in the same manner with her M4 pointed outward. She turns to him and nods. He feels confident, yet scared at the same time. He knows he'll react okay, but will it be enough? He's glad he gave his dad that hug before leaving the bathroom. For some reason, it makes him feel better knowing that he did. It seemed the right thing to do. He almost wants the action to start so he can get rid of this feeling inside and just react like the previous times. The nervousness is close to unbearable. A tremendous crash blasts through the closet. They're in, his dad calls out. Light flashes across the open doorway, followed a split second later by muted gunshots. This is quickly followed by more. The first bursts of fire are trailed by single shots. Robert tightens his grip and slides his finger into the trigger guard. His thumb rubs along the selector switch to affirm that it's set to auto. If they get in this far, Semi isn't going to cut it, he thinks, keeping his focus on the doorway and far blinds. The flashes of light and sounds are near continuous, except for pauses where he assumes his dad is reloading. The mixture of shrieks and screams of pain make it difficult to hear anything else. How many of you fuckers are there? Robert hears his dad say. Jack, are you okay? Lynn asks. Yeah, I think they're fucking breeding out here, his dad replies. Robert chuckles, knowing things are okay if his dad is keeping his humor. While concentrating on the things within his view, he's reminded of those times where he and his dad laughed until their eyes bled tears. They have an identical sense of humor, perhaps stemming from the countless hours they spent together, and they see things in life in the same way. Sadness folds over him as he remembers those times now with his dad out there fighting for his and their lives. The sound of glass breaking rides over the howls and shrieks from inside the apartment, bringing Robert's entire focus back to the moment. The blinds part, and a night runner enters the bedroom. He pulls the trigger with his dot centered on its chest. Multiple strobes flash off the walls of the tight closet as both his and Lynn's carbines fire at the same time. The night runner is launched off its feet and back through the blinds from the multiple, forceful strikes on its body. Robert sees his dad step back into his range of vision, but is only able to see his back. Thanks, his dad says. You're welcome, dad, Robert says. No worries, Jack, Lynn responds. How's it going out there? It's getting a little sporty, he replies. Robert knows what getting a little sporty means to his dad. It's a little more than the normal getting a little sporty. There was a time when he and his dad rode their mountain bikes up this long, steep ridge to the top of a mountain on the 4th of July to watch the area fireworks. They sat on a mountaintop 
tired and exhausted from the ride, while drinking Dr. Peppers and watching the light shows in the region below. The sun had set on everyone else, but the glow of the sunset still shone on them. After a while, darkness set in firmly, and the fireworks ended. It was pitch black out, and they only had small flashlights. Yeah, that one wasn't thought all the way through. Which illuminated the ground in front for only about five feet at best. The brakes only worked marginally on the exciting ride back down the steep slope. It was hard to keep the bikes under control as they careened off rocks, and the edge of the cliff came close several times. When they finally reached the bottom, his dad said the same thing. Well, that was a little sporty. Truth be told, Robert had thought it rather fun and exciting. The one other time he remembered his dad using that phrase was the time they kayaked across a large, open body of water. The wind kicked up against an incoming tide, and they paddled across with waves breaking over their head. Oh, hell no, you don't get to do that, Robert hears his dad say over the radio. His grip tightens on the hand grip of his M4. The reality of the moment sinks in, and he feels an intense fear, but with an underlying calm. He feels a certain confidence having his dad and Lynn with him. Moments later, he sees his dad being catapulted in the air past the opening with a night runner on top of him, the two of them disappearing off to the right. No, Dad! Bree screams, rising to her feet. Stay here, Bree, Robert says, holding his arm out in front of her. Holy shit, Brian says in a hushed voice. Shut the fuck up, Robert says with adrenaline coursing through him. His response surprises him as much as the others around him. That came out of him from the fear he feels seeing his dad thrown like that, from the dire nature of their situation, and from his disgust for the guy next to him for getting them into this. Other night runners follow in the path his dad and the night runner took. He and Lynn fire at the ones materializing in front of the door. Their rounds hit the night runners in the head, chest, and arms, knocking them to the side, against and onto the bed. They are attempting to keep the swarming creatures away from his dad. A night runner quickly appears in the doorway, completely blocking the view outside. Kelly screams. Robert raises his carbine and pulls the trigger, sending speeding projectiles toward the night runner, threatening them. His rounds close the distance quickly and hit in rapid succession on its chest. The upward angle of the shots lift the night runner off the ground with its legs shooting forward and its head backwards. It falls to the ground, half in, half out of the doorway. Nice job, Lynn says, as they resume shooting at the passing night runners. Get the fuck off of me, Robert hears his dad say over the radio. The night runners coming by the door are thinning out to an extent, becoming ones and twos rather than the horde that was there moments before. Okay, you're seriously starting to piss me off, he hears his dad yell. No further night runners come by the opening, but he hears others rustling in the direction of the hallway. The decibel level has dropped substantially. The sounds from the hallway combine with the sounds of struggle coming from his dad's direction. Get the fuck off of me, he hears his dad mumble on the radio. Dad, are you okay? Robert asks. Yeah, just fucking peachy, his dad answers. With that answer, he knows that his dad is indeed doing okay. A little pissed, but okay. Hold your fire, his dad says, stepping into view of the open doorway, looking a little disheveled. Screeches once again fill the hallway. He sees his dad lean forward and yell back. He watches as his dad steps forward, crouches down, and drives his shoulder upward into a charging night runner. He then grabs its neck, forces it into another night runner behind, and brings his hand upward, plunging his knife into its belly. Ew, Jessica says softly. All eyes in the closet are mesmerized by the scene unfolding before them. Robert watches his dad toss the night runner to the side and duck under the swing of the second night runner, only to come up quickly, thrust his knife into its neck. Even through his goggles, he sees the blood squirt and push the night runner to the ground. The creature disappears from view and he hears a gurgling sound for a moment, and then all is silent. Fuck me.
Brian says, barely under his breath. The soft swish and tick of the blinds stirring by the patio door reaches Robert's ears at the same time that he catches a hint of movement on the other side of his dad. A shriek fills the room once more and is answered by his dad giving an equally loud scream. His dad takes a step, and Robert sees movement as the night runner apparently runs back through the blinds, his dad seemingly chasing it off. Exhaustion sweeps through me as I re-enter the apartment. I check the hallway again and drop to my knee to retrieve my handgun. Energy seeps from me, and I remain on the floor a touch longer in front of the closet. I take several deep breaths to clear my mind and catch my breath. The silence has returned to the dark apartment and makes my breathing seem inordinately loud. With my head hanging down, I feel a hand on my shoulder. Looking up, I see Lynn looking down at me with a worried smile. Robert walks out of the closet, and I give him a tired nod of thanks and job well done. Are you okay? Lynn asks quietly. Yeah, I think so. I need all of the bottles of water we have, I reply, feeling a sting from the scratch on my neck, both from the recentness of the injury and from sweat running into it. Robert, cover the front door. Bree, I need you to cover the patio door. Both of you call immediately if you see or hear anything. I realize my radio is still on the voice activate mode and switch it to the push to talk mode. Robert looks down the hall at the numerous bodies heaped in it and beyond. Holy shit, he exclaims quietly. Yeah, holy shit is right, I reply. Robert kneels in the hallway where I was previously, while Lynn steps into the bathroom to retrieve the water. With Bree standing by the bed at my side, I reach into a pouch on my vest and retrieve a batch of antibiotics we divided up seemingly years ago. Lynn returns with the water and sees me taking the pills. Jack? Lynn says in a questioning and worried voice. I think I got scratched, I reply in answer to her questioning concern. Oh, fuck, Jack, where? She answers in a whisper. On my neck. I think it was a clawing scratch and not a bite, though, I answer, feeling my neck for the scratch to determine the depth and extent of the damage. Come on, into the bathroom, she says. Okay, I'll be there in a second. I walk past Robert and down the hall. The enclosed space of the hallway stinks of torn bodies, the iron smell of blood and gunpowder mixing together. I have to step over the bodies filling the hallway floor. I nudge each body, testing for any life remaining within them. Several night runners respond to the toe of my boot prodding them, and I finish them off with a round to the head. The entryway to the kitchen is piled waist-high in places where the night runners pushed into the apartment and were met by steel. I go through almost an entire mag by the time I put the last of the night runners to rest. Climbing over the mounds of bodies is difficult as they shift and slide. My boots sometimes sink between them like stepping into soft spots in a muddy swamp. I exit the mounds by the kitchen and step into the living room, alert for any hiding night runners. A sweep through the open living room and far bedroom reveals that none remain within the confines of the apartment. We're clear. For now. I backtrack to the bathroom entrance, letting Robert know I'm re-entering the hall. It would totally suck to forget something as simple as that and be shot after all the night has held to this point. Communication is one of the most important keys to survival with a group. Meeting Lynn at the bathroom entrance, we step over the broken door and enter. Lynn props the door against the entrance as best as possible to seal it against any light leaking out, and lights the candles. I remove my NVGs, prop my gun, and lean against the counter with both arms. The candlelight reflects off the mirror and reveals a different person staring back. I don't recognize myself. Tired, bloodshot eyes look back. As I look at my reflection in the mirror, it seems like I'm watching myself through a third person. I observe the blood on my forehead and neck. The area around my eyes is clear where my goggles were, making me look like a reverse raccoon. 
This seriously can't possibly continue in this manner, I think, as Lynn takes one of the towels from the floor and pours water over my face and neck. The water runs off my head and into the sink, turning the basin into a pink, swirling mix of water and blood. I feel a sting from the scratch. She dabs my face and neck with the towel, clearing the blood away. Watching her tenderly administering to me, my heart is flooded with warmth. This was not the homecoming I imagined or anticipated. With the blood cleared, I see the scratch clearly. Not normally concerned with such a minor wound, the fact that it was from the night runners and that some of their saliva may have come into contact with it increases the worry factor. I need to be around for my kids and Lynn. The scratch itself runs from the middle of my neck down to my collarbone. In the yellow light of the candles, I see the skin around has already turned a bright red. Lynn rummages through drawers in a bathroom cabinet until she finds some gauze pads and tape. Here, crush one of these up and sprinkle it on, I say, pulling another antibiotic pill out before Lynn applies the dressing. She takes out her knife and crushes the pill on the counter, sprinkles it on the scratch, and covers it with the gauze and tape. Watching her with the tenderness and worry brings out another feeling within. The post-adrenaline, close call, and watching her, well, it brings about a certain desire. The problem is that we aren't out of the danger zone yet, and won't be until the sun comes up, let alone the fact that there are others close by. Uh. She puts the last of the tape in place and looks up at me through the mirror. Jack, I know that look, she says quietly with a small smile. Mm-hmm, I reply, just as quietly, with a tired yet mischievous smile. We can't hear, she says, looking to the broken doors propped up against the bathroom doorway. I think you're looking the wrong way, I say, looking to the other door leading into the far bedroom. She looks longingly at the opposite door and then shakes her head. Jack, you have no idea how much I want to. But we can't, she says with a sigh. I mimic her sigh. I know, but you're in trouble when the sun rises. Deal, she says with a larger smile. Come on, sunrise, I say playfully and rinse my knife off in the sink. Yeah, no shit, she says with another sigh. Lynn looks at the white gauze and tape at my neck. I think it'll be okay. It only burns a little, I say, answering her worried gaze. I give Lynn a kiss, which threatens to develop further, before we head back to the room after extinguishing the candles and donning our NVGs. Seeing us enter the hall, Robert lowers his muzzle. Passing by my kneeling son, I pat him on the shoulder. Are you doing okay, Dad? He asks, looking up through his goggles. Yeah, thanks. How are you doing? I ask in return. I'm tired, but okay. Good. Returning to the bedroom, Lynn and I sit next to where Bree is kneeling with her M4 aimed across the bed. I ruffle her hair. How you doing, hon? I'm okay, Dad. She looks up. I smile at her. A flood of warmth and love for both of my kids flows through me. I'm so proud of them. But there's also an underlying fear for them given our situation. I wish I could just wake up and we could go back to the world we knew before. Worrying about which fireworks show we were going to go see rather than which building is going to harbor night runners. When the next assault will occur or how we're going to stay supplied. We can't continue like this, I tell Lynn. We can't keep facing massive assaults like this. We've been lucky so far, and sometimes less than lucky, I add, remembering the loss of the entire Delta team. Jack, we won't have to worry about that so much once we get the sanctuary built and secured, Lynn responds. Uh, we'll still have to go into buildings for supplies until we become self-sufficient. I mean, they've been in mass in almost every single building lately, I say. 
Is it safe to come out? Kelly asks from the closet with a whisper. Yeah, we're okay for the moment, I answer. Brian, Kelly, and Jessica emerge from the closet and stand by the entrance. Brian takes a step forward. Hey, I just wanted to say sorry and thanks, man, he says in a whisper. Oh, sure. Now he whispers, I think. You know, I think it's best that you not speak to me right now. You put my loved ones at risk, and I'm not too keen with that, I reply. He steps back to the closet entrance and plops down against the wall. Kelly squats next to him, and they begin whispering in the dark. Then don't go into buildings, Lynn says, picking up our conversation. Maybe it's you. Very funny, I say. Seriously, though, Jack, what choice do we have? Well, I know we can't continue like this, with these kinds of encounters. We're being reactionary. It's going to bite us in the ass harder one of these times, I answer. What are you thinking? Lynn asks. I'm thinking we have two choices. Well, three, but the third isn't an option. The first is to build our haven, walls and all, and then hunker down and let both sides live in our own environments. Let them have the night and we'll have the day. And the second? She asks, taking in what I said and nodding. Exterminate them all within our area. That's the riskier solution in the short term, but maybe it's worth it. I'm not sure we have the manpower to do that, though. So which one are you thinking about? I'm not sure yet. I'm just curious. What was the third option? She asks, tilting her head to the side. Give up, I respond. You're right. That's not an option, she says, knowing I wasn't being serious. A muffled cough from Robert's M4 interrupts our conversation and startles all of us. Jessica lets out a small squeal. Lynn and I immediately jump off the bed, go to a kneeling position facing the front door, and shoulder our weapons. Nothing is moving at the entrance. It remains silent outside. Robert is in the line of fire, so Lynn and I keep our muzzles lowered, but ready to move up and engage if something enters the open doorway to our front. Not wanting to risk the additional noise of talking halfway across the bedroom, I move up to his side, leaving Lynn in place to help Bree cover the back door. I'm anticipating a round two of our previous bout, but the lack of shrieks doesn't indicate one. Kneeling by Robert, I ask, What's up? He doesn't move his eyes or carbine from the front door as he answers. One just poked its head around the side of the door. Well, did you get him? I ask, watching and listening for additional movement. I think so, he answers. I contemplate going up to the door to check, not only to see that the one night runner is down, but to see if others remain outside. However, I don't want to stir up trouble if there are others out there. If they're content to stay outside and leave us in peace, I am perfectly content to stay in here and let them do that. I listen for any sounds or calls, both near and far. The night is as quiet and as void as deep space. I pat him on the shoulder again. Nicely done, I whisper into Robert's ear. Thanks. He whispers back. Are you okay here for a bit longer? I ask. Yeah, I'm fine. I walk back into the bedroom past Brian, Kelly, and Jessica. Both Kelly and Jessica whisper their thanks for coming down, to which I tell them no worries. I can tell Brian wants to say something along the same lines, but wisely keeps quiet. Okay, everyone, we need to stay quiet. We're not through this yet, and there are bound to be more. I think we'll be okay in here as long as we keep absolutely quiet. I think we'll be okay in here as long as we keep absolutely silent, I say, plopping back onto the bed where I begin to silently load my empty mags. The apartment chills with the night air circulating through the open doors. I worry about our scent carrying outside. However, the rest of the night passes by without incident, other than the scratch on my neck continuing to burn. 
We take turns resting and covering the entrances. I take several more antibiotics, with Lynn undoing the tape and sprinkling more directly on the wound. The outside lightens with the coming dawn, signaling a return to the safety of the day. We have survived another night. Another encounter. With the dawning of a new day, we relax. We toss our goggles in the Humvee, and I gather Robert, Lynn, and Brian. We begin removing the bodies from the interior. I wouldn't worry about clearing the apartment, but it's impossible to get out without stepping over and on them. I want to at least clear a route. We toss them over the front balcony railing into the entryway of the apartments below. Brian heaves a few times as he and Lynn cart several night runners that have been ripped open by rounds hitting them and tumbling, creating a mess. Blood and fleshy bits of night runners, some of the flesh still having hair attached, covers the tiled floor as we make our way down to the last layer of bodies. We slip a few times on the slick floor carrying the bodies out. The entryway below fills with corpses as we toss body after body over the railing. I look up at the shattered door of the apartment above us as Robert and I throw the last body over. As the sun peeks over the apartment building across from us, I think about going up to investigate, but decide there's really nothing to be gained. With a sigh, I head back inside with Robert. Pack up anything you want to bring, but try and keep it to the essentials, I tell Brian, Kelly, and Jessica. Make sure you keep them on track if you don't mind, I ask Lynn. I'm going outside for a breath of fresh air. Will do, she responds. I head outside after I wash up and sit on a curb behind the Humvee, away from the bodies and the smell. The sun is shedding its light over the buildings on the parking lot. I sit on the hard concrete feeling exhausted, with my M4 resting between my legs and the sour scent of my own body odor assaulting my nose, I ponder the previous night. I feel like I unnecessarily put my loved ones at risk yet again. I feel like I'm making mistake after mistake, and no, I can't afford to keep doing that. The mistakes I feel I made were bringing my kids down, even though I thought I needed them to bring a 130 back. I don't know if that was from an earnest need or just desire to have a plane nearby. There was also a selfish part of me that wanted them close. But if that were indeed true, I would have brought Nick, too. I relived the night, going over where my mistakes were and where I could have done better or done things differently. The only thing I come up with is that I should have been more forceful quieting Brian. Not shooting him, as uh, that would have made noise, and would have been perhaps too extreme. However, his being unconscious would have kept him quiet. I resolve not to let anyone else put my loved ones in harm's way in that manner again, or in any manner for that matter. Robert walks out and joins me, sitting by my side. That guy is a real jerk, he says. Yeah, I should have done something about it before it got to the point it did. There was nothing you could have done. I could have sent him to dreamland. Robert chuckles. Yeah, there's always that option. Do I smell as bad as you? I ask, smiling. Worse, he replies with an answering smile. You did a great job in there. Thanks for watching my back. Now, that was some scary shit, he says. I notice a change in him. He's no longer shaking or referring to his being terrified, but more relating to the event rather than himself. His confidence is increasing. Hey, you're not shitting with that. I thought we were done for a couple of times. Thanks again for watching my back. Yeah, I did too. And no worries, he says, looking at the ground. Our silence continues for a few moments as we each relive portions of our experience. Lynn walks out a short time later and joins us. It was all I could do to keep from laughing when you told that guy off, she says to Robert. What? Oh, yeah, that, he says, with a shy smile forming on his face once again. Uh, what's that about? I ask. He told that guy Brian to shut the fuck up in the middle of our firefight 
she answers. <laughs> what happened? I ask. Well, it was when you decided to take flying lessons with a night runner on top of you. You went sailing past the door and Brian said, holy shit, or something like that. Robert looks at him and tells him to shut the fuck up. I almost lost it. If I wasn't so worried about you and what was going on, I would have busted a gut. Really? You did that? I ask Robert. Yeah, kinda. I guess so, he answers. Too funny, I say as we all chuckle. Brian is terrified that you're going to shoot him, Lynn says after our chuckles subside. I'm still on the fence about that one, I say. I'm going to go check on Bree, Robert says after a bit. Okay, we need to go pretty soon, I say as he gets up and heads inside. I look over at Lynn and smile. Take a walk with me, I ask once Robert gets out of earshot. Mm-hmm. She returns my smile. Carrying our weapons casually, but still alert, we stroll down the lot. We find a place behind a parked van out of sight. As much as I hate to say this, Jack, we'll have to make this quick. I know, I say. Being quick will be no problem at all. We're going to have to find some privacy for a much longer time, I say, a short time later, as we pick up our M4s. Yes, we are. She replies. We walk back to the apartment complex, hand in hand. Brian, Kelly, and Jessica finish packing their bags. It looks like they packed the entire apartment. This is packing the essentials, I ask, eyeing the vast amount of baggage. Not that I would have done much different, I guess. Kelly merely shrugs a response as we throw the gear in the back of the Humvee. The interior is packed as we climb in. Robert climbs behind the steering wheel again, and we pull out of the apartments with the sun climbing into another warm, clear day. The drive to the airport is conducted mostly in silence, with our only real conversation being which road and exit to take. We arrive at the open gates of the Air Force National Guard base and drive to the flight line. F-15 sit in rows in the center of the tarmac, with others parked in large, open hangars. Off to the side, on the edge of the ramp, two C-130s sit side by side. We pull up behind them and exit. Opening the crew door of one, I check that the inside is clear. The interior has a musty aroma mixed with the smell of oil, jet fuel, and the ground-in odors of years of use. I walk into the cockpit and turn on the battery. The gyros begin spooling up, and the total fuel gauge reads about three-quarters full— there aren't any external fuel tanks installed on this one, so their tanks read empty. The fighter squadrons have the 130s to carry their gear for their deployments and exercises. Satisfied that all is in order and this one appears in good shape, I walk to the rear and drop the ramp. Do you want us to carry the gear inside? Robert asks, after I relate that it seems to be in working order. No, we'll just drive the Humvee in and tie it down, I answer. We edge the vehicle in and secure it to the cargo floor. This one should be almost identical to the other one, I say to Bree and Robert as we take our familiar seats. Okay, Dad, Bree responds, adjusting her straps. Lynn straps in the nav seat while the others find seats on the bunk adjacent to the rear bulkhead. I find a checklist sitting on the throttle quadrant and we proceed through it in a familiar fashion. Brian, Kelly, and Jessica look decidedly anxious as they watch Bree handle the fuel and electrical systems. They also glance nervously to Robert sitting in the co-pilot seat as we run through the startup procedures like old hands. The engines come to life, the throaty roar saturating the cockpit. We don't have helmets, so the sound fills our ears in full force. We'll have to shout to one another as we don't have mics or headsets. We taxi out and take off under the noon sun, staying low and following I-5 northbound. As we turn to the north, leaving the dead city behind us, my thoughts go out to those who remained at Cabela's and wonder how they're doing. An Angel Falls Nicole stands in the parking lot and watches her dad, Robert, Lynn, and Bree 
leave the parking lot and disappear over the hill. She wanted to go with them, but understands why her dad wanted her to stay. With a sigh, she turns to see soldiers begin carting the bodies out of the outdoor store and lay them in a back corner of the lot. There is activity at the front entry as bannermen and other soldiers begin to install the security doors they fetched from the shop. The sun is warm on her shoulders, and she fidgets in the dark fatigues, trying to become accustomed to the fit and style. Feeling a little useless, she strolls over to the transport trucks with her grandmother and Michelle to help unload supplies. The remainder of the day passes quickly, with the rest of the night runner bodies being hauled out and, with a liberal dose of diesel fuel, burned. The large amount of corpses creates a vast funeral pyre. The doors get installed and tested, along with steel shutters placed on the windows facing the entrance. In addition, the supplies are offloaded into the store. With the sun dropping below the trees to the west, everyone gathers inside to eat, mostly in silence, and settle in for the evening. I think we'll leave the generator going for the night so we can have our first night with lights, Dreskel states, addressing the tired group. We'll need to gather some of the blankets in the store and cover the openings so the light doesn't show through. The security doors, one on the inside and outside of each set of entryway doors, are rolled down and locked, just as the last of the sun's light vanishes and dusk sets in. The locking of the doors effectively shuts away the outside from the hopefully safe haven inside. Blankets are taped to the walls against the interior security doors to prevent any light leaking out. Nicole listens as Dreskel assigns watch schedules. Cots and sleeping bags for everyone to sleep on are pulled from shelves, out of boxes, and from storage areas. Nick is setting up her cot and bag next to Michelle and her grandmother on the second floor when a clanging, crashing sound echoes throughout the interior. Nick startles and jerks her head toward the front entrance where the noise originated. Her heart leaps and begins pounding. Red team, cover the side door. Alpha and Bravo to the first floor and cover the entrance. All other teams position along the balcony. Green team, on me, will be in reserve, Dreskel shouts. A flurry of activity and noise follows Dreskel's orders, as soldiers gather their weapons and gear and make for their assigned positions, clicks of bolts being drawn back and released, vests being donned and zipped, radios tested, and shouts establishing orders from the team leaders follow. A semblance of order ensues, and the team takes their positions as the slams against the outer security doors become increasingly numerous and much louder, Nicole observes the activities with interest from her position adjacent to a wall with a steel gray door inset into it. Her head turns from the team settling in and watches Dreskel take a position with Green Team nearby. Time passes differently for each of the survivors, some fearful, others restless, and a few even annoyed at the intrusion on their evening. Nicole feels all of them. She's fearful that the night runners will find a way in, yet confident that the soldiers around her will take care of them and keep everyone safe. She knows what they have been through since the world came apart, and they have come through it okay every time. Her dad doing what he did and leading this group came as a big surprise. She had no idea her dad was capable of the things he did. She also feels restless not being able to do anything to help. She glances at the M4 she grabbed that now lies across her lap, seeking assurance from it, but none is given by the black plastic and metal. Her restlessness and the fact that the night runners haven't immediately broken in and assaulted them allow her mind to wander. She thinks over the days since the world changed, the exhilarations, fears, exhaustion, and closeness that the days have brought. How odd it is to be sitting in this particular place and time with all that has happened. It feels like a long, drawn-out dream, she thinks, looking around, her mind partially shutting out the noise of the night runners outside. She has always been close to her brother, sister, and dad, but the events they have been through have drawn them even closer. She feels bonded to them like no other time and feels an empty feeling without them around. 
watching Robert learn and become more self-confident and trying to impress Michelle, Bree watching everything and missing nothing, even though she keeps that to herself, her dad trying to hold everything together and yet thinking he keeps making mistake after mistake. They have come through some pretty scary ordeals and have survived, she thinks, observing the soldiers around her. She feels a touch of sorrow for them, with their being thrust into this situation without asking for it, that they have loved ones about which they know nothing, and probably are imagining the worst. And Nicole wonders how they're able to get through each and every day with that kind of turmoil and stress. They must think about it, but they don't show it that she has seen. Maybe it's the almost constant combat and being busy surviving since that hasn't allowed them to dwell on it. She turns her thoughts momentarily to her mom. A terrible loneliness and sadness fills her. She hopes that wasn't her mom in the house, and that she's alive and well somewhere, sending a prayer that they will meet up again once they become safe. Her prayer also includes that her mom will become a part of their haven, the sadness and loneliness comes from thinking of her mom out in the night, alone and scared. A lone tear slowly trickles down her cheek, and she shakes her head, clearing her thoughts. The stars twinkle in the nighttime sky as a night runner stands in the parking lot, watching other packs attack the doors of the building to his front. The smell of burning flesh rises from a glowing pile behind him. The pavement beneath his feet feels coarse and rough, but not painful. It is quickly forgotten as he continues to observe the packs trying to gain entry into the structure where food resides, their shrieks filling the night air. The smell of the food is faint, yet distinct. The dashes of the individual members end with a dull, metallic clang that rises over the area. Trotting over to the side, he sees the same activity with a door on the side of the structure. He has not joined any of the packs as of yet, but may have to soon. His stomach feels empty, as he didn't find any sustenance the night prior. It is becoming scarcer in this area, and he knows, in his own way of thinking, that he'll have to move to another soon, since this one appears to be hunted out. The sheer number of other packs around him trying to get to the food is testament to that. In nights past, only a few of the closest packs would respond to the calls of food found. Now, an increasing number respond, many arriving after there are only bones left, yet they gnaw in them trying to get every last scrap. He jogs around the building, away from the others, looking for another way in, with him not being in a pack, he'll be far down the pecking order for food if they do get in. He knows, in an animalistic way, that the only way he'll eat tonight is if he's one of the first inside. He rounds a corner, and with the continuous howls and clangs still filling the night, he gazes upward. Once, several nights ago, he ate well by climbing on top of one of the two-legged lairs and coming through the top. His gaze focuses on a steel pipe that runs the height of the building to the roof above. Trotting over to the pipe, he gives it a good shake and is satisfied that it's strong enough to hold him. He glances around furtively, hoping others haven't noticed. If they do, and realize it may be another way in, he'll be quickly tossed aside and will have to search elsewhere to eat. Realizing that the others are intent upon the doors, he latches onto the pipe and pulls himself up. Putting his bare feet against the cool wall, he begins to scale it. The pipe groans in one place, but holds firm as he climbs steadily and swiftly upward. Reaching the top of the pipe, he reaches his hand to the lip of the roof, quickly placing his other hand beside it. Scrabbling his feet against the wall, he pulls himself up and over the top. He peers over the edge to see if any of the others below have observed his actions. Noticing he made it free and clear, he pulls his head back and looks over the flat roof. Everything shows in shades of gray. Square and rectangular items are set on the roof with pipes leading various places. A large rectangular structure attracts his attention, and he jogs over to it, 
leaping over pipes and other small projections rising from the roof. Reaching it, he sniffs and detects the odor of food. Very faint, but there nonetheless. He walks around the small structure that stands only a little taller than him and locates an entry portal. He pulls on the handle, knowing from previous almost accidental experiences that the portals will sometimes open in that manner. The portal swings open in his grasp, and he steps inside. The smell of food grows stronger, and his belly responds, gurgling with anticipation. The portal opens to a stairwell leading down. The door swings shut behind him, casting the enclosed space in gloom. He sees well enough, but it's not as bright as being outside under the small points of light in the sky. He's eager, as he'll be the first to food and can get his share. That is, if the others haven't gained entry yet. He doesn't hear the sounds of feeding, so he believes he'll be the first in. It will take the others time to scale the structure, if they even find it, so he'll be able to eat in peace. He rushes down the stairs and comes to another portal opening. He pushes on this one, but it doesn't budge. Pushing on the door, it opens into brightness. He shrinks back into the darkness, expecting the excruciating pain that comes from his one-time experience with the bright light of the day. But none comes. He's puzzled for a moment, but then his eagerness and hunger drive him forward. The smell of food comes strongly, and he knows that feeding is only moments away. He rushes through the door and into the light. Spying a food nearby, he shrieks and leaps into the air, diving for his first meal in two nights. Dreskel kneels on the hard floor, observing the teams in position and listening to the repeated bangs against the security doors. He's watching for any sign that the night runners are about to gain entry, analyzing whether he has put the teams in the most optimal positions to repel any invaders. The pounding outside has gone on for some time, and it is a true test of the doors that they haven't been able to get inside. He wonders just how many are out there. From the repeated and continual sounds against both entryways, he imagines there are quite a few. He's sure they've covered any light leaking out, and they have been quiet so he wonders how they found them in the first place. He hears a shriek behind him and is slammed to the ground. Nicole sits on her cot, listening along with everyone else to the assault on the doors and their senses. She wonders how long the night runners will keep at it, and if this will be a nightly occurrence. If that's the case, we won't be able to get any sleep she thinks tiredly, watching the restless fidgeting of the soldiers and others around her. A movement in her peripheral catches her attention. She turns to see the steel door next to her open. Her heart leaps as the floodgates of fear and adrenaline open. She's confused as to why an inside door would be opening. Without anyone entering, it begins to swing closed, confusing her even more. She's about to mention the door when a night runner emerges quickly from the opening and launches at Dreskel. The night runner screams and hits Dreskel from behind, the impact slamming him to the ground with the night runner on top. No! Nicole screams and rises to her feet. Without knowing what she's doing, other than someone is in trouble, she throws herself across the intervening space between her and the night runner on Dreskel. She crashes into the side of the creature, knocking it off Dreskel, only to find herself on her back with the night runner on top. She swings her arms wildly and thrashes in an attempt to shake the weight off and to prevent it from biting her. She feels a searing pain on her shoulder and lets out a scream. Her vision blurs, and everything goes dark. Dreskel hits the ground hard, instantly knowing what hit him as his mind registers the shriek just prior to impact. He hears another scream of, No! and feels the weight lifted from his back. Scrambling to his knees, he sees a night runner on Nicole. She's flailing and writhing. The creature bends over her and Nicole lets out a scream of pain and goes limp. He brings his M4 to bear and hears a shot ring out behind him. 
a hole appears just above the night runner's ear, which sprays a small amount of blood outward. The night runner is thrown to the side and comes to rest alongside Nicole. Dreskel turns to see Jack's mom standing behind his shoulder, holding a revolver with a small curl of smoke wafting out of the short barrel. He looks from the revolver up to her face, expressing a combined fear and determination. Turning back to Nicole, he is quickly at her side. He first checks to make sure the night runner is dead, and then searches for a pulse with Nicole. It's weak, but existent, along with a chunk of flesh torn from where her shoulder meets her neck. The wound is leaking blood onto the carpeting below. He tears his vest, fatigue top, and T-shirt off as Jack's mom kneels down by Nicole's head. Folding his T-shirt, he presses it against the injury. Here, press this on here firmly, he says to Jack's mom, whose eyes are wide with fear and worry. Greg, you're in charge. We got a situation up here. Dreskel radios before rummaging through his vest to find some antibiotics. Nicole moans as he pulls them out. It's okay, sweetie, Jack's mom says in a soothing voice. Dreskel looks up to see her holding the compress of his shirt firmly with one hand and stroking Nicole's hair and face gently with the other. He pulls out his knife and crushes several of the tablets. Jordan, get a bottle of water, Dreskel says over his shoulder. He kneels over Nicole and eases the compress off her shoulder. Nicole's moaning grows more frequent and stronger as he sprinkles the crushed antibiotics on her wounds. He replaces his shirt over the injury, and Jack's mom holds it firmly once again. She's going to have to take these, he says, holding several more antibiotic tablets in his hand. Nick, hun, wake up, dear, Jack's mom says soothingly in Nick's ear. Nicole's eyes flutter open after the third attempt to wake her. Dreskel crushes the remaining tablets and takes the water bottle Jordan is patiently holding. Nick, you need to take this. Do you think you can? I think so, Nick answers weakly. Dreskel pours the powder in her mouth and gently holds the water bottle up for her to drink. I'm so cold, Nick comments. Okay, we're going to move you over to a cot, Dreskel says. He gently lifts Nicole and carries her to the closest cot, laying her down and covering her with one of the sleeping bags. Jordan, go find some first aid supplies and gather the rest of Green's antibiotics. And seal that door, he says, rising amidst the continued metallic clangs permeating the interior. Jordan returns a short time later with the requested supplies. Dreskel tells Jack's mom that Nicole will have to take the antibiotics every hour for the next few hours, and then they'll determine what quantity is needed. Don't worry, Nicole. We'll take care of you and you'll be okay, he says, putting his hand on Nick's head, to which she smiles. And Nicole, he adds, thanks. You saved my life. Wanting to fly back at low level, we level off at 500 feet. It's not a far flight back, so there's no sense in climbing higher to conserve fuel. Plus, there's an opportunity to teach some low-level flying to Robert. Not that he'll probably ever need it, but you never know, and the opportunity exists, so what the hell. It's yours, I say, handing the aircraft over to Robert. Just use I-5 as your reference and fly along it. I look back to see the incredulous looks from Kelly, Brian, and Jessica as they watch Bree handle the fuel and electrical systems while Robert flies without a hitch. Yes, we've come a long way in a short time. I know they're watching two different people than they knew years ago. Robert takes the controls and makes a small turn to bring the interstate up on his side. I'm feeling a little lighter in one way, having finished our little side venture, but I also have an underlying feeling of dread that I can't explain. Maybe it's just nervousness with all that we have ahead of us. The country slides beneath our wings as we drone northward. We pass over several small towns that dot the highway. A few columns of smoke drift upward from small fires, either in the towns themselves or in the outlying areas. 
It doesn't look any different than when I skirted small towns in times past, with the exception that there isn't anyone gazing skyward with our passage. The surreal ghost town feel accompanies each one we fly over. The streets and parking lots, bathed in the late morning sunshine, stand empty of people. It's so eerie, looking down at a place where there should be cars moving along the streets, or people going in and out of the stores. But everything is just... empty. The sights make me feel a little hollow inside as well. Perhaps it's the energy of the people that used to inhabit these places that's missing. We drone farther north, leaving another small town in our wake. We come to Olympia with the waters of Puget Sound opening to our left. I'm eager to be back to see how the others are and to begin setting up our new place, hoping that the evening went well for them and that they're safe. However, the little boy in me keeps glancing off to the water sparkling under the sun, the small waves reflecting back and the sunlight bouncing off their tops like glittering diamonds. The little boy in me wins out over the eagerness to be back with the group. After all, this may be the last time we get to or need to fly. I've got the aircraft, I say. I can land it, Robert replies, obviously enjoying his time at the controls, and maybe feeling the same as me, that this could be our last time. I know, but we're going to take a small detour, I state. I bank the aircraft to the left, and... Once the waters of the harbor appear under our nose, drop the aircraft down until we're just barely over the water. The Puget Sound shoots under our nose as I move the throttle up a little more. The memories come back of similar adventures under slightly different circumstances, mostly penetrating under radar. The thrill of flying so close to the ground, or water in this case, returns. I always loved flying low level, and I mean really low level. I remember taking jets up through the canyons of northwest Texas. Oh, the fun. We turn and follow the waterway up through the narrow passages. The tree-clad islands flash by our windows, their tops often above the horizon for us. I look over at Robert to see a big grin plastered on his face. Bree is beaming as well, but I also notice she has her legs raised slightly, as if to avoid scraping her feet on the water below. Lynn has a smile on her face, knowing the little kid within me is having fun. The others have wide eyes as if they're not enjoying this much and instead see only their imminent death. Okay, we've had our fun. We should head back. But there's one other thing you should see and experience, I say bringing the throttles back and slowing. Robert, lower the ramp, I add, once we're below the safe operating speed for it. Okay, he says, with his grin getting even larger, as if he's guessed what I intend to do. Go and take a look out back if you want, but make sure you're secured by the safety straps, I shout over the roar from the engines. Robert, Bree, and Lynn unbuckle and begin heading to the back. Kelly, Brian, and Jessica all remain seated. Uh, you don't want to go see? I shout. All three shake their heads. Your loss, I respond. Robert heads down the cockpit stairs, eager with anticipation, but with a touch of nervousness as well. The roar is louder in the cargo compartment with the ramp open, the view of the water rushing by the open ramp door causes a jolt of adrenaline. He, Lynn, and Bree find the crew chief safety straps and attach them before stepping onto the open ramp. The water is rushing by, so close that he feels as if he can reach a hand out and touch it, the tops of the small waves only feet below him. He looks up, and the sight of the water scooting by only feet below him is dampened by the sight farther behind the aircraft. The big bladed propellers, themselves only a few feet over the water, are taking big bites out of the air and sending huge rooster tails of wind into the air behind them. The sight of anything else behind them is lost by the immense amounts of water being launched skyward. He's mesmerized and feels like he could watch forever, just viewing the phenomenon unfolding. 
Knowing he can't and that they need to get on with their day, he turns and walks back to the cockpit with Lynn and Bree following. That was intense, Robert shouts, settling into his seat again. I know, right? I return. It's a good feeling seeing the smiles inside the cockpit, knowing we can still eke a measure of enjoyment out of our situation. Do you want to go in back? Robert asks. No, I'm good. I've seen it a few times, I answer. Truth is, I would love to go witness it again, but any deviation from our course this low, even a slight one, would make a big splash and not in a good way. I'm just happy they could see it. The sound widens and I push the throttles up after closing the ramp, bringing the aircraft up in a climbing turn, the climb necessary to give us wingtip clearance for the turn to reverse our direction. We're almost adjacent to McCord, but I want to do a pass over Cabela's to let everyone know we're back. I bring the aircraft down to our previous altitude and let Robert fly some of the way back, with my hands hovering over the controls. Reaching our entry point, Robert climbs out of the Puget Sound and picks up I-5 again. The green roof of Cabela's flashes by as we buzz the building, letting the folks we left behind know we're back. The now empty transport vehicles and Humvees are parked in rows in the parking lot closest to the building. Several black-clad people look up as we pass, shading their eyes from the glare of the sun as we zoom overhead. The only sign of life we've seen on our short journey back. The sight of them below us gives us a measure of relief, knowing they're okay. With the airfield just ahead of us, Robert goes through the checklist and sets up for landing. He has come a long way with his flying and become a competent pilot. I guess stress and extreme situations allow us to become proficient at a quickened rate. The landing is neither his worst nor his best. It's just a landing, and we pull adjacent to our previous sanctuary, parking close by to give it some company in its retirement. Who knows if we'll need to use this aircraft again, but it is nice knowing it's available if we do. I imagine several scenarios where we could use a working 130 to find other survivors, but for now, we need to see to ourselves. The Humvee is carefully offloaded and we begin our drive back. The sun has passed its zenith as we maneuver through the dead base and out of the gate. The smiles that were prevalent a short time ago are replaced by looks of determination and seriousness as we enter our survival situation in earnest. Are we going to get carry now? Kelly asks from the back. Uh, yes, we'll take a team and go look for her once we get back, I reply. Why not now? She asks with a touch of impatience. I certainly understand her eagerness, and I know I would be feeling the same if it were my child. Because we'll have more people to look for her, and for safety, I answer. We'll leave as soon as we can once we get back. I know this isn't the answer she wants, but... She remained silent for the rest of our drive. I'm exhausted from a very sleepless night as we crest the hill to Cabela's and park next to the line of vehicles. We have a number of hours before night hits, but not enough to begin the process of building our wall of safety around us. There's a lot of planning to do at any rate. We'll use the remaining daylight hours to figure out the exact steps and assignments. That is, after we go see about Carrie. Yet another rescue, and I have the feeling that this will be a prevalent aspect for our future, finding other survivors. Lynn steps out of the Humvee and walks over to Dreskel, who is standing by the entrance as the rest of us begin to gather the supplies from the back. The lively feeling I had earlier is now replaced by an overwhelming tiredness. I'm not in an overly energetic mood, so I take my time with the supplies and would much prefer to bask in the warm radiance of the sun. I'm about to head inside to gather up Red Team and go look for Carrie when I notice Lynn's head snap in my direction. I watch as she turns back to Dreskel, saying something, and walks hurriedly toward me with Dreskel right behind. Jack, I don't know how to say this, but... Dreskel begins to say... Jack, you better hurry inside. Nick's been bitten, Lynn interrupts with tears forming in her eyes. What? How the fuck? I start to say and take off at a run for the entrance. 
An overwhelming panic grips my insides. My stomach turns to knots, and I feel a fist squeezing my heart. One of my kids? No. Not my precious Nick. Please, no. I scream inside as I bolt through the open doors. Robert and Bree were beside me and are right on my heels. I race through and stop suddenly, not knowing where to go. Where? I turn in a panic to Dreskel, who has paced us with Lynn beside him. Upstairs. I take off at a run again for the far escalator, taking them two at a time. All other thoughts vanish. I desperately need to see my Nick. A wave of nausea grips my insides. I shouldn't have left, I think, reaching the top of the escalator, feeling like a complete failure. I should have been here for all of my kids. I race across the linoleum with the sound of boots pounding behind me as Robert, Bree, Lynn, and Dreskel follow. The fear gripping me is mixed with a surreal sense like this can't be happening. Nick is lying on a cot with Mom bent over her, her hand on Nick's head, stroking it softly. I dash to Nick's side and go to my knees, dropping my carbine to the floor, and take Nick's hand. It feels like it's on fire. Her face is flushed and her eyes have the glassy look of a fever as she turns her head toward me. Her beautiful hazel eyes gaze up into mine. Hi, Dad, Nick whispers. Hi, hon. How you feeling? I say, seeing her face blur through the tears forming in my eyes. I'm cold, she responds, whispering again as a tremor passes through her small, frail body. Her hand tightens on mine with the spasm. I look at the bandage at her neck and shoulder. Peeling back the white compress, I see the bite with the bright redness of infection surrounding it. The skin past the redness has turned to gray color. My I-can-and-need-to-fix-it mode comes into play. Get me some antibiotics, I say without turning. We've been giving her some every hour, Dreskel responds behind. I said get me some, damn it, I state harshly, not wanting to hear anything else right now and wanting to fix my sweet, beautiful girl. The nausea and fear still grip not only my insides but my entire being as I look at the bite mark on my sweet neck. Spirits, please, don't take my neck. Take me if you need someone, but please don't take her. I will do anything you ask if you spare her. How did this happen? I ask. Night Runner got in, Dreskel responds. How did they get in? I ask. Roof access door, he answers. How many? One. One? Only one? You're kidding, right? I feel a tap at my shoulder and turn to see Lynn hand me some crushed pills. I sprinkle them liberally over her wound, replace the bandage, and take Nick's hand back. Lynn settles in beside me with Robert at Nick's head, and Bree kneeling beside Mom, taking Nick's other hand. All have tears in their eyes, with Bree's streaming down her cheeks. Mom's eyes are red from crying. I barely hear the soft murmurings of the others talking to Nick as I gaze into her sweet face once again. I want to do more and feel at a loss as to what. I have always been able to fix things in one capacity or another, and feel a tremendous fear and sorrow build at not being able to fix this right away. Panic, fear, and a deep sadness. I love you, Nick, I say with a blurred vision. I love you, too. Don't cry, Dad, she whispers. It'll be okay. I'm glad you're back. That's my Nick. Always thinking of others. I am too, hun, I say, but am unable to say more as the sadness I feel deep inside keeps me silent. It threatens to rip my heart apart. Another tremor takes hold of her body, 
stronger and lasting longer than the last. She arches upward slightly as her body tenses. She squeezes her eyes shut, and then it passes. I stroke her cheek lightly, feeling the heat radiate. She looks at Bree and then Robert, smiling at both of them with her sweet smile, and telling them she loves them before looking back at me. I'm going to miss going to the woods with you, she says. I'm so glad you're my dad. Don't talk like that, hon. We'll have plenty more times together here. She just looks at me and smiles. Dad? Yes, hon, I answer, feeling the hot tears stream down my cheeks. Promise that you'll meet me there, she says in a soft whisper, and her body tenses with another spasm. Her hazel eyes look up into mine after her body relaxes, and she smiles her soft smile. She gazes into my eyes with clarity one last time, as her hand goes limp, and the life leaves her eyes. No. I feel for a pulse, and, feeling a light, thready one, begin resuscitation efforts. My tears splash against her cheeks as I try to blow life back into her. Please, no. Please, anything but this. Please don't take my nick from me. Please come back, sweetheart. Don't leave me. Mom wails in the background with Bree, Robert, and Lynn crying. But this is lost on me as I try to blow my very life back into my sweet, beautiful girl. I feel a hand on my shoulder after a while, but shrug it off violently. And, with a deep panic, continue to breathe into Nick. Jack, I hear behind me a while later. I stop and look down at my girl. I check for a pulse and find none. I reach up and close her eyes. She looks so peaceful. I stroke her cheeks, not noticing that coolness has replaced the fire that was so prevalent before. Nick, please come back to me. I look at that sweet face that always had a laugh ready, already missing its sweet sound. The sweet, thoughtful, and kind words for anyone that would come from lips that will speak no more. The look of love that would radiate from her beautiful eyes. I will never get to see that look again. The wonderful times we had together full of peace and warmth and serenity, thinking we would have an eternity to spend those moments together, I will now never again sit with Nick on our hill, basking in the peace and just enjoying being with her, the vibrant and full-of-life girl of mine, is gone. Gone. The realization of this comes to light, and I feel my heart tear apart, ripping to pieces. No! I scream and collapse to the floor on my knees. Jack, I'm so sorry, Lynn sobs, wrapping her arms around me. I feel her arms around me. Or notice, but from a distance, as I feel completely numb to everything. Numb except for extreme pain and grief. The one thought that echoes above the pain is that I have failed. All that I have done is a failure if it cost the life of one of my kids. I cry myself out on the floor after a long while and feel numbness seep into my being.
I also feel that void being replaced by anger and frustration. Frustrated at feeling so helpless in being unable to save Nick. Angry that my Nick has been taken from me. Angry at myself for leaving her behind and not being here for her. The pain turns to anger. A pain and anger so deep it wants to explode. I rise, pick up my M4, and rock the charging handle back, chambering around. Lynn, who had her arms around me the entire time, rises with me and looks at me with concern. I round on Dreskel, transferring the anger inside to him for not keeping my daughter safe. I'm not thinking clearly, except to think that he should have kept my daughter safe. I entrusted that responsibility to him, and he failed. But I know deep inside it's my own failure. The pain has to be vented somewhere. Dreskel sees the look in my eyes and takes a step backward. Lynn, seeing the burning in my eyes, steps between us. Jack, you don't want to do this, she says, looking up at me. I merely look from her to him. Before you do anything, let me tell you what happened, she says, putting a hand on my chest, and relates the actions of the night prior that Dreskel told her. Jack Nick saved his life. Don't take what she died saving. Her words sink in, but it doesn't alleviate the pain. I only know that it has to be released somehow. I realize she's right and he didn't do anything wrong, but the pain and anger are still ripping apart my insides. I hand her my M4 and trudge down the stairs and outside. I know Robert, Bree, and Mom could use some consoling as well, but I'm not capable of that right now and just need to be alone. The sun on my shoulders outside doesn't convey the warmth it did upon my arrival. I feel only a crushing blackness within. I begin walking across the parking lot with no destination in mind. My only thought is to get somewhere where I can be alone. I see little Robert off to the side of the parking lot, playing fetch with Mike. Other teams are in the lot, but keep busy looking elsewhere. Word must have spread, and they feel uncomfortable not knowing what to say or do. Knowing anything they say or do couldn't possibly help. The exception is Red Team. Gonzalez, McCafferty, Henderson, and Denton. Sir, Gonzalez puts a hand on my shoulder. I know whatever I say can't possibly help, but, well, I'm sorry. The others pat my shoulder, nod in agreement with Gonzalez's statement, and then walk away. She's wrong, I think, watching them walk away in the sunlit parking lot. There's a spark of light at the concern and sympathy both they and Lynn showed. Even Dreskel. I could see it in his eyes, but didn't give him a chance to voice it. I continue across the lot, numbly picking a direction. The lot ends and the brown grass begins, but my steps carry on. The dry grass crunches under my boots as I walk farther away from the buildings, as if distance can ease me. The grief crushes me once again, and I drop to my knees in the grass. The sorrow and deep loss inside flows outward in wails. It threatens to overwhelm me. With each wail, I feel a little less pressure inside until I feel empty. A burned-out husk, but without the feeling like I'm going to explode. Numb and empty, I return. Robert, Bree, Mom, and I hug and cry for a time. I try to cover Nick, but fumble, blinded by my tears at seeing her again. I feel another hand on my shoulder. We'll take care of her, Jack, Dreskel says. Thanks, and I'm sorry, I say to his gesture of understanding and sympathy. He shrugs. I'm sorry too, Jack. 
I look past Dreskel to see Kelly standing in the background and am reminded that she has her own lost daughter to be taken care of. Dreskel, Kelly's daughter is missing. Can you have Red Team help her? I ask. Sure thing, Jack. Consider it done, he answers. I collapse on a cot, feeling overwhelmed, very tired. I plan to take Nick out in the morning to lay her to rest in our favorite place. Remembering her last words as tears stream down my cheeks until I fall asleep. I sleep for the rest of the day and throughout the night, waking in panic at intervals, feeling a short relief thinking it has all been a horrible dream, until the reality of it sets in, beginning the whole process again. Red Team gathers by one of the Humvees, checking on their ammo and supplies after receiving word from Dreskel that they're to help one of the new arrivals find her daughter. That really sucks about Jack's daughter, Gonzalez says while checking her ammo pouches and radio. Yeah, no kidding, McCafferty replies, verifying both of their radios are in working order. Do you think he'll be okay? Henderson asks. What do you mean? Gonzalez says. Well, I knew this sergeant in Afghanistan who lost one of his kids while he was there and completely lost it. Walked his entire squad into an ambush and fell apart, Henderson answers, looking back at the large structure. Look, guys, it's up to us to watch out for him and make sure we support him the best way we can. He's one of us, Gonzalez says. I don't get the feeling that Jack will fall apart like that, Denton says on the heels of Gonzalez. Hey, here comes the lady we're supposed to help. Game face is on, Gonzalez says, watching Kelly, Brian, and Jessica approach the lot. Hey, by the way, who's leading us? You are, McCafferty replies. Nice try, but no thanks, Gonzalez says. Sorry, but you brought it up, so you're it by default. You two agree? McCafferty asks Henderson and Denton, who both nod their agreement. You're outvoted, so you're it. Fuck you guys. Gonzalez responds. Kelly and the others finally join them and introductions are made. Are you ready, ma'am? Gonzalez asks. Yes, Kelly answers. Okay, let's load up. Henderson, you drive, Gonzalez says. Uh, ma'am, I'm not really comfortable with your daughter coming with us, Gonzalez adds, seeing Jessica begin to enter. Why not? Kelly asks. Because we don't know what we're going to find out there, Gonzalez answers. She'll be fine, miss, Brian says. You really don't know that, or what it's like out there, do you? Gonzalez says. I'm not comfortable taking her, and she'll be safer here. She stays, and I'm not a miss, as you so eloquently put it. You may call me Corporal or Gonzalez, your choice. I don't really care one way or the other. Can we just go? Kelly states. With everyone on board, Henderson starts the Humvee. Lynn walks across the lot to the open window. I want you all back here by 1900. That gives you three hours. Yes, First Sergeant, Gonzalez responds from the passenger seat. That's back here, not starting back or taking off on some sightseeing adventure. Hoo-wah, First Sergeant. Okay, good luck. How's Jack? McCafferty asks. He's finally sleeping. Now off with you. They head off and make their way through town, taking several turns with Kelly's guidance. As they motor through the quiet and empty streets, the pervasive smell of rot fills the air. The houses seem to shrink back from the streets as if knowing their usefulness to humanity has come to an end, and they're receding into the background. To the team, they seem to grow dimmer in the light of the sun, as if the harboring of so many dead or night runners has changed their personality or charm as if the dead are somehow changing the very essence of what we once called homes. Is this what it's like everywhere? Kelly asks at one point, looking at the quiet and still environment. Yes, ma'am, at least as far as we've seen, Gonzalez answers. It doesn't seem that bad, Brian says from the back seat next to Kelly. <laughs> Fucking noob, Henderson chuckles under his breath so only Gonzalez can hear. Gonzalez chuckles at his comment before answering, yeah, Wait until night, or go waltz into one of those buildings. You'll change your mind. 
Yeah, we really didn't know until last night. Brian relates the story at the apartment as they make their way to where Kelly thinks Carrie might be. The team members shake their heads after hearing the story, although told from Brian's point of view, and sorry that Jack had to return to such a tragedy after going through a night like that. They pull into a neighborhood tract and up to a light blue house as directed by Kelly. They park and exit, noticing the open front door of the two-story home built closely to its neighboring houses. The residence is one of those tract houses that are thrown up quickly and basic in its shape and nature. Curtains are drawn across front windows that face a small porch and on the two upstairs windows as well. The open door isn't evidence of anything in particular, but the fact that it's open leads Gonzalez to believe that it happened after the disaster, or it would have been closed. Carrie! Gonzalez startles at Kelly's scream. Ma'am, please don't do that! She tells Kelly, not really wanting to give notice to anything that may be inside that they're here. There is no response to Kelly's scream. The house stares back in silence. Are you sure she's here? Gonzalez asks. It's her dad's house. I don't know where else she'd be, Kelly answers. What can you tell us about the place? Kelly gives a rundown of the interior, with a living room opening up to the right, leading to a dining room and kitchen in the rear. Stairs head up just inside the doorway leading to two bedrooms. A hallway branches off to the left, past the stairs leading to two more bedrooms. A basement door exits off the kitchen to a half-basement below. Okay, folks, you heard the layout. Let's take a peek inside and we'll formulate a plan based on what we see. Keep on your toes, check your radios, and lock and load, Gonzalez says. The metallic clinks of charging handles being released resonates off the walls of the houses close by. They walk up to the doorway in a staggered formation, ready for anything to emerge, but cautious with the trigger fingers as Kelly's daughter could show at the door. They know a night runner won't come out of the front door, but they also know not to assume anything. They remember the marauders back east and display caution. Gonzalez peeks in the open door. The odor emanating from the interior isn't any better or worse than the smell already pervasive in the area. Stairs take off just inside the door, as promised, and the house opens up to the living room on the right. Denton, cover those stairs, the rest of us to the right. We'll clear the first floor first, Gonzalez says, eyeing the dark interior. NVG's on. You got it, Denton says. He steps inside and kneels on the first steps with his M4 pointed to the landing above. The light from the open door stretches most of the way up the stairs, so he doesn't need his goggles. Small clicks sound in the still interior as the others lower their goggles, turning the interior of the dark house a bright green. The stillness remains, even though the once dark corners are revealed. The team members feel the quietness, as if it has weight to it. It settles on their shoulders and feels like it compressed inward, as if trying to smother them. Okay, everyone, remember, there may be a little girl in here, so let's not have any itchy trigger fingers, Gonzalez says, stepping into the living room. She sees a hall stretching away to her left with the dining room ahead and a kitchen opening to the left past it. Stopping to listen, the house seems to breathe on its own. She knows it's only her own chest rising and falling with her heart pounding like a bass drum, but it's the feeling the house gives off. Nothing comes to her that seems out of place. A glance down the hallway shows two open doors to the right and one open at the back of the hall. Henderson, cover the hall while we check out the kitchen, Gonzalez whispers. Henderson kneels, turns on his laser, and aims his weapon down the hall. The thin beam of light strikes down the hall and enters the room in the back. Gonzalez and McCafferty quickly enter the dining room and focus their beams in the kitchen. In the back, a closed door is against the wall to the left, but all else remains empty. Another door to the right leads outside. A few dishes are stacked in the sink, but all seems to be in order. Light streams past an opening and curtains that are pulled across windows above the sink, casting a thin beam over counters and across the floor. Henderson, move up and cover the kitchen, Gonzalez says. Clothing rustles as Henderson shifts position to the dining room. 
We'll head down the hall and clear each room as we come to it. I'll cover the hall while you check out the room, Gonzalez whispers to McCafferty. Who are? McCafferty whispers back. We're heading down the hall, Gonzalez whispers into her throat mic. Double clicks in her earpiece signify the others heard and understand. With Gonzalez in the lead and on the left, the two cautiously and slowly head down the hall, coming to the first door to the right. McCafferty quickly peeks her head around the corner of the door. Bathroom, all clear, she says in whisper. Do you hear that? Gonzalez asks just as quietly. What? McCafferty says. It sounds like breathing ahead. She nods in the direction of the back room. Or panting. I don't hear anything, McCafferty replies. There's something there. I can barely hear it, but it's definitely something. McCafferty shakes her head, indicating she still can't hear anything. All right, let's move up, Gonzalez says, but keeps her thin beam of light aimed at the back room. Two more steps in the hall, and the panting gets significantly louder. I hear that, McCafferty says. For a moment, Gonzalez is unsure of what to do. Her instincts say get the hell out as they only have four of them in a house with an unknown number of night runners. Plus, Henderson and Denton are slightly spread out. They could quickly be overwhelmed in this small hall if there are a lot of them. That there are night runners is no longer in question, but there is a small nagging notion that there may also be a little girl inside. It sounds like we have night runners in the back room, she quietly radios. What do you want to do? McCafferty asks as they're both frozen in place in the narrow hall. I think we should get the fuck out, Gonzalez whispers. I'm with you on that. What about the girl? There are night runners in here. I am not... That's all Gonzalez gets out before a high-pitched shriek emits from the back room and fills the hallway. It deafens the two of them in the enclosed space, sending their heart rate and adrenals into high gear. The shriek is followed by the immediate appearance of a night runner at the bedroom door, streaking for the two of them. The women are shocked by the appearance of the creature so close, its skin and eyes glowing in their goggles, but not to the point of inaction. The night runner runs directly into their twin beams of light. Their instincts take over. The hall is suddenly filled with the strobe light flashing against the walls and the muted cough of rounds transiting through suppressors. The first rounds to strike hit in the center of its chest and halt the night runner's momentum, standing it upright as if jerked by a puppet master. The subsequent rounds tear into a chest already spotted several times by bullets entering, launching the night runner up and backwards into the room from where it came. Gonzalez and McCafferty pause in the hall with the aftermath ringing in their ears, waiting for other creatures to show. Silence ensues. What do you think? McCafferty says in the silence. I don't know, but I can't hear shit now, Gonzalez answers. Me either, McCafferty whispers. They pause a moment longer. Images of their past battles float through Gonzalez's mind. When there's one, there's always been more, and a lot more, she thinks, eyeing the back rooms waiting for more shrieks or night runners to emerge. She's torn. Her first priority is to her team— but they also have a little girl to look for. She wouldn't feel right if they were to leave and she were actually here. On the other hand, with night runners in the house, or at least the one, there isn't much of a chance that she's still here. Gonzalez, McCafferty, are you two okay? Denton asks. Yeah, we're fine. One came out of the back bedroom. We don't see or hear any others. We're heading into the bedrooms, she answers shrugging at McCafferty, having apparently made up her mind. Gonzalez nods to McCafferty. They again proceed slowly down the hall. The open doors at the end are only a few feet away, and they are both acutely aware of just how quickly the night runners can materialize. The tension filling the hall compresses to the point that it feels like they are walking underwater. With Gonzalez covering the room the night runner emerged from, McCafferty carefully pokes her head around another doorway. Nothing stirs. She moves farther into the room, weapon up and ready for any movement. Nothing. 
A quick sweep through the closet shows only a scattering of clothes and boxes. She returns to the hall to report all clear. Entering the far back bedroom, they step over the bullet-ridden corpse lying on the floor just inside. Although fully expecting to find another night runner hidden within, they don't find anything else. We're coming back to the living room, Gonzalez announces over the radios. She receives the familiar two clicks of acknowledgement, and they join Henderson in the dining room. We'll check the basement. Henderson, cover the hall just in case, Gonzalez says with Henderson nodding in reply. She relays the info to Denton. The two cross the distance to the door quickly. With Gonzalez covering the door from the side, McCafferty reaches across the door and tests the handle. Locked. With a shrug, she glances at Gonzalez with a what-now look. Gonzalez waves her to the side and lowers her carbine at the latch. She hesitates a moment, not wanting to shoot through the door and hit someone on the other side. The door could have been locked from either side. The fact that the basement is locked but the front door left open makes her think that someone could be on the other side. Without seeing a quick solution, she mentally shrugs and, after warning Henderson and Denton, pulls the trigger for a short burst. The striking of the bullets caused the door to explode with a shower of splinters by the door handle. She nods to McCafferty, who reaches across and swings the door open. The beam of light from Gonzalez's laser streaks downward. She expects to see a night runner, perhaps locked in, or a very scared girl, but she's only met by a descending flight of stairs. Stepping down the concrete stairs into the chill of the basement, she swings her M4 from side to side as she searches areas as they come into view. The beam of light follows her eyes and defines where her barrel is pointed. Cautiously, step by step, she draws closer to the basement floor with the stench being the only assault so far. Reaching the bottom, she looks to the far end of the small basement and sees a figure lying on a few blankets spread on the cold, hard floor. McCafferty, get down here! I think we may have found her, she says, pressing the mic button on her throat. With McCafferty on the way down the steps, Gonzalez walks over to the figure on the ground. She kneels down next to a teen girl on her back with her eyes closed. She gives the girl a slight shake to see if she awakens, but the young girl remains still with her eyes closed. Although she did move loosely and without any rigidity when Gonzalez shook her, she searches for a pulse and finds a weak but steady one. Feeling her chest, she notices that it rises ever so slightly. I've got a girl down here with a weak pulse and shallow breathing, but she's alive, she radios. They pick the girl up, noticing the worn, dirt-stained jeans and once white top, and carry her outside, gathering up Henderson and Denton on their way out. They place the girl on the thin strip of green grass serving as the front lawn. Carrie! Kelly yells upon seeing them carry the thin figure outside, answering the question of whether they found the right girl. Denton, go see if there's an IV and saline in the med kit. Gonzalez kneels by the frail body. To her, it's obvious that Carrie has been without food and water for a while. The girl looks like exposure victims she's seen in the past. Kelly kneels on the other side, calling to Carrie, stroking her face. Denton returns and pulls out a bag of saline with an IV kit. Gonzalez was trained some time ago and knows she's no expert at inserting an IV. She had a hard time finding a vein even back in training. She looks to the arm and notices the veins deflated through dehydration. She doesn't feel comfortable trying to find a smaller one in the hand, and she's definitely not going for the jugular. So she tries to insert the needle into the arm. Several attempts later, she's rewarded with a spot of blood in the needle. Taping the needle in place and hooking up the bag, she turns the drip on high. To the relief of everyone, Carrie emits a faint, stirring moan. Gonzalez was worried they would have to transport Carrie in her weakened condition. Though there is still time before they're due back, she hadn't wanted to risk moving her. Carrie's eyes flutter open. Kelly sobs in relief and hugs her daughter tightly before turning to Gonzalez and giving her a big hug. Thank you. Oh, thank you, she says. Our pleasure, ma'am, Gonzalez says, 
feeling a touch uncomfortable with the outpouring of emotion. They keep Carrie on the grass for a while longer, feeding her small sips of water until Gonzalez feels comfortable enough with Carrie's recovery. They load the girl into the rear, making sure she's comfortable, and proceed back with the sound of Kelly comforting her daughter. Gonzalez feels good that they could help someone in this nightmare of danger and death in which so much has been lost. The next morning arrives, and I wake feeling just as tired as when I collapsed. The night passed with my waking many times, sometimes due to the pain and sometimes with the pounding at the doors from night runners. I'm angered at their pounding interrupting my sleep and by their taking my precious gem from me. The ache is deep within my heart, and I don't want to get up. I feel like just staying on my cot with my misery for company. I know in my mind that the pain will pass, but it certainly doesn't feel like it ever will. I failed my sweet Nick, and the agony of that hurts, almost as much as her loss. No parent should outlive their child— my worst nightmare has come to pass. I don't want to rise, but know that I need to lay my nick to rest. With an extreme effort, like lifting a truck from on top of me, I toss aside the blankets that someone put over me during the night. I sit on the side of the cot and look over to where Nick is lying to see that Dreskel or someone wrapped her in a sleeping bag. Robert and Bree are sitting on their cots with their heads hung. Mom is kneeling by Nick, just staring at the bag in which she lies. I rise and walk over to Nick, lift her in my arms, and, without a word, carry her outside with Robert, Bree, and Mom following. As she's going about business in the parking lot, Lynn sees us and joins our silent march, the entire parking lot of soldiers is silent as we pass. I gently set Nick in the back of one of the Humvees. Our doors closing sound unnaturally loud in the stillness as we climb silently in and start down the road. All of us have tears in our eyes, with Mom and Bree sobbing in the back as we drive to the gate blocking the road to our special place. The walk is also conducted in silence, with Robert, Bree, and myself carrying Nick's body along the road and up through the woods. At a stump, we rid ourselves of our accoutrements and smudge ourselves before proceeding into the small valley and up the side of the hill where Nick and I spent so many hours together. The valley still holds the peaceful feeling, but I'm numb inside. I feel like someone else is walking through the shaded grove. I can't believe I'm about to lay my daughter, my Nick, a jewel in my life, to rest. It's a different sense of surreal than the world situation, but surreal nonetheless. We dig a deep hole on the side of the hill where we used to sit. I take off my bare necklace and, unzipping the bag... I place it inside. Gently lowering Nick in her covering, I stand at the edge looking at her lying in the hole. I can't bring myself to shovel dirt in. The thought of doing so makes me feel like I'd be giving up on her. I lean on the shovel with warm tears streaming down my face and feel Lynn's arms around my shoulders. Bree hugs my waist and buries her face against me, sobbing. Mom comes over and throws her arms around the both of us with her eyes red from crying. Robert joins us and, in our shared sorrow and loss, we all hug tightly. As if on a shared thought, we part and I scoop a small load of dirt in, lowering the shovel and gently laying the dirt on the bag, as if edging myself toward actually burying her. We all begin laying shovels in until the bag disappears from view. My vision is blurred as the last of the blue of the bag vanishes beneath the dirt, and the hole is then quickly filled, leaving a mound. We stand around it holding hands. 
I kneel and place my hand on the freshly turned earth. Spirits, you know Nick. She has visited you many times here. Please take care of her and guide her. Nick, you were a sweet jewel upon this earth and blessed it so much with your presence. Your laugh was like an angel singing. You were the world to me, and I'll truly miss you. I'll miss your smile, a smile that would chase all of the shadows away, and the look in your eyes when you gazed at me. I'll miss the times we had playing, laughing, and enjoying each other's company. Goodbye, my dear, sweet Nick. I love you so much. I'll meet you here, I say, sobbing between words. My sweet Nick is truly gone, never to grace my presence with her beautiful laugh or sweet voice again. I swear I hear her voice in my head. I'll be here waiting for you, Dad. A deep, agonizing sense of sadness and loss grips my insides. Robert, Bree, Mom, and Lynn take turns saying their goodbyes, and we depart in silence. I know Robert is grieving within, but it's always been his way to not express his emotions much. Walking through the trees, with the sunlight filtering in through gaps, we gather our gear and walk slowly back to the vehicle. The drive back is conducted with a reverent quiet, and we return to the place we have determined to be our sanctuary, although I'm not sure I will ever see it that way. I walk into the building and plop back onto my cot, feeling completely drained, an empty husk. I'm just a shell, with no drive left. I know mentally I can't sink into this, especially at a time like this with our survival still hanging by a thread, but I can't seem to stop it. My thoughts are not in line with my ability or willpower. I lie down on the cot in tune with the sinking feeling I feel in my soul. Lynn approaches and kneels next to me. I know this isn't the best time, but what do we do now? What do we need to do? I know she is, one, concerned about the group, and two, trying to shake me out of my funk, trying to redirect my thoughts into something productive. It doesn't help. I don't care whatever you see fit. I roll over. Days pass in a blur. I faintly recollect the hammering of night runners outside at night, people coming by, eating and drinking by rote, others within the building moving racks and such, storing gear, and Lynn talking to me at times, but I don't remember any of the conversations. I gradually come out of my depression, but I still can't find the willpower to rise and become useful in any way. Finally, I guess Lynn has had enough of my feeling sorry for myself, and stands over me with her hands on her hips, looking determined. Look, Jack, I know you're hurting, and I feel horrible about what happened, but you've got to shake out of this. We have people here who are looking to you and counting on you. I don't know what to do. I look up at her. Well, these people need you to lead. We need supplies and to start building that fucking wall to protect us, she states. Then do it. Jack, I've seen to getting supplies for the interim and such, but I can't do what you do. I can do the tactical shit, but not the strategic stuff like you have rattling around in that empty cavern you call a mind, she says, trying her hardest to shake me of my lethargy, or at least draw a smile. Do you seriously think Nick would want you like this? That causes a start within. I'm going to the roof. I rise. Fine, Jack, do what you need to, but come back to us. Come back to me, she says, turns, and walks away. 
I rise slowly and remove the barricade leading to the roof. Trudging up the darkened stairwell feels like I'm climbing the Empire State Building. I reach the top, bump the push bar opening the latch, and swing the door open. The bright sunlight blinds my eyes that have only seen the glare of fluorescent lights over the past few days. It's like everything is whited out and then swims into focus. I sit on one of the large pipes running across the space and gaze to the west, seeing the sun just beginning to lower behind the evergreens beyond the open fields. The fresh air feels good, and I feel a stirring inside trying to break through the numbness. I don't know whether to force it back down and stay numb, or to let it through and feel the excruciating pain. I miss Nick, I think. And with that thought, the numbness shatters. The grief rises and explodes. The sun blurs as tears run down my cheeks. I sit alone for a while, realizing that she isn't coming back, but wanting the memory of who she was. The roof door swings open. Robert and Bree walk through. I watch as they both walk over with M4s slung over their shoulders. I stand as they approach, and we throw our arms around each other. Holding them close and tight, I look at them and realize I have been vacant when they needed me. I realize they are all I have left, them and Lynn, and I need to be here for them. I need to be here and see them safe, to make sure they are capable of existing in the new world. It's at this moment that clarity returns, and I feel a semblance of myself again. There is still the deep longing for Nick, but I feel I can focus and carry on again. I'm sorry I've been absent and not here for you, I say as we hug each other closely. That's all right, Dad. We all miss her, Bree says. Yeah, Dad, we understand. Robert chimes in on the heels of Bree, both with tears running down their faces. Dad, Bree asks looking up and wiping her tears away. Yes, hun, I answer. I, we, want to be able to handle ourselves better, to help take care, Bree starts saying. What Bree's trying to say is that we want to be trained like you. Robert interrupts and finishes what Bree was beating around the bush trying to say, not knowing what my response will be. I was thinking along the same lines. We'll fit that in as we build this place up. I sit back on the pipe. We watch the sun set and talk about us. Relive moments. We remember the good times with Nick. Talk about the future. And even laugh some. As the sun vanishes below the trees, oranges spread across the horizon behind the dark backdrop of the mountains. The oranges change to reds and then purples as we watch in silence, each of us content with the mere presence of each other. The day closes. Let's head back downstairs and get ready for the night, I say with a sigh, not wanting this moment to end. The world, sun, and universe don't seem to care about us mere specks and our situation as time or the measure of motion does not stop or change, but merely continues along as it always has. Or maybe that is its way of showing that it cares and that time does carry on and doesn't keep us stuck in our moment. We rise and head down into our sanctuary, making sure the door is locked behind us and barred on the bottom, I turn and see Lynn standing close by. I'm back, I say, as she steps close. I'm so glad, Jack, she whispers in my ear as she gives me a hug like a welcome home after a long journey. Intermission She wakes with a start. Confusion reigns inside her head. 
Wasn't I just at the door and feeling hesitant about going outside? What am I doing back in my room and on the floor? Was I drugged? My children. Yes, I was searching for them. Where are they? She stands in the dark room feeling tired and sore. Her arm burns from a scratch. Looking down, she can't see anything in the inky blackness. She maneuvers to the bedroom door, tripping over a few items in the dark, but makes it across the room and opens the door. The interior is cast in a deep gloom rather than the complete light void of her room. Panic rises within her heart as she remembers running through the house searching for her kids. She doesn't remember finding them or why she quit. Her last memory is of reaching hesitantly for the front door. She rushes down the hall in her bare feet, calling for her kids. Her voice echoes in the quiet interior with no reply. Her tension increases, as does the decibel level of her calls, when she searches the bedrooms. No reply, just the stillness of the house. She scrambles down the stairs with her heart pounding and feeling short of breath. She's barely able to take a breath to scream their names. Stopping in the living room, she glances at the burning on her arm from the scratch and notices her jeans and yellow top are covered in grime and what appears to be dried blood. Quickly checking herself for injuries, she finds none other than the scratch and soreness in her shoulder. She remembers performing these actions before and is confused as to what happened or why she found herself back in her bedroom. The serious possibility that she was drugged and her kids taken seeps into her mind. She recalls the flu pandemic that was storming across the world. Was the vaccine that I took responsible for this in some way? Or does the broken window indicate that someone came in, drugged me, and took them? These questions tumble through her mind in her panicked state. She quickly checks the basement, noticing the boards blocking the front door have been removed, and wonders if the kids left. If so, then why didn't they say something? She's at a loss as to what to do. Stumbling around confused and flustered, she sees her grimy shirt again and quickly changes it with another from the pile of clothes on the couch. Not even noticing, she put it on inside out as her mind is focused entirely on her kids. She thinks they may be at a friend's, and picks up her cell, but it is dead. Picking up the landline phone, she's greeted with silence. Shaking her head, she looks for her keys and can't locate them anywhere, which panics her even further. She heads to the front door, and the hesitancy she felt before stalls her hand for a moment. Turning the handle, she swings it open. The brightness of the day blinds her as she steps onto the porch and calls across the neighborhood for her kids. A black and gray striped cat scampers down the road as her shrill voice rings out over the area. She notices there's no one out. It's not that her neighborhood was ever all that busy, but there were always kids out on bikes or playing basketball in the street during nice days. Stillness hangs in the air. A slight stench similar to a garbage dump reaches her. She steps in to put on a pair of shoes and walks to the end of the driveway to look along the streets. The complete silence adds to her confusion. There's not a thing moving anywhere other than a few blackbirds circling in the distance. Her kids remain paramount in her mind, and she starts down the road in search of them. Her plan is to go to the houses of their friends, looking to see if they are there or if anyone has heard from them. It's a long walk, but the day is early, and she doesn't know of any other way to find them. If she still can't find them, then she'll walk downtown to the police station. Maybe someone she knows will pass by and give her a ride, or she'll see a policeman and can wave him or her down. With that in mind, she heads toward town. Her walk is one of a deep fear. Wanting to run all of the way, she knows she won't make it far if she does that. She feels frustrated about not finding her keys, making this so much harder. She wants to know what happened and rush the process of finding out. 
Taking note that the streets are clear of any moving cars, she continues walking along one of the main streets. While this knowledge enters her mind, total recognition is not there, as her kids occupy all of her thoughts. Where are they? What could have happened to them? These questions rattle around as she can't for the life of her figure out why they just leave. They've always told me where they were or where they were going. She rounds the corner by the high school and notices a startling difference. There is now barbed wire running along the top of the chain-link fence surrounding the school. There's also platforms or towers constructed at the corners and at intervals along the fence. When did this happen? she thinks, coming to a stop. She notices people by the main building and turns toward the entrance thinking there's someone there that can help, or at least let her use a phone to call the kids. She reaches the school entrance to the parking lot to find that it is also fenced in. She passes by several of the platforms built just inside the fence, but finds them empty. The fact that the school is fenced in worries her even more as she feels she's missed a lot of what is going on. Was there some kind of quarantine with the flu pandemic? Did they close down the school because of it? There are others moving near a building in the distance. She's about to call out when she hears a vehicle turn down the street behind her. It registers that it's the first sound she's heard since waking up. Well, the first sound of normal civilization. She turns to see a white van approach, thankful for seeing someone and that they may be able to help. The van pulls alongside and stops as she waves it down. She doesn't know any of the three people who emerge from the vehicle and approach her. Hi, I'm looking for my kids. Do you think you could... She gets no further. The three men launch their assault as she draws close. She struggles against the immediate attack but her fear and surprise, and their overwhelming strength, allows her to be quickly subdued. She's dragged, thrown on the floor of the van, and her hands are quickly tied behind her. She still struggles as she wants to find her kids despite this newly added fear for her life. A bag is thrown over her head, and she feels pain, accompanied by an explosion of bright light. All goes dark, and she sags limply to the floor of the van. He stands on the edge of the parking lot with the rest of his pack milling around him. Their movements make them appear eager, and the images in his mind verify that. The night is chilled, but he doesn't notice, nor does any of his pack as they're out on the hunt. The calls of others have led them to this place. The night shows up bright in his vision, with the stars shining radiantly overhead. A multitude of packs surround a large structure a short distance away. Shrieks call across the lot, and several packs take runs at the entrance, only to come up short as they slam into the outer doors. His pack has grown lately, as he has come across other small ones in the nightly hunts. They stay with him due to his ability to provide protection and find food. He found and added several females to prevent any competition amongst the other males. He still has first choice— but he has plenty to go around now, so there isn't any angst or jealousy within the pack. He stares at the vast gathering of his kind around the building. They have been drawn by the lingering smell of food within. He knows that there is a large number of food inside, but also knows from experience that, even if they were to force an entrance, there would not be enough to go around. The competition for food, especially with his late arrival, will be fierce. Even with a pack as large as his, he knows he may be wasting his time. He also knows he has to spend the short time they have with the increasing scarcity of food on more prosperous ventures. Still, the sheer number of food he smells residing within is tempting. So he camps on the edge of the lot, observing. He watches to see if there is any progress with the multiple attempts to get inside— He'll know if they get close by the change in shrieks and by the images within his mind. It's filled with images of the others right now, but it's no more than a series of multiple conversations occurring. His group is anxious to join in the attempt, but he holds them back, 
sending messages to wait and see. They stay, trusting him as he has not led them astray so far. He stands, rising from his squatting position, and trots around the building. It doesn't appear from the noise and images that any progress is being made. The night is only half over, and they have fed, but they'll need more before the night is over. Again, the thought that they'll have to move intrudes into his mind as he completes a circle around the structure. Every entrance is covered with packs trying to find a way in. He doesn't see any other way. There have been several times in the past when he has had to leave a place without being able to get inside. He can't afford to spend all night in one place and run the risk of not finding food. Too many nights without finding any, and his pack will disperse, or another leader will step in. A sudden flash fills his mind and he's instantly alert. He recognizes the building and wonders how. He feels the minds of the others around him stronger, but with a different clarity. He knows he's on the hunt with his pack, but wonders why the ones by the building are repeatedly slamming into the front door when it's obvious they won't get in that way. He knows he can send an image telling them this and begins to form the picture talk in his mind. He also realizes he knows a different language and that he's as comfortable with that one as much as the one he's about to use. The word talk and picture talk are just two ways to say the same thing. The word talk can't be seen mentally, and he knows it wouldn't be understood by the others even if it could. The clarity in his mind fogs and vanishes as quickly as it came. He has stopped and brought the pack back close to where he began. He squats in his former position, watching. The thought occurs that with so many other packs here, and apparently staying until they find a way in, they are not out in the streets and surrounding area. That means any food he finds will be for his pack and for them alone. With that in mind, he stands, gives a loud shriek that rises above the cacophony of noise already around the building, turns, and heads off at a run across the dry grass fields. The others around the building stop at a shriek rising above their own and look to the source. They see a large pack just cresting a hill in the field beyond and disappear behind it, heading away into the night. A Rolling Stone Part One I walk to the second-floor balcony and look over the changes that occurred during my mental absence. Lynn, Bannerman, and Frank lean against the railing next to me. The clothing racks, shelves, and such have been removed from the interior on the first and second floors, clearing out much of the space. The stuffed animals have also been removed from the large centerpiece in preparation of removing it as well. The weapons racks and weapons have been installed along a wall with several shelves shifted to accommodate other items. Cots have been laid out in rows along the top floor with spaces between them to give the appearance of privacy. You've done a marvelous job, I say to Bannerman, who mostly coordinated the efforts. Thanks, Jack. We have the kitchen working and running water. The place has a well and a pump, so as long as we have power, we'll have that benefit— Frank has a base radio up and running. He's training some of the folks we picked up and has scheduled shifts, Bannerman responds. Very nicely done. All of you, I say, nodding in appreciation. Sergeant Connell assigned teams for supply runs and we should be good for a while, Bannerman adds. At least we won't have to worry about water in the interim. Oh, and we found an employee break room and small locker rooms complete with a couple of shower stalls. Oh, nice. Jack, there is one thing you should know, and something we may have to deal with somehow. Lynn chimes in. What's that? I ask. We lost another soldier, she says. How? It wasn't through any night runner action. He was from Mullen's team. He was outside on lookout while the others went in for supplies. When they came back out, he was gone. His rifle was leaning against the building, but he wasn't anywhere to be seen. They searched the area and called out, but never found him. I think he just had enough and walked off, 
Lynn says. Bannerman and Frank nod in support of her view. We'll have to brief the team leaders to be on watch for changes in personality or a sudden quietness with folks. Sometimes it'll seem easier to just give up rather than put up with the stresses of surviving another day, I say with a sigh. This is not the last time someone will want to give up, I think. The changes have come about so rapidly, and our situation has a constant tension that weighs on the psyche. Everyone has their breaking point, and I mean everyone. It can come about with the seemingly smallest thing, but it is the literal straw. The mind folds inward, and a person in that moment can't think clearly. Sometimes, though, it seems clarity does come through, and it's through a seemingly rational thought process that these types of decisions to quit come about. The will to survive is eroded through stress and or fear. Oh, we'll keep on the lookout for him, I add. How have the doors held up? Uh, remarkably well. We've had visitors every night, but they're not showing any signs of wear so far. We've been checking them daily, Bannerman answers. Good. Okay. We should talk about our plans for the future and start prioritizing our needs. We can do this with just us or with the team leaders. What do each of you think? I ask. I'm okay either way, Bannerman answers. I think we should keep it to ourselves. I feel time is of the essence and we can prioritize more quickly if we keep the group small, Frank adds his opinion. I'm in agreement with Frank, Lynn says. I think that's probably better as well. What about adding Dreskel to our group? I ask. I'd be perfectly content with that, Lynn responds, with the others nodding. Okay, let's make sure everything is shut down tight and get together after we eat, I say. Everyone nods and we separate. Lynn to see to the doors and security, Frank to continue his training with those on the radios, and Bannerman to see about getting food ready for everyone to eat. We all gather in the restaurant dining area and eat some of the canned food that's been warmed up. There's a feeling of wholeness and completeness with everyone in our group gathered. I still feel the loss of Nick deeply, and I wish she were here to see a semblance of normalcy return. Being able to eat with one of the first feelings of safety we've had. I say a silent prayer to Nick, and the feeling of loss returns, but without the same intensity. The time it took to get to this point of security and normalcy seems so long in the making. The losses, the close calls, the fears. Little Robert passes by, carrying a tray of food, with Mike hard on his heels and Kathy right behind him. I'm sorry about your daughter, sir, he says on passing. Thank you, little Robert. I pat his head. Mike looks at me, then to little Robert, and, with a small whine, follows the food. Gonzalez and the rest of Red Team move a table next to ours and plop themselves down. She then relates the story of getting Carrie, and that she seems to be recovering completely. We're glad you're back, sir, she says, finishing her story before biting down on the spoonful of food she'd been holding. Well done, and I'm glad to be back as well, I comment. We eat with the murmur of conversation drifting around the room. The first metallic bangs against the front security doors announce the arrival of our night runner friends outside. The sound startles everyone with the suddenness of it, but it has also become an expected part of the night. The bangs bring silence to the room before the murmuring and conversations pick up again. I turn to see Horace's blue team along the far balcony, on watch. Cressman is down with Bravo on the first floor as well, Lynn says, seeing the direction of my look and knowing my thoughts. I nod and turn back to my food, actually tasting it for the first time in days. Not that it's a gourmet meal, but it's nice to have some senses return. I feel a little ashamed for being absent, for not being here for the group after dragging them across the world with the lure of the sanctuary. It feels like a weakness of not being able to handle anything that comes about. Not that losing Nick or the feeling of the intense grief feels like a weakness, just that I should have been able to handle it better. Part of my mind tells me those words are just BS, but 
That's how it feels nonetheless. Plates are gathered and returned as individuals finish. Teams that are done replace Horace and Cressman's teams on guard duty, so they have a chance to eat as well. Bannerman, Frank, Dreskel, Lynn, and I gather to the side of the second floor, away from everyone else, to talk. I have Robert and Bree with me to listen in. This process of building a wall is going to be a mammoth undertaking, and we'll need other things done as well, I say, starting our discussion. However, I feel that this should be our highest priority. Besides maintaining the level of security we already have, it'll only be a matter of time before they find another way in or hammer those bloody doors down, I add with the sound of night runners pounding against the steel roll doors outside. It does sound a little diminished from the previous nights, but my mind was in such a fog that I'm not certain. So what are you thinking? Bannerman adds. Well, I'm thinking that there are miles of those concrete walls along the interstate up by Tacoma. We should send two teams to get them, one for security and the other to disassemble them and load them up. The team supplying security will leave two members out for that, and the others will be driving the transports. That means we'll need a large supply of fuel for the vehicles. We'll need other supplies as well, so two teams will be assigned to Bannerman to see to what we need. One team will be needed to erect the wall here, I say. That'll be a lot of equipment we need, Bannerman states. That's true. I think we'll need two cranes back here, one to offload the trucks and one to move the parts into place. I see using four large semis to cart the materials back, given the manpower we have for this, and one crane to move the wall partitions from their places to load them. I reply with Bannerman taking notes. Yeah, we should be able to find those easily enough. Finding people who know how to operate them will be a different story, Bannerman says after finishing with his jottings. It'll be a learning curve, that's for sure. But what hasn't been lately, I say. I was thinking black and green teams could be up gathering the partitions and transporting. You want me and my team up getting the wall? Lynn asks. Well, I was thinking your team could be up doing that, but I want you to put together a training program for the others we picked up, and for any that we find. I want everyone that is here, or comes in, trained, I answer. I was thinking of having one team here on standby, in case any of the teams run into trouble. They can help with the training, and, with your being a previous drill instructor, that puts you at the top of the list to develop it. Okay, I can do that. Do you mean everyone? Like little Robert? Like Bree? She asks. Well, we have to have a cutoff on age, but I want Bree in on that, along with Robert. Not little Robert, I reply. Mm, okay, Jack. I'm not in agreement with Bree, but I'll put a program together, she says. Bree gets put in, Lynn. I hear Bree give a little sigh just behind me. Are you sure, Jack? Lynn asks, referring to the loss of Nick. A quiet hush falls among the group at the reference. The noise inside of people shuffling around on the other side of the balcony, getting ready for bed or just moving, fills the silence. The hammering of the night runners rises above all else. Yes, I'm quite sure, I say quietly. I still have qualms about anything that puts my kids in danger, but I definitely want them trained. I don't know if it would have made a difference with Nick or not, but if it can make a difference later to save the lives of Robert or Bree, I want them to have it. It doesn't mean I'm about to launch them out into buildings. I just want them trained. Okay, Jack, I'll put it together. We'll train during the day while the others are gathering items. But if I'm to do this, then I'm in complete charge. No interference, she says. What, are you implying I would interfere with any training? I ask. Of course not, Jack. I would never imply that. How could I possibly ever think that you would interfere? She answers with her totally innocent look, which, of course, brings a smile to my face. Okay, point taken. You have complete control, and I won't say a thing. Oh, yeah, that'll happen. She rolls her eyes. Just remember this conversation, bucko. Uh, I hate to bring this up, but what are we going to do about all of the dead bodies and the 
probability of diseases, Frank adds. Yeah, there's that. I think we can agree that we don't have the manpower to carry them out or bury them in mass. The only thing I can think of is to burn the housing developments with carefully controlled burns. I just don't see any other way, I answer, giving my opinion. What about any survivors, though? They'll get caught up in that, Dreskel adds. Now, that's a good point. We'll have to make sure any teams assigned to that detail roll through the neighborhoods with loudspeakers and try to find anyone prior to setting the fires. We'll have to make sure of wind direction as well, I respond. And how do we keep the fires under control? Frank asks. We have to get some fire trucks with water tenders from the fire stations. We'll train on their use and use the streets as fire breaks, I answer. Bannerman starts riding again. How many trucks? he asks. I don't rightly know. I think we'll need two teams on the burns, maybe Alpha and Bravo. I guess we'll need every truck we can lay our hands on. Have the trucks run behind the main line of fire and put out anything that jumps the streets. Of course, that could quickly get out of hand with the embers in the air, and if they settle somewhere downwind starting other fires, we'll just have to keep the fires limited and not let them rage out of control. All I'm thinking is that we need to get rid of all the bodies within the area around us, I answer, not knowing the right solution. If I could go back to the wall for a moment, how high are we looking to build it? Bannerman asks while flipping through his notes. I think twenty feet high should do it, provided we can put the partitions together without creating hand or footholds, I answer. Does anyone else think differently? I think that should be high enough, Lynn answers. I mean, the Night Runners have tremendous capabilities from what we've seen, but they're not supermen, nor can they fly. At least not that I've seen. I agree. That should be high enough, Dreskel adds. Are we planning to look for others outside of the burn areas? I think we'll eventually be out doing just that when we have a few more people. Right now, at least the way I see it, we should be concentrating on getting our place up and running, building the security. We'll need to bring in livestock and construct greenhouses if we want to sustain ourselves in the long run. I have it in my mind that we need to get the wall up and the long-term food in place by winter. We'll be able to eat through the winter on supplies we can find, and our fuel situation may be critical by next year. That is, the fuel will be unusable by then. My opinion is that we should use that fuel to make sure we have a viable, long-term place for the people we do have. Oh, I'm not disagreeing with you at all. I was just asking if we're going to look, Dreskel says. Most definitely. I think we owe it to them to look for them when we can, I comment. So, speaking of long-term, what about using solar power for our long-term energy needs? At least for this building, Frank asks. I think that's a good idea. Bannerman says, flipping a page on his notebook and writing more. As long as you're writing, you might put down some of those towable generators found at road construction sites. We could rig one up with a breaker so we can use the pumps at gas stations, I offer. Bannerman nods and his pen flies across the pages. What about integrating a nightly training session for the entire group? We could get together before dinner and have a topic for the night or several nights running, finding someone who has an expertise on something, anything we can all learn, complete with both classroom and practical applications if necessary. Everyone knows something, so we should share the knowledge. I could draft a schedule along with the other training, Len says after Bannerman's pen slows down a notch. I like it, I say, nodding. Yeah, sounds good to me, Dreskel adds. What do you want me to do? Frank asks. I'd like you to have someone by the radios at all times. Mark and coordinate team locations at all times just in case something happens. We'll also need detailed maps of the areas, I answer, hearing Bannerman's writing start up again. You're going to wear that thing out, I say to Bannerman, who chuckles in response. <laughs> My magic wand went missing. This is the best I can do, he says without looking up. I think that may cover it for the short term, unless anyone can think of something, I say, chuckling at Bannerman. Well, there are a few other things Frank and I discussed, Bannerman adds. We were thinking about cleaning while we were sorting through the clothing. I think it would be a good idea if we found some commercial washers and dryers. 
We'll need a way to keep what we have clean. Agreed. Add that to your list as well. Speaking of clothing, we'll need to gather some scent maskers, or at least make sure any teams going into buildings for supplies have smoked themselves, I say. And we were thinking we should go raid Madigan for hospital equipment and supplies, Frank says. We could set up a dispensary in a small hospital there. I'm not talking x-ray machines and the like, and it's not like we have anyone to run some of the stuff, but you never know. IVs, monitors, beds if we can get them, needles, drugs, maybe even a breathing machine if we can. Those are nice to have items, but I'm not sure if they're worth the risk of going into a place like that. Well, it seems like those are more items we'll need rather than want items to me, Dreskel replies. I agree with you that they should be up on the top of the priority list if we're going to make a go at this. Let's get started on the wall and supplies and revisit a hospital trip afterwards. Is there anything else? I look at the group. Well, you have mentioned everyone else. What are you going to be doing? I don't imagine you just hanging around on standby, Lynn asks. Well, I say with a smile, I thought I might get in some helicopter training. That might come in handy down the road when we're searching for others. What? Jack, you can't be... Oh, fuck it. You run off and play and we'll keep the fire warm. She stands. So, you'll have all of the teams tomorrow, Bannerman, to gather the equipment we'll need. Tomorrow we'll be for gathering everything and we'll start our runs the morning after. Oh, and we should plan for the teams to be back two hours prior to sunset. That'll give us plenty of leeway in case something goes wrong, I say, smiling at Lynn's remark. Jack, I'd like the teams to have some practice on the range and physical training in the mornings before everyone heads out on their assignments. We need to keep up on our training levels, Lynn says. Okay, set a schedule and you'll have them. Work out a schedule with Bannerman. We'll also need to set a night watch. The standby team should be a good one to pick, as they won't be out and about, I say. Is there anything else we should talk about? I think we're good, Bannerman says. Okay, let's try to get some sleep, if we can, with all that hammering. If we can think of something to shut the sound out so we can get some sleep, I'm all ears. They just shake their heads at the poor attempt at humor and walk to the other side of the balcony where most of the others are getting ready to turn in. Do I really get to start training? Bree asks when we're the only ones left. Yes, hun, but you have to take it serious and do everything Lynn says. No questioning. It's not a game and you can't treat it that way, I answer. I will, Dad. Take it serious, I mean, she says, but I notice a gleam in her eye. The night passes, and we're only occasionally awakened by the night runners still trying to get through the doors. Bannerman and whoever he had helping did a great job of installing them, as they've held up well under the constant onslaught. It's just an irritant to hear the metallic clangs throughout the night. The constant noise tapers off as the night goes on. I imagine some gave up and went in search of food elsewhere. Now, if we can get the wall built and provide for an extra margin of security, I'll feel even better. We've made it this far, through trials and hardships, through dangerous environments and perilous situations, and with some hard losses. But we're still here, and for the time being, safe from nightly attacks. There's still a lot of danger with gathering our supplies, finding others and, in general, trying to stay at least one step ahead of the game. I have no doubt that the night runners will eventually find a way in with their bloody persistence, and we can't afford to assume a place of complacency. My mind also goes back to the conversation about clearing them out of the area, but I just don't see a way to do that right now. We'd have to shift our priorities completely, and the end result would still be a toss-up. I roll off my cot, feeling drained, awake, but still tired. I'm just not a morning person. I throw on my shirt, wondering who is more offended by it, me or the shirt itself. I ask Bannerman where the other clothes are stored, and if he's gathering the dirty ones somewhere. He points me in the right direction, and I feel a little better with a clean black fatigue shirt on. I see Lynn rousing the other teams. It's nice not to have the sound of night runners slamming into our doors rebounding throughout the interior, 
The sense of relief is immense, and you don't notice how much tension that kind of constant noise creates until it's gone. Bannerman also points me in the direction of the showers they discovered. I see Robert, staring at the place where Nick's cot was, obviously lost in thought. He pulls out of his reverie with a sigh and rises from his cot next to Michelle's. Robert tags sleepily along as I head to the locker room. We pass by Lynn and the other teams as they gather to head outside for PT and training. Gonna join us, flyboy? Lynn asks, to which I merely shake my head and point to the locker room. I should join them, but I just seriously don't want to. I'll pick that up with them in the coming days. I still don't feel totally back to being myself. My thoughts are leaning in the direction of finding a scout helicopter and seeing if I can keep from killing myself trying to fathom its secrets. The warm water pouring over my head feels good and breathes some life into my tired body and mind. Ah, warm water. A shower. Wow, I think, letting the water run over me. It seems to wash away more than just dirt, sweat, and old blood. We finish and dress, with me showing Robert where I found the fresh shirt. The dirty laundry of the others is gathered in a pile, and he tosses his along with the others. I plan on taking Red Team, to include Robert as he's a member, with me to Fort Lewis to see what we can find. It's not that I just want to have fun, but I feel that the helicopter will be a useful tool once we begin to search for others, to be able to cover a wider area. Learning to fly one after we have a need for it will put us behind the curve. I want to be prepared. I imagine a dozen scenarios where it'll be useful, and just wish we had a rotor head along with us already. We're lucky to have what we do with regards to people and abilities, but that would have been cool, too. I hear the sound of gunfire outside as I emerge into the early morning light. The light blue of the morning is replaced by a yellowish-orange glow as the sun rises above the mountains to the east. The long shadow of the building stretches across the parking lot, enveloping the parked vehicles. The cool morning air refreshes me even more than the shower, and I inhale it deeply. I look over the doors, which are now rolled up, for damages where they are bolted into the concrete walls. They look like they have withstood another night without a mark or becoming weakened. The firing is coming from teams lined up at the edge of the parking lot, firing across the fields. Dreskel walks along behind them. Other teams are going through immediate action drills on another part of the lot, with Lynn guiding them. I stroll over to watch Lynn walk them through as Robert comes out and joins me. It's Red Team's turn, and I have Robert join them in their exercise. Are you going to join in? Lynn asks, waiting for the team to get into place and for Robert to join them. I'm good, thanks, I reply. Jack, you're part of this team, so get your ass over here, she says, making me think I should have ventured off in the other direction or found something very interesting on the exact opposite side of the parking lot. I move in line with the team, taking the slack position behind McCafferty, and we go through the IADs with contact front, contact side, and contact rear drills, focusing on each member's responsibilities during each. We also cover areas of responsibilities and coverage during various formations, whether it's in a wedge formation or a patrol line. We don't really have rooms to practice clearing operations with as yet, but we'll definitely have to incorporate building operations in the near future. I'd really like to formulate urban and building ops training as well, I tell Lynn after we finish. I thought about that and we'll come up with something while I'm building the training program today. I'll incorporate that into a daily training plan for the teams, she says. Switch! Lynn calls out and the teams that were firing change places with those that were drilling. I fire several rounds, making sure my sights and lasers are still centered. We finish a short time later and adjourn. The teams take turns showering, and then we all eat as a group. Afterwards, Lynn pulls a table and chair outside and begins writing furiously on several notepads. The teams circle around Bannerman for assignments, and Red Team gathers with me outside. 
I tell Red Team of our plan to go to Fort Lewis and find a scout chopper, which they find mighty amusing for some reason. Hey, can we watch, sir? I haven't seen an officer make a complete ass of himself in about a week, Gonzalez says at one point with a grin. Of course, watching will be from a considerable distance, but we'll have fire extinguishers on hand and come a-running. Yeah, highly fucking amusing, I respond, jokingly. We pile into a Humvee and start out with the other vehicles beginning to exit on their assigned errands. The sun has just crested fully over the mountains, bathing the land in its golden glow. It's been nice to have so many nice days in a row without even the clouds coming to visit, and no rain. That's unusual for the summer here, and I hope it's because someone is looking out for us. I'm hoping this weather continues, but I know we'll have our share of the rain. I'm also hoping the night runners will still be affected by the sun being out, cloud cover or not. If that's not true, then we're in for a world of hurt, especially come winter time. I can't assume anything, so our first day under heavy cloud cover will be a down day just in case, or at least starting later, after assuring ourselves that we still own the day. That's just something we'll have to find out. Pulling onto the base, we head directly to the small flight line associated with Fort Lewis. Several helicopters line the tarmac to one side of the runway, with others parked in open hangars. I can't get over the eerie feeling of seeing so many man-made objects without the associated sounds or activity. The movement of crew chiefs on the ramp... The sound of engines cranking up or winding down, vehicles moving crews to and from aircraft, just the bustle of activity. It's all gone, leaving behind a surreal quiet, especially after coming from the activity around our sanctuary. We exit onto the gray pavement where papers, leaves, and other debris are blowing across the surface in the light wind. It's like stepping onto the surface of an archaeological site from a previous civilization. All of the objects and structures are here, but the people who hovered around them are gone. It's not far from the truth, but damn. I stroll over to one of the O-58 Kiowa helicopters sitting on the ramp nearby and, with Robert by my side, peek in. The rest of Red Team is looking around the area, but they also seem to be getting ready for a show. It actually looks like they're placing bets on which tree I'll end up in by the way they're gesturing and pointing. Have you ever flown one of these? Robert asks over my shoulder. Nope, I answer. Have you ever flown a helicopter? A couple of times, but only once we were airborne. Hmm, is all he says. Looking inside, it's not that different than a normal aircraft cockpit, but I know, different. Flying a helicopter is worlds apart from buzzing around in something with wings attached. I know the fundamentals and basic aspect of flying something with a propeller over my head, but I also know they're tricky little buggers and take a lot of finesse. I'm beginning to wonder if this is actually a good idea. I rummage around the cockpit and locate a checklist, which I start leafing through. I'm not all that enthused about taking something up that I'm not familiar with, emergency procedures, systems, etc. However, this will be handy as long as I don't wrap it around the nearest pole. Well, there's nothing like the present time, I think, getting in the pilot seat. Yes, it's also on the opposite side of where it should be and sit looking at the instrumentation while going through the checklist. Am I going to go with you? Robert asks. Oh, hell no. This may be the shortest and warmest ride in history. I don't think you should be within a mile of me, I answer. Are you going to take it up now? I was thinking about it. Are you sure about this? Robert asks, looking over the cockpit with me. No, not really, I say finding the various switches and becoming familiar with them. I run through the startup checklist, finding the switches as I progress through it, making dry runs to get acquainted. It's not like I'm going to hop cross-country right off the bat, but I want to get familiar with their location so that I don't have to do the hunt and peck thing while airborne. And it's not like I'm thinking I want to get more than six feet off the ground for a while either. 
I spend a couple hours going through dry runs with the checklist and visualizing flying with my hands on the controls. Robert hasn't lost interest and climbed in the other seat, observing. The interior is heated as the sun pours through the plexiglass windshield, the position of the sun bouncing off at the right angle at times, blinding me. The smells of the interior are familiar. The smells of use. Sweat mixed with oil, fuel, in the cloth seats. Anyone who has sat in a cockpit knows those odors well. I take a break and head over with Robert to where the rest of the team is milling about the vehicle. They're alert for anything moving in the area, but also have that I'm bored look of standing around. We break out some rations and water for a quick lunch. Hey, having a hard time getting it started, sir? Henderson asks. If you want, I could spin the blades around if that'll help. Or we could go find a large rubber band to wind it up for you, McCafferty chimes in. I don't think that'll be necessary. Be careful, though, or I may make you go up with me for the first time, I reply to their quips. No, no, I'm good, thanks, McCafferty says. We eat in silence, watching the stillness of the area around, watching as scraps of paper are lifted from the tarmac to flutter momentarily in the light breeze, before being deposited back down a short distance from their starting point. Birds sail over the area from time to time. At one point, two dogs trot across the runway in tandem. The stillness, that was once so surreal, begins to become commonplace, and peacefulness settles in. All of us are enjoying a quiet lunch under the clear blue skies, with the sun warming our shoulders. The calm has an underlying quiet to it, as if it is just holding its breath. The peace is only a temporary one. There's a storm and violence brewing just behind it. The day knows that night will come, bringing the night runners with it. There's also a measure of hope with it that knows another day will come. It's just that you have to make it through the tempest before you can enjoy the peace once again. Lunch ends and I clamber back into the cockpit with a renewed focus. Part of me is worried about trying this little adventure. I'm not even remotely qualified to be doing this and worry about not knowing the systems, like, at all. I always thought it would be nice to drive a helicopter where, if you got into trouble, lost or otherwise, you could just set it down somewhere, kind of like pulling over to the side of the freeway. That was youthful thinking, and I certainly know better now. Anything that leaves the ground has an inherent danger associated with it, and has the ability to come back to the ground in ways that aren't desirable. Okay, time for you to leave and find your seat, I tell Robert, who's sitting next to me. Now you're going to try it, huh? He asks. Yeah, with try being the key word, I answer. He climbs out and joins the others. I see them talking briefly, and then all attention is focused on me. They even walk around to the other side of the Humvee. Yeah, that's trust, I think, flipping the battery on and letting the gyros warm up. Going through the checklist, I press the starter, and the blades slowly start to revolve above me. What the fuck am I doing, I think, as I watch the instruments and the blades pick up speed. I have no idea what the limitations are on the engine instruments other than the meaning of the white, green, and red markings. Red is bad, I know that. Green is good. White is some performance limitation. Of what performance limitation, I haven't a clue. It's not the best way to venture into a flight, or anything for that matter. I check my surroundings with the blades rotating in a blur overhead, and I'm thankful that there aren't other objects close by. It's one of the reasons I chose this one in the first place. I reach down to the collective and grab the throttle. Rolling it, the RPM gauge increases with an intensification in the noise, vibration, and speed of the rotor overhead. I feel the vibration of the helicopter through the seat and pedals. Well, actually, I feel it everywhere, but it's more prominent there. I know I have to keep a constant RPM and think of the collective as a throttle and the cyclic stick in front of me as any normal stick. 
A combination of both acts similar to an aircraft, but the idea is so foreign to me. I gradually pull very lightly on the collective and feel the Kiowa go light on the skids, with each skid tapping on the paved tarmac below me in intervals. The helicopter starts sliding to the left, and I correct with the stick to the right. An overcorrection, and I start off to the right. I eventually bring the slide to a stop, with the skids still light on the ground. I now know why they call them skids. I pull a little more on the collective, and the helicopter rises from the pavement. I remember one pilot saying to just imagine or think of yourself hovering, that you just have to think about moving, and the helicopter will respond to the subtle inputs your mind sends to your hands, or sliding in one direction. Well, I must have been thinking I wanted to be way over to the right, because that's where I go. I try to bring the slide under control and once again overcorrect. I'm now looking at the ramp slide underneath me as I slide to the left in the same manner. I lower the collective as I try to correct the stellar move, and the helicopter slams onto the tarmac like a bag of garbage being thrown in a trash bin. Okay, that was fun, I think, collecting my thoughts again. I look over at the others to see McCafferty with her hand over her mouth, obviously stifling a laugh. Gonzalez, on the other hand, is doubled over at the front of the Humvee. It's also pretty obvious that the others are laughing as well. I'm glad they find this amusing, I think, stealing myself for try number two. My second attempt to not change the sky to ground is a repeat of the first, but without the absolute shock of the helicopter being deposited on the ramp. The next attempts also give Red Team an ab workout, but I'm eventually able to keep the helicopter within the county and hover reasonably well. Uh, I thought fighters were touchy with the controls, but this thing is like having an Xbox controller on the most extreme sensitivity setting. Wow. When things have the feeling of getting out of control, I just deposit it back on the tarmac and start over. Eventually, I'm able to keep it close to being in one place, and try a couple of pedal turns. Now that's pretty cool. I slowly get the feel of the controls, even venturing forward a few times, stopping and easing the chopper to the ground. That doesn't mean I won't have to surgically remove the seat cushion. If I didn't actually suck it up internally, then I know there will be at least a little white ring on it. I eventually shut the helicopter down and step out after the blades come to a stop. The others meander over. Damn, sir, you should at least apologize to the poor thing after abusing it like that, Gonzalez says, stepping close. Or at least buy it dinner first the next time, Henderson adds, close on her heels. Well, aren't you two just the comedic duo, I say. Anyone else have something to say? Come on, get it out. No, sir. You won't hear me saying anything like it was like watching a blind bird trying to land in a tree. Nope. Wouldn't say anything like that, McCafferty says. I can tell Robert wants to join in on the make fun of me session, but keeps quiet. We head back with Robert asking how it was. Ugh, it's touchy as hell, I answer. Um, yeah, I could tell, he says. We pull into the lot where a lot more equipment and vehicles are parked off to the other side of the Humvees and transport trucks. Semis and large truck-mounted cranes dominate the parking lot. The appearance of them shows that the teams have been mostly successful, if not fully, at finding the equipment on Bannerman's list. That is good news, as we can begin fortifying our place tomorrow. I'm pleased, but there's still a place inside that is really missing Nick, and wishes she were here to enjoy this moment with me. The sun is lowering in the late afternoon sky as I step out of the Humvee. I feel tired, but there's a touch of excitement as well. It looks like we have the tools to begin the next phase of building a place of refuge, a place where we can feel safe. It's hard to think that just a few days ago we were traveling from place to place trying to get back. The events of that trip have faded to a degree, making it seem like they took place a long time ago. 
For the first time in a long while, even in the presence of grief, I feel a sense of contentment. Content that we seem to be making a lot of headway. Not as far as where we are. We still have a long ways to go and don't truly know what the future looks like. But in as far as where we're going... It remains to be seen if that contentment will increase or decrease with the degree and speed that the wall is built. Lynn is still camped in the chair where she was when we left. The only difference is the amount of sheets lying on the side of the table covered with writing. She looks up as we approach. And so how'd it go, flyboy? Oh, is everyone going to be a comedian today? I ask in return. Ah, that well, huh? Well, I didn't kill anyone or damage anything, if that means anything, I reply. Other than his pride and possibly one very undeserving helicopter, Gonzalez quips from behind me. It went fine. I'll be back at it tomorrow. I choose to ignore the peanut gallery. How are things here? Just fine. Most of the others pulled in a little while ago. We have one team still out looking for the portable generators, Len answers. And you? I ask. I'm doing pretty well. I have it mostly finished and will be ready to start soon. Good, I say, and I'm about to say more when the sound of a vehicle nearing interrupts. We look to the long drive to see a Humvee crest the hill. As it pulls past, I notice it's towing a wheeled generator. Things are definitely looking up. The confidence I feel in our group increases. We'll be okay, I think. As I watch the vehicle park, as long as our security measures hold up and we don't make any mistakes. Yes, there will be difficulties as we venture into buildings for supplies. The long-term supplies, growing our own food and such, will be a learning process. But for the short term, we should be okay. I lean over, give Lynn a kiss on the cheek, and head inside. There are several team members pulling the large centerpiece apart and carrying the pieces outside. I see others manhandling several large commercial washer and dryer machines against one of the outer walls. I feel a little guilty for spending the day trying to fly an aircraft, one with the propeller in entirely the wrong place, seeing all of the work that the others have accomplished today, but I also know that, should we need it, that skill will be a valuable one to have. The rest of the day passes with more sorting of equipment and finally removing the last parts of the centerpiece. The center is now clear for any purpose we desire. The smell of dinner being warmed up wafts through the building as our small group meets again. Robert is off talking with Michelle and I wave him and Bree over. I want them to be a part of our meetings as you never know what learning they'll garner. I plan to take some time with them for additional training when things settle into a semblance of equilibrium and after their initial training with Lynn. Did we get everything we need to start tomorrow? I ask as we draw together. As near as I can tell, Bannerman answers. Of course, there will always be odds and ends we find we need along the way. Nicely done, I say with the others nodding. Lynn, I ask, wanting to hear her report. I finish with what I think preliminary training should encompass. It's a scaled-down version of boot camp without the breaking-down phase. I'm emphasizing weapons training, tactics, and conditioning, along with a survival phase, she says. Great. Need any help with it? I ask. Well, I did put together a secondary training course that I want everyone to go through at some point. You can help with that. It'll be more of small-unit tactics, stealth, and small-unit leadership. She answers. I haven't put together any of the nightly training as of yet, but we'll make an announcement for folks to be prepared to teach a class in something they know. Excellent, I say. And you? How did your day go? Lynn asks. Yeah, well, it was uh, interesting. It'll take some time before I'm comfortable, and I'll leave it at that. I plan to be back up there tomorrow and take Red Team with me, so if we need help anywhere, give us a call, I answer. Frank, what do you have? We tested the radios and were able to communicate with teams out to a considerable distance today, so we should be good. We located some maps of the area and have them tacked down on a table by the radios. We'll be able to keep track of the teams and people, Frank answers. Now make sure we have teams report in hourly and the drivers report leaving and arriving at each location, I add. 
I'll brief everyone, Lynn says. Oh, we might want to pick up some chainsaws along with oil and gas. We'll need to cut down the trees away from the wall so the night runners can't climb them and vault over, I say. Bannerman picks up his well-used pad and pen to make a note. I think we should also rotate the teams out, gathering supplies with the standby team. Oh, sounds good to me, Dreskel says. Is there anything I missed or that we need to talk about? I ask. I think we're good, Bannerman says. I can't think of anything, Lynn replies. Dreskel and Frank shake their heads. We adjourn and I walk up to the roof, sitting on the same pipe as before. Robert and Bree join me. We sit in silence and watch the sun drop below the trees to the west. The mass of vehicles below us are mostly out of sight, hidden by the roof edge. The roof edge, I think, gazing across the grass fields surrounding the parking lots and stretching to the trees in the distance. I make a mental note to talk with Bannerman about putting an overhang over the edges so the night runners can't scale the sides. I still don't know how they managed it, but I put nothing past their abilities anymore. I'm sure there will be more surprises in store, and I hope we'll be able to meet them. The shadows of the evergreens in the distance spread across the fields below us, marking the slow transition of day toward night. I think about the lots below us filled with night runners as the darkness envelops us. I wonder how long they will continue coming to this building if they aren't able to get in. Are they able to recognize and understand defeat, gradually drifting away and stop trying? Do they know to stop trying? How intelligent are they? Or will their persistence remain? and continue with their nightly attempts because they don't know any other way. Do they feel compelled to continue? These thoughts drift through my mind as the sun sinks lower in the sky and behind the mountains. I enjoy being up here at this time of day with Robert and Bree, and would like to make this a nightly ritual, a time for just us to be together. The sun slides down behind the mountains, sending a last ray across the orange-lit horizon. That signals that our time of the day has gone, and the time of the night runners has begun. We stand as one and bid the day farewell, each in our own way. After sealing the doors closed, we head to the restaurant for dinner. I pass by Bannerman and mention the roof edges. As with the nights before, our evening meal becomes momentarily interrupted by the first of the attempts by night runners. The resounding echo reminds us that we're far from being out of danger. The night passes like the others. The noise from the night runners as they slam into the doors almost has a rhythm to it, rising and falling as if the rhythm itself were alive. Several louder ones startle me during the night, but I'm able to get a semblance of rest. The next day starts like the last one. I rise and see Lynn going about the teams, waking them for their morning training. I'm tired, but don't have the exhausted feeling I've had on prior mornings. Lacing my boots up, I wonder just how long I'll be able to put up with these cots. After rubbing the sleep from their faces, everyone gathers their gear and heads down the stairs. With the morning training complete and a bite to eat, I gather up Red Team. Lynn catches me just as we're leaving. Jack, would you mind heading to the aircraft to see if, well, just see if the note is still there? She asks, taking me aside. Of course, hon. I pull her close and hold her tight. There's so much more I'd like to say, but we understand each other and there's nothing that needs to be said. We begin our journey north for a repeat of yesterday. Well, hopefully not an exact repeat. The day is almost a complete replica of the day before, with the exception that a few high wisps of clouds sweep across the blue background. Those high, innocent wisps indicate a front trying to move in. It may mean our test to see how clouds affect night runners might be coming soon. Or maybe the high pressure over us will win out, and we'll be blessed with more warm, sunny days. The helicopter sits on the ramp where I left it, or, some might say, deposited it, yesterday. 
It sits as if inviting me to another round. I gather my things and trudge over in order to make another attempt to master my skills. Going through the checklist again, the rotors overhead respond as if accepting the challenge. I feel a touch more comfortable, but am still hesitant, remembering some of yesterday's lovely experiences. I roll the throttles up and feel the vibration increase. Lifting up, I feel the skids go light, like the many times before, only this time I don't go shooting across the ramp. Working my way through pedal turns and some forward and back moves, I lift higher off the ground and work on other maneuvering. After a point, it's better to have altitude for maneuvering to give a little more margin for error. Of course, if I was to make an error requiring said altitude, then I'm pretty screwed anyway. I get the hang of it after a bit, using the term getting the hang of it liberally, but I find I can maneuver. I practice turns, climbs, and basic maneuvers. I maneuver around the airfield before setting it back down with a thump. Yeah, I'll have to work on my landing some. The others gather around and we eat a bite with the sun climbing toward its zenith, casting warm rays of sunshine on our shoulders. Is there anything on the radio? I ask Gonzalez as she and the rest of Red Team draw near. And nothing much, sir, she answers. Just teams reporting in and drivers calling out their locations. Good. Let's finish up with lunch and enjoy a moment. I'll refuel and then see if I can get this beast back to Cabela's, I say. Before we leave, though, I would like to pop into one of the squadron buildings and see if we can find some manuals. Can I go with you when you fly down? Robert asks as we open our rations and lean against the Humvee together. I'm glad to see he has the same adventurous spirit as I do, but I also know that he wants to take every opportunity to learn. He's a lot like me in that way. He always wanted to try new things and never hesitated when I suggested something where he thought he would learn. I feel stuck here, though. The feeling stems from the great sense of loss for Nick and knowing I could never go through that again. Even though it's been a short time, our situation has forced some of those deep feelings of grief down. On the other hand, I want him to have experiences and I have to balance my protective nature against his need to learn. This seems to come up too many times, and I still don't have the right answer. Okay, you can go, I say. We finish our meager lunches. Robert and I head off for one of the fuel trucks parked adjacent to one of the open brown hangars. The fact that we're toting M4s in our hands is really the only surreal thing I feel at this moment. The quiet of the fort and surrounding area doesn't seem as unreal as we walk across the light gray pavement, feeling the warmth rising from it. I'm sure that aspect will rise again in some instances, but with the progress we've made and our days spent in this new world, I seem to be getting used to the quiet. My mind is no longer telling me that there should be a tremendous amount of noise associated with what my eyes are seeing. We drive the truck over, talking about the day and other ordinary topics, with Robert wanting to know what it was like flying the Kiowa. Describing the differences I noticed, we set up the fuel line and refuel. He asks questions, trying to fit the answers within the frame of reference he has with the 130. And in a way, it's very similar, but as touchy as anything, I say as we finish up. Yeah, I kind of noticed, he says with a small smile. Yeah, you too? Well, it was pretty funny. That's, of course, after we figured out you weren't going to take out everything else around you, he replies with a chuckle, remembering. You took off to the side like you had a rubber band attached. I snicker, imagining his perspective. There's an apprehensive tone to our conversation because we subconsciously realize we're about to enter an unknown building. I know if we have to penetrate too far in, I'll just call the whole thing off. The info within is not as important as what we needed from the CDC. I'm hoping we can find something just inside the building. We'll be able to use the helmets we took from the HC-130, so I don't need an equipment room, but who knows where I'll be able to find a manual without going deeper inside. I stand at the Humvee with the others after dropping the truck back at its location. Shading my eyes from the overhead sun, I glance at the various buildings. 
I know the Air Force bases put the squadron buildings next to the ramp, and I'm hoping the Army did the same. That way we won't have to play Find the Building as well. The glare from the sun prevents me from reading any of the signs by the tan buildings. Uh, none of you would know which would be the squadron or wing building, would you? I mean the battalion or regiment building, I ask the others while facing the buildings, as if the answer will shout forth from them. I'm actually studying the buildings to see if I can denote which one it could be. Uh, no, sir, they all respond. Well, let's go have a look, I say, picking one likely candidate. We check our gear and make our way across the ramp toward the nearest building. The day is becoming quite warm, the kind where the stillness and heat lends itself to a peaceful day spent lying on a bed of grass near water, napping and lazing the time away. I notice an aviation battalion sign outside of the first building we come to, so I'm drawn to explore that one first. The first-story building is the usual concrete block building found on most bases and forts, and is painted in the familiar light brown. It features one large window on the left, with the blinds pulled down, and a set of darker brown double doors near the center. The rest of the building is just the featureless concrete block. Pulling up to the doors, I peek inside a small window inset into them. There isn't enough residual light inside, so whatever is behind is hidden from sight. I test the door on the left, and find it swings open with a light pull. Henderson and Denton have taken up a position in front of the doors and off to the side, with their weapons, while not quite to their shoulders, ready to be brought up quickly. Gonzalez and McCafferty stand ready by the far doors, and Robert stands behind me. I swing the doors open, not really expecting anything to come rushing out, at least in the form of a night runner, but our readiness stems from our need to be constantly alert for anything. It's good to keep in that mode regardless of the situation, and it helps to reinforce the training as well. We're becoming closer as a team, and little exercises like this, even if unnecessary, are important in that regard. Nothing comes rushing out, but we're alert for any sound. In times prior, there were instances of shrieks or movement with the opening of doors, giving us a clue that night runners were inside. We're attuned to listening for those first sounds of surprise as we intrude upon their domain. The building radiates the same quiet inside that it shows outside. The light penetrates through the open door, showing the first few feet of a cream-colored linoleum floor. Particles of dust, disturbed by the opening of the door, dance in the sunlight just above the surface of the floor. Just past the door... A gloom fades to a deep black farther in. Air from the cooler interior brushes lightly against me as it pours outside. It carries a musty odor, but it is only the scent of disuse rather than the stronger body odor of any night runners. The tiled floor has a light coating of dust on the surface, and I can't discern any tracks or other marks. Within the gloom, I am barely able to make out wooden equipment racks, with helmets resting on top of locker-style cabinets below. Stations to test the helmets reside just inside the door to the left and right. From all appearances, the room is fairly open, with the lockers occupying most of the space. A wall to the immediate left extends about twelve feet inside, before opening more to the left past its end. It's pretty apparent that this is an aviation equipment room, and I'm hoping there is an operations desk somewhere inside with manuals. I would check the lockers close by, but I never kept the actual manuals in my equipment locker, so I wouldn't expect others to either. I'm hesitant to even go inside, as it is darkened and the possibility of night runners looms large. There aren't the usual signs, but that doesn't mean there aren't any. Are we waiting for something, sir? Gonzalez asks from across the doorway. I'm just listening, and not really sure that we should even venture in. The manuals aren't that important, I answer. She peeks her head around the corner of the door and looks in. We should be okay in there, sir. Okay, but we confine ourselves to this room. Any noise or sign of this building being inhabited and we're out immediately, I say. Hoo-wah, sir, 
She responds with a grin, knowing how much I like hoo Henderson and Denton, take the right side. Gonzalez and McCafferty straight ahead. Robert and I will cover the left. We'll be on NVGs. Check your radios and one in the chamber, I say, taking a breath. The familiar tension of entering a darkened structure builds. I'm hoping there will come a time when we can just leave the dark buildings alone and let the night runners have them. Of course, that'll most likely only happen when the buildings fall down with age, and that is a long ways off. Perhaps we'll knock them down when we gather everything we need from them, or at least the ones near us. It's part of a denying the night runners a sanctuary strategy that runs through my mind from time to time. I have no hope of ever clearing them entirely, or having some take-back-the-country idea. That would be impossible with our current personnel, and the immensity of that kind of undertaking is mind-blowing. We just need our own little place in which to be safe, and in which to grow. We don our goggles and make sure our radios are working. I nod. Henderson and Denton dart in the open door to the right, coming to rest a few feet inside, focusing on the right. Robert and I enter hard on their heels, kneeling where the wall makes a corner and continues to the left. I feel the grit from the dust under my boots and take note that it could be slippery in places. Gonzalez and McCafferty enter, and I both feel and hear them draw to a stop behind. The door slowly closes and shuts with a subdued clink. Vision is now limited to the green glow of our goggles. I peek around the corner and see a wide aisle between the start of the lockers to the right and a wall to my left. The lane extends the length of the room, ending at a chest-high counter that begins at the wall and runs along my line of sight. A large whiteboard fills the wall behind the station, which I hope is the operations desk. If so, then my search for the manuals may be a short one. A fraction of light emits from the blind-covered window at the desk, illuminating part of the whiteboard and countertop. Two doors open up to the left, with large paned windows set in the wall beside them. Okay, folks, we're heading to the counter to my front. We'll stagger with Robert and me in front, clearing the aisles to the right and offices as we go. Gonzalez and McCafferty, you follow behind, watching to the right. Henderson and Denton, follow and cover the rear, I say quietly into the radio. Copy that, sir, Gonzalez whispers. Got you covered, sir, Henderson says. I turn to Robert at my shoulder. Stay right behind me and cover the aisles to the right. Make sure you watch the top of the lockers as well. I have the front and offices to the left. Okay, Dad, I got gotcha, you, Robert replies. I edge up to the first plate glass window, feeling the dust slide under my boots as I glide along. It has the same feeling as being in a tomb long ago forgotten. I guess I'm not as used to the feeling of everyone being gone as I thought. My mind is still associating all that I see with activity, and the lack of it causes a small disconnect. The chill in the air, after the warmth outside, adds to the feeling of being in a place that doesn't seem to want me in it. It's like the interior is also traumatized by the same feeling of being left alone and abandoned, and merely wants to be left in its pain. Peeking in the corner of the glass, while keeping my senses in tune with the surrounding environment, I look for any sign of night runners within the small office— the only thing inside is a desk wedged in the small enclosure, various papers and a calendar littering the desktop. Besides a chair behind and two in front of the desk, the office is empty. A quick check down the aisles across from me shows them clear as well. Our best early warning system will be noise, and I heighten my senses along those lines. If night runners were to emerge from the aisles without us being prepared— will be quickly overwhelmed due to the close proximity with which they would become visible. The ops desk is only about forty feet away, but it seems both closer and farther. The light from the window should give us some protection once we reach it. I slide to the next window, listening to the soft sounds of movement behind me as the others move up. The building is deathly quiet and the sound of our boots sliding across the grit on the floor and soft sound of cloth rubbing together sounds unnaturally loud within the room. 
I edge up to the next office and peek in to find the same. A small desk with accompanying chairs and a scattering of paperwork. I edge quietly up the main aisle and past the aisles formed by the lockers, checking each lane as I come to them. The only sight is where pilots would gather their last thoughts prior to heading out for their flights, places where they would think about the upcoming mission while gathering their gear, a chance for a short time alone, wrapped in a bubble with others gathering their gear nearby, to finalize thoughts for the flight ahead. So far, so good. Our scent hasn't aroused any night runners. There's no sound of anything scuffling about, and no shrieks of discovery. That doesn't mean they aren't lying in wait or farther in the building, but we seem to be clear for now. The distinct locker room smell that I've associated with a group of night runners is absent. That doesn't mean I can relax my guard. We're in their territory, and I've been surprised far too many times to relax inside a darkened building. The tension is strong. My senses wrap tight around me with a part of my mind still questioning the decision to enter. The one good thing is that I don't feel the sense of the room closing in and waiting with bated breath. There's still the aspect of a weight within the darkened room, but it doesn't feel like an explosion waiting to happen. It doesn't feel like we're being watched. I approach the counter and look behind it. A jumble of papers are littered across the surface, with a microphone sticking up in their midst. This has all of the appearance of an operations desk with a base radio. The whiteboard is covered with markings and associated call signs. The wide aisle we were in heads to the right in front of the counter to a set of swinging double doors that lead farther into the structure. Robert turns to orient himself in that direction as I head around the corner to get behind it. I'm guessing there should be some manuals around the desk somewhere to assist pilots with any emergencies they encounter. The ops desk would assist the pilot in distress as needed. I open the blinds and sunlight streams through the window, casting its light about the operations desk, brightening the entire desk area. It's light enough that I can remove my goggles and see clearly. I only turn them off and raise them, wanting them ready just in case. Waving the others over to the desk, we crowd behind it. I begin looking through drawers that line the desk, eventually finding a set of hard-covered manuals in a large file drawer. I heft them out and lay them on the desk. I'm about to pick them up and stow them as best I can while having my M4 clear when a sudden noise interrupts my action. It's a muted thump that comes from beyond the doors leading farther into the building. All eyes turn in that direction, with the small metallic clicks of weapons being raised. I don't see anything in the gloom, and any visibility through the small glass windows in the swinging doors is obscured by darkness behind. I strain, listening for further noises, but there is only silence. The thump was quick, and may only have been a book or something falling at the wrong time, the quiet that follows almost makes me believe I didn't hear it in the first place. But I know I did, and have to keep that uppermost in my mind. I'm about to lower my M4 and think, once again, of how to carry the binders out when a loud thumping sounds from the other side of the entryway. It's muted by the closed doors, but it sounds like feet running in our direction. At least it has the rhythm of feet running. In my mind, there's nothing else it can be. The soft slap seemed to be nearing quickly. My heart gives that first pounding shock of adrenaline being released. The way back to the outside door now seems farther away, especially with the narrow aisles close to our escape route. If night runners make it inside with any numbers, and we're caught along that path, this day will come to a short close. We're in fairly close quarters and cramped with all six of us behind the desk. We can't all cover the door. We'll be trapped here if the light streaming in the window isn't enough to keep the night runners at bay. While it seems like minutes with multitudes of thoughts flowing through my mind, it's only seconds. Robert, get the window open, I whisper, getting his attention and nodding to the window behind us.
Henderson and Denton, cover the area we came through. McCafferty, you have the tops of the lockers. Gonzalez and I will cover the doors. There's a shifting of positions as we rearrange our positions. Henderson and Denton lean across the counter, pointing their M4s down the aisle we traversed. McCafferty also aims across the counter, but stands to have better visibility over the tall lockers. Gonzalez and I line up next to each other, aiming at the swinging doors. We turn our laser aiming sights to the visible spectrum, and the thin beams of light reach out and dance about the room. The pounding heading our way seems to shake the walls and structure, but it could also be just the thumping of my heart and the adrenaline flowing throughout my system, enhancing my senses. There is no doubt, though, that vibration is being sent through the concrete floor underneath the linoleum and to the soles of our boots. It doesn't sound like a horde coming our way, but there is definitely something, and coming fast. How's that window coming, Robert? I say over my shoulder, realizing I've barely given him enough time to do anything. Everything seems both speeded up and slowed down. I'm getting it, he answers. The swinging doors burst wide open, startling me even though I was expecting it. Two night runners sweep in and give a loud shriek upon discovering us behind the counter. They come to an abrupt stop, their pale faces barely outlined in the gloom. Two others enter behind. They seem hesitant to come fully into the light and stand with their heads thrust forward, screaming. One thin beam of light centers on the head of the night runner to the right as Gonzalez centers her aiming sight. The muted cough of her M4 firing mixes with the shrieking of the night runners, the flash lighting up the room and signifying that rounds are on the way. The bullets streaking outward intersect with the fine dot of her light. Where her light is focused, an explosion of blood fans outward. The first round hits just beside the nose, shattering the cheekbone and fragmenting the projectile. The splintered shell then tears through the sinus cavity, destroying the internal structure and bone behind. Splintering even more, the remains rip through the soft tissue of the brain, devastating the synapses and nerve centers within. The process of passing through the layers of bone takes some of the momentum away from the fragments, and they slam against the rear of the skull, coming to a rest. The night runner's head snaps back from the force of the impact. A subsequent round from the burst hits on the left brow as its head is knocked backwards, ricocheting off the heavy bone structure and into one of the swinging doors. The others pass overhead. The night runner drops straight to the floor as if its legs suddenly forgot how to stand. My rounds leave the barrel in a similar flash of light and strike the night runner to the left, forcibly impacting it right under the nose. The splash of blood mingles in the air with that of its partner. The bullet shatters the front teeth and upper jaw before arcing downward through the softer tissue of the palate and back of the throat. It smacks into the vertebrae with tremendous velocity, severing the spinal column and creating a large hole in the back of the neck. Tissue and blood spray behind the night runner as, with its head lolling to the side, it is catapulted into the arms of its compadre behind. I've got the window open, Robert yells behind me. Okay, head outside. McCafferty, you're next. Henderson, Denton, follow. We've got the rear, I yell, bringing my aiming point onto the next night runner as it tosses the one thrown backwards to the side. Gonzalez's carbine coughs its deadly load once again, taking down the remaining night runner on the right. It staggers backward under the onslaught of steel colliding with its body, the steel winning out over flesh and bone. It collapses against the back side of a locker before slumping to the ground. I give the trigger a slight pull with the sound of scrambling behind me. The last night runner looks up from moving its propelled pack member to the side, only to be met with an additional onslaught of rounds tearing into its face. It leaves its feet and hits the swinging doors with the back of its blown-out head and its feet in the air. The thud of the night runner slamming into the door signals the end of the shrieks pouring through the room. The doors swing back toward their closed position, remaining partially open, with their edges coming to rest against the night runner corpse lying between them. I'm out, McCafferty calls.
I hear additional scrambling from Henderson and Denton as they make their way to the window. Reaching over, I pat Gonzalez on the shoulder and point to the area on our right, indicating to cover there. She wheels and her laser light moves across the room to settle on her new coverage area. The only sound in the room is the scrambling of our team climbing out the window. The rest of the room resumes the silent introspection it had before, not even acknowledging the quick engagement within its walls. Do you think there were only four? Gonzalez asks. It would appear so, but we can't be sure. I would think that if there were any others in here, they would have come running with the shrieks, I answer. We're out, Denton calls in the window. Okay, you're next. I've got this, I say to Gonzalez. I shuffle back toward the window after she disappears from my peripheral. I now have to cover the entire area, and that's easier done from a corner of the room. The silence within is surprising, as many of our past experiences have shown that night runners mass in large packs. My psyche thinks that there must be a lot more present, but there's a part of me that's thankful they're still running in small groups. That, of course, is a two-edged sword. If they were in massed packs, it would make fewer places they were in. The smaller groups mean that there will be more buildings inhabited. I'm not sure which I prefer. Well, this was a pretty quick engagement, and the massed packs are overwhelming, so maybe the preference isn't so hard after all. I'm out, sir, Gonzalez calls. I turn, hand Gonzalez my carbine and the binders, and scramble out of the window onto the ramp. The warmth outside, even in this shaded part of the building, is almost desert-like after the coolness of the building. Next time I suggest something stupid like that, thump me over the head. I take my M4 back. I'm on it, sir, Gonzalez says, but that was a no-brainer and a breeze. Is everyone all right? I ask. They all do the instinctive pat-down before nodding. Okay, let's get out of here, I say. See you back at base, sir, Gonzalez says, as they march off toward the Humvee. Are you ready? I ask Robert as I watch the others cross the ramp, obviously telling war stories by the way their hands are moving as they talk. Yep, he answers. Okay, let's get a move on then. We head for the helicopter sitting on the ramp as if it's wondering what happened inside. I notice the feeling of... What have we gotten ourselves into has diminished to a degree as if what just happened inside was a natural occurrence. It didn't feel like a natural occurrence while it was happening, but in the aftermath, the return to normal is quick. Granted, it was a small skirmish, but the adrenaline was up, and a skirmish is a skirmish. It brings back memories of the past where we'd run mission after mission and have the feeling that each was just another one. We'd be back having a beer, and while talking about it some, it would seem more like just another day than a mission. We climb into the cockpit, with the sun seeming to speed across the blue sky. Strapping in, I run through the checklist. The rotors are soon turning in a blur overhead. I worry again about having Robert with me, but mentally shrug and pull up on the collective doing my best to keep the helicopter within the boundaries of the fort. The ground falls away as we gain altitude. The slight yet constant vibration is much different than the shaking of the 130. The vibration of the 130 seemingly comes from all over, where this one feels a touch side to side and up and down. I bank out toward the north and McCord. Where are we going? Robert shouts across the small space between us. His air sense lets him know immediately that we're headed in the wrong direction. We're running an errand for Lynn. He merely nods. I see the two one-thirties, one sitting in its solitude of retirement and the other keeping it company, parked on the ramp where we left them. They fill our screen as I descend in front of them. I want to give plenty of leeway as the helicopter is still prone to launch itself in random directions. I ease down until a bump and the rocking of the skid signifies contact with the ground. I then ease the collective all the way down and we settle securely on the hard surface. Debris and dust are blown outward from our rotor wash. The ramp used to be cleaned often, but the lack of attention has allowed dust to gather. 
This will be something to think about in the future, as foreign objects can cause quite a bit of damage if ingested in the engines, or can cause harm being blown around. I shut down with these thoughts cycling through my mind. Plus, the reason I'm here. I feel bad for Lynn with her brother and mother not showing up, especially seeing she knows they were alive after the shit hit the fan. I feel like it's my fault in a way after getting her spirits up telling her about them. That almost seems worse in a way. Well, someday we may have the opportunity to find out, I think, eyeing the 130 off our nose as the rotors wind to a stop. I see what looks like a sheet of paper over on the base ops door and walk over. Taped to the door inside an upside-down plastic sleeve... Lynn has written a note for her family, but it's also directed toward anyone else who reads it. It still seems secure with the copious amounts of duct tape she used. I turn back to the ramp, wishing that Craig and Lynn's mom were here for her, and hoping they're okay. We climb into HC-130. I just want to see inside it once again, which seems to welcome us back as we enter. Being inside the aircraft, which saw us through our previous adventures and kept us safe throughout, gives me a melancholy feeling. The familiar smell brings back the remembrances of what we went through such a short time ago. The memories have faded to a degree, but being inside is a reminder of how far we have come, and, with that, of also how far we have yet to go. As we exit... I mentally give another thanks to the aircraft for seeing us safely through. We jump back in the helicopter and start it up. Being inside the 130, the gorgeous day, and being next to Robert brings a feeling of peace, replacing the melancholy feeling I had moments ago. It's close to the feeling I used to have as we were loading up the Jeep for a day on the mountain bikes or some other adventure. The feeling of peace, calm, with the excitement that comes with the beginning of the day and the pleasure of being in each other's company. The speeding rotors signify the helicopter is ready for another attempt at flight. We lift off into the blue of the sky, which has a bleached look to it. The high, wispy, horse mane clouds have pushed farther to the north and inland, indicating that the front is slowly winning out. I tuck that away and just enjoy the moment. The vibrations course through the soles of my boots on the anti-torque pedals. The ground peels away as we gain altitude and bank over the base. The brown buildings below us, nestled between the brown fields and strips of gray roads, pass beneath. There becomes a disassociation with the ground as we fly overhead, the place no longer feels or looks like a ghost town as it does when driving through it. While the lack of movement does still seem odd, it doesn't seem as much so. Of course, that may be the battle I have keeping this beast airborne versus its desire to find the closest tree and park in it. We hook up with I-5 and start south. I would love to do a map-of-the-earth flight, flying the contours of the land at a very low level, and always envied the rotor heads that ability. However, my skills are far from attempting it. I always enjoyed those helicopter flights when we would sneak in on insertions, but I was always in the back. I always thought it would be so cool to fly like that. We would fly quite low in jets and in the 130, but it's not the same. Turning south, I spot movement on the interstate below, it's one of the semis carting a load of concrete partitions and heading the same direction. Actual movement on the highway does seem strange after seeing the empty lanes for so long. It wasn't actually that long ago, but it sure seems like it. The sight warms my heart that we're making progress, but it's also another reminder that we've only just started. Four miles of wall to build. What an undertaking, I think, as we pass over the truck. I look ahead and see a large line of dark smoke billowing into the sky. I'm guessing it's coming from the burning of the neighborhood tracts. Ideally, I would like to have gone through each place to pull supplies and such, 
Things like light bulbs, food, tools, etc. But we just don't have that luxury. The bacteria and diseases that will spawn from so many bodies is a real threat to our survival, as much, if not more, than the night runners. The roof of Cabela's, along with its green awnings, quickly comes into view. The brown and olive drab of parked Humvees and other vehicles provides a stark contrast to the dark paved lot they're sitting on. Large pieces of equipment are off to the east side of the lot. Three large cranes are the most noticeable among them, and I already see that some of the partitions have been put in place. It's begun. Landing in the parking lot, which again is more of an arrival than a landing, I see I was mistaken when I thought the equipment were all cranes, because I now see that one of them is a pile driver. Now where did Bannerman find one of those? I think, waiting for the rotors to wind down. Great idea, though. The group working on the wall are hammering tall I-beams into the ground and sliding the partitions in between. I wonder where Bannerman located those as well, I continue thinking, noticing a tremendous pile of them off to one side. The slots in them look like they're just wide enough for the concrete slabs, which are stacked in an area beside them, to slide into. The noise of the pile driver hammering the steel beams into place gives a sense of normalcy, the sight of man-made objects and the corresponding noise we were accustomed to. I'm once again reminded of what a good team we have. I walk in and the noise of hammering continues. Only this time it's the supply teams building plywood partitions on the second floor. It's only mid-afternoon, but the number of changes make it seem like I've been gone for several days. I let Frank know we're back and join with the others to lend a hand with the interior building project. The plywood partitions are to create small rooms to give everyone a little more privacy. It's a temporary solution, but it's better than all of us just lying on cots in the middle of the floor. It comforts the psyche as well and gives a sense of permanence, which helps us mentally cope with all that's going on. It gives a sense of future. The rest of the day passes fairly quickly with the partitions mostly finished and progress made on the perimeter wall. All teams fold back into our haven as the sun hits the top of the trees and we meet again prior to dinner. Now, how's the training program coming along? I ask Lynn once we settle in together. I'm not quite ready. I'll need a couple of days yet. I would like to get a bulldozer to build a berm for a firing range, she responds. I'll see what we can come up with. Bannerman makes a note. How are the supplies holding out? I ask Bannerman. Hey, we're doing okay. We could use some additional food, though, he answers. Okay, I think Red Team is slated for one of the supply teams. Are we slated to go with Alpha or Bravo? Alpha, Lynn answers. All right, we'll make a supply run tomorrow if that's what you had in mind, I say. Hey, that sounds good. We were also able to put an overhang on the roof. Bannerman says. A good deal, I reply. We managed to get about 60 feet of wall built today. That will increase in the coming days. We had to get everything set up first, and that took a while. Bannerman addresses the group. Awesome. Where'd you get that pile driver, by the way? And great idea with the I-beams, I say. Now, we found in a construction yard along with the cranes... The beams were there as well, and they got me thinking. I thought we were going to have a tough time engineering a way to put the wall up in the first place, and it would take some time to figure out a way to make it sturdy. And here these were. It was actually rather simple, he says. Well, good job nonetheless, I say in return. I give a rundown of my day, and there's not really much to say after that. I asked Frank if he would keep track of the buildings we've been in for supplies so we can be more effective with our gathering. He said he'd mark them on the map. I also think about demolishing the buildings after we've finished with them, but save that discussion for another time. We break, and I head up to the roof with Robert and Bree, our now nightly ritual before dinner. That may change with the coming nightly training sessions, but I would like for this to remain. We just may have to figure out a different time of the evening. We chat for a while amongst ourselves, 
mostly small talk with Robert focusing on the short helicopter flight back and how much he wants to learn to fly it. I tell him it may be a while because I don't even know how yet. Bree says she's interested in learning as well, and I tell them they're welcome to study with me after their training with Lynn. I look to the edge of the roof and notice the thin steel plates that Bannerman had bolted into the concrete ledge lining the roof. They extend about five or six feet out from the roof's edge, which should, and I say should because you never know what the night buggers can accomplish, prevent anything from gaining access to the roof. Looking past the overhang, the partially completed wall stands tall, although only a short section of it is actually upright. It's a silent reminder of the changed world in which we find ourselves. It also stands in testimony to our endeavors and signals the start of a possible new beginning. The sun drops behind the mountains, bringing a refreshing coolness to the late evening. A breeze picks up and blows across our faces, feeling invigorating and energizing in a way. The last of the sun hangs above the line of mountains, as if trying to hang on to its dominance of the sky, trying not to lose its grip on the day before it is finally pulled down. The sun setting is our clue that time outside has come to an end. The night doesn't belong to us. It's time for the night runners to emerge, to prowl and hunt the streets. We rise with a sigh and climb down into the heart of the building. The entry doors have been secured, and the aroma of warm food drifts throughout. The murmuring that usually comes when a group of people are gathered rises and falls as conversations take place. There's movement as some transfer their stuff into one cubicle or another. This is so much better than traipsing around the world in a 130. As much as I'm not a fan of what happened to the world, I'm thankful we're here and safe for the moment. There's an underlying tension of knowing that could change in an instant, if the night runners find a way around the doors, for instance. But for this particular moment in time, it feels good. Tomorrow is another day, though, and each day brings a new challenge with it. Lynn makes an announcement at dinner regarding the nightly training sessions. We'll gather an hour prior to sunset and begin classes before dinner. They'll go anywhere from an hour to two, depending on what is being taught. The subjects will vary, and each night will have a different trainer. That may change depending on the depth of the training, and there may be times when a single class might extend over several days. She gives a synopsis of the day and summarizes our progress. She ends with the plans for tomorrow, which are basically the same as today, with the exception of the teams on supply duty and the one in reserve. She finishes as the first of our nightly chorus of poundings against our outside doors begins in earnest. Bannerman whips out his ever-present memo pad and jots down some notes. The shrieks are muted by the distance in the doors, but it is still very much noticed. Nonetheless, we down our meals, one team finishing and taking over for one of the two on guard. A Rolling Stone, Part 2 The next day rolls around the same as before, mostly with me not wanting to get up. The morning PT and training, and yes, I do join in, is a nice way to break the day in. We manage to get outside just after the breaking of dawn and exercise in the cool air of the morning. It's another training session that Lynn has lined up for us this one using one of the back rooms of the building for small room-clearing techniques. We practice until all teams move into the room like a fast-moving fog, quickly and quietly, but with force. We shower, doing the best we can with the limited facilities, and put some food in us before the teams separate on their various missions. Today, it's Red and Alpha's team's turn to gather food supplies. Frank found us a safe way just up the road that we might start with. Walking outside with the teams, I notice a high cloud cover has come over us. The sun shines opaquely through the milky white clouds. The morning still has the feel of a warm day, but there is a definite increase in the humidity. 
The rain won't be more than a day or two behind if the front continues to weaken the high pressure over us. We pile into two Humvees and a transport truck after checking over our gear and equipment one more time. The deep, throaty sound of the semis idling and warming up in the lot, light blue smoke rising from chrome stacks just behind the cab, echoes across the still morning. The breeze that sprang up the night before is absent. The sound of vehicles starting add to the noisy activity beginning to take place. A billow of dark smoke from the exhaust of a crane near the partially constructed wall indicates activity beginning on the wall as well. This is the daytime. It is our time, and we have to make the best use of it. We pull out just ahead of the trucks and other vehicles on their way north to commence gathering pieces for our perimeter wall. We add to the radio traffic, letting Frank know we're on our way. We'll call at our destination, which is only minutes away. The others will take twenty or more minutes to reach their areas. The convoy of vehicles parts at the interstate as we continue ahead along a five-lane thoroughfare. The traffic lights hang dark above as we pass through several intersections and arrive at the Safeway. The streets and parking lot are strewn with paper and other trash. It looks like the night runners partied at night and left their leavings behind. There are a few columns of lighter smoke in the area that drift lazily into the air. Some of the fires from the day prior are still burning in places. The smell of smoke almost overcomes the ripe odor of rot that has become predominant. Hopefully we can stay ahead of the game there, taking care of the bodies before disease has a chance to become rampant. As if in answer to my thoughts, several fire trucks pass by as we pull into the parking lot in front of the store. Exiting with the sound of the trucks diminishing into the distance, I call Frank with our arrival and examine the storefront. I was hoping it would be a glass front, as a lot of these store types tend to be. The glass front would allow a lot more light inside and would most likely be free of night runners, or at least help keep them somewhat at bay. No such luck. There are two entrance doors, one to the left of the store and one to the right, with several panes of glass beside them. But the rest of the store is concrete block. It'll be very much like the BX back in the Azores, with light extending a few feet inside by the doors, but the rest of the interior an inky black. We spray on the odor eliminator. I cradle my M4 and stroll to the door on the left. I'm not sure which door will be closest to the canned food aisle, and I want to see which one to use by taking a look inside. I feel my mind tighten down with our upcoming entry into a possible night runner domain. Our past experiences with that haven't been the most pleasant. My thoughts turn toward tactics and run through several eventualities. I contemplate our experience inside the BX. I can't think of a better plan than to establish a perimeter inside and have a couple of team members cart the goods out behind the perimeter. The aisles will limit visibility, and that'll be dangerous. The tension builds. It's similar to a high-tension wire strumming in a strong breeze. My senses are vibrating. There is the unknown and the knowledge that this will be repeated again and again until we become more self-sufficient. Approaching the doors on the left side, there is the unmistakable evidence of night runner activity. Shards of glass litter the concrete sidewalk in front of the doors. One of the side panes has been broken out. The pieces of glass are dispersed, so there isn't the telltale sign of footprints written in blood. Looking in the broken pane, shards are scattered across the white and black tiled linoleum floor. There is a very faint outline of footprints, but they appear old. That aside, the signs are unmistakable. This is like a neon sign with a blinking arrow saying, Night runners are here. There's a faint whirring at the door as the cooler air inside mixes with the warmer air outside. It carries a combination of mustiness and a rotting smell on the very light breeze. The radiant light streaming through the remaining glass doors and other pane cast a rectangular path of light about twenty feet inside. 
A gloomy gray extends a shorter distance past before the interior is swallowed up in darkness, like a vast black hole. No sounds come from inside, but I know that doesn't mean anything. I can barely see the end caps at the head of the aisles, but not down the aisles themselves. The others are gathered behind me as I look inside the establishment. The interior dictates a similar entry and formation as we had at the BX and the Azores, but we'll have to have a moving perimeter anchoring against the outside wall. The store opens up some to the left, and, unless we take the time to clear the entire side and still not know if the night runners can come around from that side, that's our best shot. We'll have to anchor around the door as well to preserve our path out of here in case something happens. I pull away. Dizziness takes hold, and I feel a moment of disassociation. Shaking my head to clear it, I turn to Watkins and the other team members. The sight of them standing in the parking lot with the sun shining through the opaque clouds seems a touch surreal, as if they all seem a little brighter than they should. The soldiers in their black fatigues with their tactical combat vests secured to the outside— each either cradling his or her M4 or grabbing it next to the lower receiver and holding it downward, their eyes all focused on me and the entrance, waiting for instructions, and the word go, are very sharp in my mind. Next to me, Robert looks much in the same manner as the others, a little too bright. It seems like a moment just prior to stepping through a time machine and into an unknown world— Shaking my head briefly, I orient my mind back to the mission at hand. The steel band tightens down. I send Watkins over to the door to get oriented to the interior as well, and he returns shortly. We haven't really worked together, but I'm not worried, as I've seen him work. I squat down on the pavement off to the side of the door and have everyone gather around. Here's the way I see it. I start the brief and begin by addressing Watkins. Chime in if you see something different or have other ideas. Watkins nods in response. First off, the gathering of food will not be a quiet venture, but we still need to keep the noise down as much as possible. Gonzalez, McCafferty, you'll be close to the entrance doors and secure the left side of our perimeter. We'll anchor everything to the outside wall closest to us as best we can. Henderson and Denton... You'll be on the far right. Watkins, I want you to follow in behind Robert and me, leaving a person at the end of each aisle. Save two to gather the food. Robert and I will take the last two aisles directly behind Henderson and Denton. Henderson and Denton, you clear each aisle as you come to it, wait for one of Alpha or ourselves to get into position, and then move on to the next aisle. We'll be able to cover six aisles that way. It's not much, but it's the best we can do. Any questions so far, or does anyone have something to add? No, sir, Watkins answers. I see he's back to the sir thing. Seems to be mission-oriented with him. Not that I mind either way, just continuing to notice. Okay, once we have the aisles covered, the two you assign will head down the first aisle and gather what you can. The one guarding that aisle will precede them up the aisle and follow them back down. Gather the food, deposit it outside, and then proceed to the next aisle. We'll get what we can and hope the first six aisles have something usable. If not, then we'll look to the other doors. If there's an inkling of any night runners inside, we're out. If we have to pull out, Henderson and Denton fall back to me. We'll then pull back and gather the next in line. Always keep your sector clear until you're pulled back and keep alert on the radios. Questions? I ask, almost needing oxygen. I think we're good to go, Watkins says. I rise and am struck again by the starkness of how everything looks. It's like everything is etched in the finest detail, but a little too bright. Watkins talks to Alpha and the team members, organizing themselves into the order of entry. We do a quick check of radios. We'll be using the broken pane for entry. The soft clicks of sights being turned on and carbines being charged are the only sounds. We're ready, and with the charging handles being released, the game faces come on and they focus earnestly. The curtain is about to rise.
Henderson and Denton line up just outside the entrance with Gonzalez and McCafferty right behind. Robert and I line up behind the women, and, behind us, the rest of Alpha gets ready in the order Watkins had assigned them. Go, I whisper ahead to Henderson, and he darts through the opening. He's followed immediately by Denton slipping through. Gonzalez and McCafferty disappear within the building, and I follow, snapping my goggles into place upon entering. The first thing that assails me is the nauseating stench within. It's the smell of rotting meat, milk, and vegetables. It hits like an invisible wall, and I just about gag right then and there. We may have to think about gas masks for future entries, as this can have a debilitating effect. Henderson and Denton are on their knees just inside the door to the right. Gonzalez and McCafferty are aligned in the same manner on the left. I tap Denton on the shoulder and point ahead. He and Henderson rise and move to the first aisle. Robert and I take the positions they vacated. Scuffling sounds from behind as the rest of Alpha enters. They push up to the first aisle and, with a touch, I direct Robert out to the right. I plan to follow along with Henderson and Denton until we come to our aisles of responsibility. You stay close to me until it's time to cover an aisle, I whisper to Robert. Okay, Dad, he whispers back. The store is set up like any other. Cash registers line the front of the store with a wide lane between them and the outside wall. Another wide area separates the goods aisles from the registers. Small change in plan. I whisper on the radio. Robert and I will proceed adjacent to Henderson and Denton along the front lane until we come to our aisles. Clicks on the radio let me know the others have heard and understood. I glance ahead and see a small band of light from the far end doors. My adrenaline is keyed up, and the darkness, showing green in our goggles, has that waiting feeling. I have a sense of night runners inside. The wretched smell of rotting goods is overwhelming any other scent inside the structure, so I can't tell if there's that telltale body odor scent. Another item to know, and it's not to our advantage. The weight of the interior presses around us. It's not quite as oppressive as being inside with only flashlights and complete darkness around, but it still weighs heavily. It's a feeling I know well. It's the feeling of an occupied building and you doing your best not to be found. Henderson and Denton clear out the first aisle and move up to the next. Robert and I rise an inch along in line with them. So far there isn't a hint of movement or sound. The building itself feels dark and empty. The abandoned feeling comes from the building itself rather than from a lack of occupants. There's tension in the air and it's not only coming from us, although there is a fair amount of that. A scuffle of boots indicates Henderson and Denton moving up to the third aisle. I keep my head on a swivel and see various laser aiming points move about the building. A stray beam will come over a covered aisle and streak through the interior, hitting the ceiling beams momentarily before disappearing. The third and fourth aisles are cleared, and then we're up. Robert and I cross through an open cashier lane and join Henderson and Denton. Robert takes his place at the end of the cleared aisle, and we move up. I stand in the next aisle only a few feet away. Henderson and Denton line the lane to the right. This is as far inside as we'll get. I ponder whether to take the reserve team off their duty and use them for supplies. We're not going to be able to clear an entire building of this size with only two teams— and by clear, I mean empty it of supplies. We'll need these places for more than food. Light bulbs will need to be replaced, toilet paper, all types of odds and ends. Being inside, I think we may need to wait to clear buildings of this size until after we've built the wall and we can bring all of the entire teams. I table that in the back of my mind. This is very different from sneaking around in buildings in times past. That was a very different philosophy altogether. Here, we have to keep a perimeter, and back then the perimeter was wherever we happened to be at any given moment. I glance at Robert, who is standing nearby, and he stares intently down the aisle and above him. Good, 
I think, while watching him. He remembers the lessons from the BX. Okay, Wadkins, we're in place. Start gathering items from the first aisle, I say, pressing the throat mic. Copy that, sir. The sound of a cart being wheeled slowly inside screeches across the interior, like a fingernail on a blackboard. I cringe at the noise, but it can't be helped. If we hand-gather the items, then we'll take forever, and I'd rather be in and out quickly if at all possible. I make another mental note to check the carts and maybe even have some oil on hand. I see two Alpha members disappear down the first aisle. The squeaks end, start, and end again as they venture down the aisle filling the basket. They eventually make their way back to the entrance door, repeating the process with the second, third, and fourth aisles. The two gathering goods come to Robert, and he heads down the aisle, disappearing from my view. I feel apprehensive about him being in here. I know he's a man, but he's also my kid. I don't suppose I'll ever get used to this. I trust him implicitly, but this is almost too much to bear. The sound of the cart being wheeled down the aisle does its start and stop as items are gathered. My heart is pounding within the confines of my chest. I want to be done and out of here. I can't believe we're going to have to do this so many more times. Our equipment makes it easier, but the stress of being inside a building that is possibly inhabited by night runners puts me on edge. I glance down my aisle and see a flash of movement past the opening at the end. A soft paddling of feet across the floor accompanies the quick darting of a shape across the opposite aisle opening. I immediately know what it is. A night runner. Night runners, I radio. Pull back. As if the radio call was a signal, shrieks fill the interior. Or perhaps they realize that they've been discovered and the game is up perhaps planning on trapping us within, but now their presence is known. The screams seem to come from everywhere at once, to the front along the back lanes, to the right from the depths of the store, to the left from the bakery and deli counters. I swear it even seems to be coming from above. A glance verifies it's just the incredible volume rebounding off the ceiling. Night runners pour into the aisle in front of me, and I hear a multitude of footsteps pounding across the floor to my right, the soft bark of M4s firing to my immediate right from Henderson and Denton verifies night runners in that direction. Their gunfire rises momentarily above the howling. The night runners streaking my way are packed shoulder to shoulder, and I fire a couple of bursts into their midst. The first two drop immediately and are pushed to the floor from the ones behind. Henderson and Denton are at my position, keeping us from being overrun from the side. Increased fire is testament that night runners are appearing in other locations as well. I fold back with Henderson and Denton to Robert's Isle. The two gathering items are backtracking as rapidly as they can, but are also blocking the exit. Robert is on the other side of them, firing quick bursts into the night runners, pouring into the aisle. How in the world did they get here so quick in the numbers they did? I think with a sense of urgency. Robert is closer to them, and trapped. Move it, I yell to the Alpha members that are moving much too slowly for my taste. Constant bursts of fire from Robert is keeping the night runners at bay for the moment, but there are more behind and he'll have to reload soon. Light flashes off the assorted goods on the shelf beside him from his rounds reaching out to the creatures in front. They drop in the aisle, forming a small mound, but others replace them as they push onward. He backs along with the other two, but the night runners are closing the distance. Stay here! I say to Henderson and Denton, who are kneeling at the corner of the aisle, dealing their form of destruction to any who come streaming out into the lane from the far aisles. The suddenness of the attack is startling and close to overwhelming. I direct Denton to cover the aisle I was in so they don't just round the corner on us and move into the lane. My son is up ahead, and although slowly moving back, he's clearly trapped. I take one step into the aisle and see his mag leave his receiver. He gropes for another at his vest pouch, and then they're on him. The foremost night runner slams into him and knocks him off balance. 
Another, just behind the first, runs into him and knocks him to the ground. They both go down on top of him and I hear him yell, startled, fearful, and perhaps in pain. They're on top of my son and bent over him. I lose it. Make sure everyone gets out, I yell to Henderson and become oblivious to everything else. I race up the aisle, replacing my own mag, passing the two backing quickly out. My focus is on the night runners bent over Robert. Time and motion slow. He's writhing under the two night runners on top of him as he tries to gain some leverage on them. They are too well situated and bent over him. I chamber the first round with a flick of the bolt release. I hear Robert scream in pain and feel the kick from my M4 as it delivers the first rounds. They streak out for the night runners, clawing and biting my son. The first bullets impact one of the night runners on top of the head, with the others entering the back of its head and back. A small splash of blood sprays outward from where the round hits on top, with a larger shower erupting into the air above it as my second round takes off the back of its head. It slumps down on top of Robert and rolls to the side. I quickly shift my aim to the next one, the thin beam of my aiming sight coming to rest on top of its head as well. Robert's hands are on the side of its head trying to keep it away, but I see his grip weaken. Light flashes and my next rounds are on the way. I'm oblivious to all else as my entire focus is on getting to Robert. Nothing else matters. A similar pattern of blood gushes from the second night runner as it slumps on top of Robert. Get up, I yell, sending another burst into night runners trying to take their fallen pack members' places. He tilts his head backward looking in my direction, but doesn't move any more than that. His goggles have been knocked clear and I see his wide eyes looking back at me with fear and pain written in them. A night runner goes down at Robert's feet, but another fills the gap immediately. I switch to semi in order to conserve rounds. Reloading will force me back, and I may lose him forever if that happens. And that's not going to happen. A rage built on fear erupted upon seeing my son go down, and now it builds even higher with the thought of being pushed back. I take steps forward, spitting out single rounds. A steel net of determination tightens down in my body. I will reach my boy. There is nothing that will interfere with that. Night runners go down as rounds strike their bodies, either injuring or putting them down for good. A mound of their bodies begins to build. The line of creatures is enabled to advance, but neither is there any room gained either. I step next to Robert's head and look quickly down. Can you get up? I ask, delivering another round into a night runner that is seeking to get closer. There is no response, but he continues to look up into my eyes. I see a large chunk of flesh has been ripped from his neck, and blood is spilling onto the floor near his head. Fear, panic, and anger continue to rage through my system but it is at a level below a form of calmness. It is the fuel that is keeping my ability, determination, and actions going. The overriding calmness, well, more actually of lack of emotion, is the source that directs my actions. They combine to create a wall that no night runner will break, a wedge between me and my son on the ground that nothing will overcome. The combination makes it so no other result is possible. I kneel beside him, continuing to deliver rounds into the waiting night runners, their screams echoing in my ears. I plan to drag Robert while keeping the creatures at a distance. I look down at his eyes quickly, locking with his gaze, and see the life leave his eyes. His head lulls to the side, and the pooling of the blood beside him slows. I reach quickly down, firing the single rounds one-handed into the mass just feet away. Feeling on the side of his ruined neck, I can't discern a pulse. No! I scream. The cry is enhanced by the terror and sudden grief. The emotion that was riding below the threshold erupts and rises far above the shrieks and sounds of firing already filling the interior of the building. 
I look up toward the entrance door and see the faint outline of light radiating in that direction. My vision centers on that small piece of light. The edges of my vision darken, forming a tunnel with the faint light centered within. I feel myself being pulled and stretched toward the light. I swoop toward the entrance as if being pulled through a tunnel, the light growing brighter as I draw closer. I'm suddenly standing outside, feeling slightly dizzy. Fear, panic, and grief consume me. I'm shaking my head to clear the dizziness. Looking around, I see the members from Alpha and Red Teams by me waiting for instructions. Most importantly, there's Robert standing beside me. I notice the clarity and the definition of the things around, and the aspect of it seeming to be overly bright is gone. Confusion reigns. But then I realize that everything that just happened was in my mind. It feels like waking from a nightmare and finding everything as it should be. You okay, sir? Watkins asks. Yeah, I'm fine. I say, shaking my head again. We're going to find some other place to shop. I don't know if this was a clairvoyant vision or a product of my own imagination, but there is no way in hell I'm going inside the store, especially with Robert. The grief still sits inside me, but it is overshadowed by an overwhelming relief that he's still okay. It could be that our senses are no longer flooded with a barrage of messages or external sensations, and our minds now allow for more subliminal aspects to filter in. We don't have to filter out so much noise, and that perhaps allows our minds to see better. Whatever it is, what I saw and felt was real to me, and we are not going inside. Whatever you say, sir. Watkins replies, Where are we going? We'll call Frank and see what stop and robs haven't been searched. We'll hit a few of those, I answer. I would mark this place as off-limits, but the vision, if you can call it that, may be limited to this space and time, and only with the associated people involved. We turn and head back to the Humvees, radioing Frank and gathering additional places to go, no one says anything, nor do I see weird looks. Anyone who has known combat or trained understands and appreciates those sixth senses, respects them. We always listen to those perceptions as they became another inherent sense while we were out on a mission. We spend the day hopping from one small market to another, filling the transport vehicle in the process. The stores we venture into are free from any night runner signs, and, staying cautious and alert, we don't encounter any within. The clouds thicken as the day goes on until the sun is merely a brighter glow in the sky. It looks like the front has won out after all. It's not cloudy or dim enough to worry much about the night runners yet, but, regardless, we make a call for the teams to be on their toes. I'm not happy about the soldiers driving their trucks being by themselves, but our limited manpower gives us no other option. Smoke billows in the distance throughout the day as the burn teams tackle another area. At times, when stepping out of the Humvee close to the large, rising column of dark smoke, I hear someone calling over the loudspeaker. The individual words can't be heard, but the sound is unmistakable. It's the team's calling out ahead of the burns to see if there are any survivors in the area. Only once do I hear the actual announcement. This area is scheduled for a burn. If there's anyone alive, we can provide shelter and food. If you need assistance, let us know in some way. Again, this area is scheduled for a burn. The voice then drifts off as whoever it is turns gets farther away, or something comes between us and blocks the rest. We return to our sanctuary with the day's light beginning to fade. The smoke from the fires is giving a yellowish-brown cast to the clouds and light. Two of the trucks, loaded with concrete partitions, 
pull in ahead of us and park by one of the cranes to offload. The teams with the wall have made tremendous progress, and the wall now stretches several hundred feet from where they started this morning. If we continue to make this kind of effort, we'll be finished long before the summer and good weather leaves. More importantly, we'll be finished when we still have longer days in which to get the rest of our place in order to prepare for the winter months. The priority is still with the wall, but I see our next will be keeping enough fuel on hand for the generator and to prepare for the eventuality of when we won't be able to use it. I still feel we're under the gun, but looking at this partially built wall stretching across the now torn up and dusty field gives me a sense of satisfaction. The feeling and experience I had earlier in the day still sits inside, and I'm thankful for it. It's a reminder that there's a fine line between the satisfied feeling I have now and the total mind-shattering grief it could have been. The next day is a repeat of the last, with the exception that the mission is centered on short-term fuel gathering and storage. Bannerman mentions the vast amount of diesel we're running through. The semis and cranes suck down a tremendous amount. We rig a fuse panel and insert it into the towed generator so we can hook into a main building bus panel. In that manner, we can utilize the gas stations. There are many fire stations in the area, and we pick up a couple of tenders, trucks designated to carry large amount of water, empty them, and pump diesel into them. We mark diesel on the side so that if we decide to opt for this solution for other fuels, we won't mix them up. I decide on using the fire trucks as opposed to tanker trucks, as they have the ability to both pump and siphon. The wall stretches farther by about the same amount as the day before when we arrive after the end of the day. Robert, Bree, and the other civilians we picked up start their training the next day. Bannerman found a bulldozer for Lynn somewhere, and long rows of dirt line one end of the field forming berm walls. She has her shooting range. The neighborhood burn teams have located and brought in four additional survivors. They were holed up in a barricaded house at the end of a cul-de-sac. They mentioned that they were running low on both food and water and were hesitant to venture forth to scrounge with their low numbers. This gives hope that there are others— and we'll continue to look for them as best we can. We open the doors the following morning to a cloudy and drizzly day. There is a hesitance on keeping the doors open, as I don't know how the cloud cover will affect the night runners. There aren't any in sight, but we delay the start to our day, sending patrols out to verify that the streets and outlying areas are indeed still ours. They return to report that there are no runners in sight, so our day proceeds. Robert, Bree, and the others begin their training under Lynn, with some help as needed by the standby team, which happens to be Red Team today. We discussed during last night's meeting that we should start working toward our long-term energy needs, so the supply teams are off to find solar panels. If they can locate them early enough in the day, and there's time, then they'll also start cutting back the trees from the wall and its intended route. They'll use the numerous blocks of C4 we pulled from the armories to blast out the stumps. The teams gathering the concrete partitions actually found another pile driver at a construction site and are driving it back. That should make the wall progress even quicker, as that is the most time-consuming part of building it. I talked to Bannerman about putting video cameras around the perimeter so we can see what's going on outside prior to opening the doors, even at night if we need to. I mentioned we could use the security cameras from the bases as they have infrared and low-light capabilities. He said he'll put that on his list of items for the teams to gather. Bree asks about freeing the zoo animals at one point during our evening on the roof together. I think about that for a moment and bring it up at the nightly meeting, which we now hold after dinner. My thought is that the animals would be dead after this long, but the discussion ends with us exploring the idea, perhaps sending a supply team up the next day to look and see what they can do. At one point during the nightly discussion, Frank talked about setting up the motion cameras, which are quite prevalent in the store, 
to track night runner activity. They flash and take a picture if something moves in front of the sensor. They're meant to indicate trail movement of animals for hunters, but it will serve our purpose. He wants to see what their activity is at night and track it. The exposure records time and date. Frank said he may be able to put together a picture of their nightly movements and see if there's any pattern. Lynn brings up that if we can discern a pattern or busier places, we can set up traps, trip wires with claymores being the most likely. We agree to have supply teams set up the cameras when they are out at places designated by Frank. They will check them and replace the digital storage every couple of days and move the cameras at the discretion of Frank. One additional detail mentioned is our water supply. With the generators, it's a no-brainer to power the pump and provide for our needs. However, when the fuel is no longer viable to run the generator, then we'll have to figure out how to draw the water. Although we have hopefully a year of fuel before it breaks down, that is short time when compared with the magnitude of the problem. I mean, we can haul water up from a river or creek with horses pulling a wagon with a water tank on it, but it'll be easier if we can engineer a solution with the well already in place. Windmills, such as the wind generators that are in abundance in the Columbia Gorge, seem to fit the bill. Engineering them to work with the pump and transporting them up will be the challenge, but it's a long-term viable solution. The days pass as we settle into a rhythm of sorts. The wall extends a great deal daily until it's almost beyond our line of sight. I notice the Night Runner's nightly attacks drop off to a degree, but they are persistent little buggers. I wonder if it's different packs each night or if they're the same ones hitting us periodically through the night. Another reason might be that they're either dying off or moving out of the area. Frank looks at the pictures brought in and recognizes several packs by their clothing. It seems they may have territories, but that doesn't hold true all of the time, as some cameras show the same packs roaming large areas. His guess is their food supply has dwindled. Some pictures show a new pack arriving, or a pack showing up only once, perhaps transiting an area. Traps are set in places that Frank indicates as high-movement areas. The teams are briefed extensively of the trap locations. We also set some outside some of the larger building entrances, where there are indications of night runners inside, in an attempt to clear the building out some prior to entering for supplies. Some have to be replaced when the teams are out and note that the traps have been triggered. Night runner bodies lie in the streets where they've been activated. Our doors hold up, and we check on the structural integrity daily. Solar panels are built on the roof, wired into a room we set aside for batteries, and wired into the main electrical panel. This gives us a respite from the generators that run almost continually during the days, and requires us to fill them with fuel on a regular basis. The generators are reset back into their original capacity to supply power in the event the batteries get low. The backup system is now measured by battery charge rather than a supply through the old commercial lines. Robert, Bree, and I continue to meet on the roof in the late afternoons just before our nightly training sessions. The training sessions themselves span a variety of subjects. I teach a two-day course on indoor search and rescue techniques. Others teach what they know about horses, growing vegetables, fixing engines, building cabinets, anything and everything, with more each night. The daily burns continue, and we find other people who trickle into our group and find their place, after first being introduced to Lynn and her training. The first training class with Robert, Bree, and the original group still progresses with Lynn becoming a little worried about Bree's intensity in the training. She's become, well, quite enthusiastic, Lynn mentions. That's a good thing, isn't it? I ask. But I know Lynn wouldn't say anything unless she was worried. Enthusiasm is great, and she has a lot of it, but there's an intensity and zeal involved. She's becoming a little harder inside. Well, I think we all need a little of that, but we'll keep an eye on her, I reply. 
I've noticed the changes in Bree myself. She's still ready with a smile, but there's an intensity and hardness in her eyes. I've noticed a change in Robert, too. The simple fact is, I've grown a little harder as well. This new world has changed us all. But losing Nick has put a harder place in the three of us. I wish it wasn't true, as Nick wouldn't have wanted it to be that way. But it is there nonetheless. I take some time during our days to visit Nick's place of rest and have a quiet moment with her. Talking with her and letting her know what we've been doing. I get the same flash of movement behind me as before when I drive out of the area and have an uncomfortable feeling of being watched. Stopping and backtracking, I still don't find what is causing the movement in my rear view. A search of the entire area doesn't reveal anything out of the ordinary. It's almost too bad the roads are blacktop and I can't look for tracks. I also spend a bit of time during the evenings with Robert and Bree, going over the helicopter manuals and studying the systems. Time is spent during the days when Red Team is on standby, learning to fly the helicopter and operate the systems on board, the top-mounted camera and equipment. I become efficient at maneuvering and using the systems, but not to the advanced degree I'd like. I feel comfortable down low now and nap of the earth flying. We send the supply teams up one day when we're well stocked to see if there is something that can be done for the animals at a zoo not far away. Since Bree mentioned this, it has been weighing on my mind. I feel bad for not thinking about it myself, but the stresses of our situation drove everything else from my mind. I brief the teams not to take any risks entering darkened buildings, but to do the best they can. If there's anything left alive, that is. It's been a long while for the poor, trapped animals without someone to feed them, so my hopes aren't great that many, if any, have made it. I also suggest that they free the prey animals first, if any are left, in order to give them a chance. Freeing the predators first, or in combination, will not be very helpful to the prey animals. I mean, it isn't really helping a gazelle if you free it, only for it to be brought down seconds later by a lion or a pack of wolves freed earlier. I feel this mission is an important one, as we're now caretakers of the world, and have a responsibility toward all life. Yes, I would feel this way for the night runners if they weren't constantly trying to eat us. The teams returned from the zoo mission to report that many of the animals were already dead in their cages or enclosures. In many instances, there was evidence of night runners gaining entry and killing them for food. There were few left alive, and the teams did the best they could for them. The birds were the largest in number left alive, and they merely cut the netting over the enclosures. There was nothing they could do for any of the aquatic animals, as most of them were already dead. The thought of these animals trapped and starving to death, or confronted with night runners, weighs heavily on me. The absolute unfairness of it. The one thing of note is there were several night runners lying in one of the bear enclosures, and the team engineered a solution for the animal to escape, and then they beat Cheeks out of there. The days turn into weeks, and we're blessed with good weather, and long days for the most part. Several days pass with rain showers, which slow the progress of the wall to an extent. We take breaks on days of heavy rain, of which there are only thankfully very few, as we don't want any sicknesses to break out. Being sick in this new world takes on a different connotation, as opposed to merely calling into work and lying back taking meds. We have some meds from our excursions, but try to limit exposing ourselves to risk. The longest day of the year is behind us, but our days are marked by the progress of the wall which grows longer with each passing day. We make the mile adjacent to the interstate and turn the wall to the west. We bring in and erect fuel storage tanks in a section of the fields close to the edge of the far parking lot to allow vehicles to refuel. The tanks are located as far from the main buildings as possible in case of an accident, we make sure to ground them in the event that lightning, rare in the northwest, decides it would like to pay the tanks a visit. 
The long, blessed summer continues. We find other survivors trickling in from both our forages for supplies and our drive through the areas for the burns. Our numbers swell to almost a hundred by the time the wall nears completion. The burns have taken out large tracts of land and left an overhang of smoke in the area. We eventually clear out most of the city neighborhoods in our proximity. We're fortunate with the layout of the cities, inasmuch that we don't have our fires run away from us into the areas where we want to scavenge supplies. The teams allocated for burns are put on a search of outlying areas for survivors, bringing in several more. Some days finding a few, and some not at all. The upper story of our sanctuary begins to get a touch crowded, but it's good to see that there are others who have survived. Additional trips to the armories are conducted, and supplies, arms, and additional vehicles are brought in. Robert and Bree's training concludes, and I begin taking them out when we have time to add to that training. I take all teams, and those who finish Lynn's initial training, through an advanced training designed by her and me— but I take Robert and Bree through a little more. I want to give them every ounce of my knowledge to give them every chance at surviving. We still continue to have our little moment of time together, with Lynn joining us on the roof, but have to step a little more carefully with the top covered in solar panels. Talks during our nightly meetings encompass longer-range plans for when the wall is completed. Some of these include bringing livestock and long-term food supplies in, setting up the pastures, feed, buildings, and other aspects to include the construction of a large greenhouse. Bannerman mentions that it would be nice to erect a water tower to pump the well water into and exploit the gravity flow. That would conserve on the pump being constantly utilized and preserve not only our electricity but the pump itself. He also wants to rig up and install one of the wind towers to make the pumping more of a manual process with the windmill. For some reason, both of these seem much larger projects than building the wall. The day arrives in late summer when we're ready for the last sections of wall to be placed. All of us gather outside to watch the wall teams pound the last beam into the ground— our measurements haven't been exact, and we have to cut the last partitions with a concrete saw. But, as we look on, the last piece slides into place. A cheer rises from the group as the partition settles into place and the crane shuts down. Our wall is built. Four miles of concrete barriers standing twenty feet high. Our place is as secure as we can make it for the moment— we have a gate spanning the width of the entrance road, two great slabs of steel, which Bannerman managed to locate in a foundry, are bolted into the wall and secured with a steel bar. The gates took some engineering to fit them without handholds that would allow night runners to scale them. The wall itself is set several feet into the ground, thanks to the use of a ditch digger, in case the night runners try their hand at becoming moles. This also adds to the structural integrity. Watching the partition slide into place and hearing the cheer, I feel a sense of warmth flow through. I can't believe we've actually done it. I think back to the stresses that I had on our journey back and how much of an overwhelming project it seemed, especially coupled with our having to survive each and every night to gather supplies. We've added to our group and built a place to be secure during the night. Well, hopefully, as it is yet to be tested. We've come a long way from our drifting from airfield to airfield, obtaining supplies and information, and surviving up close and personal encounters with the night runners on a much too often basis. We celebrate our first night's rest without the continual hammering at the front doors that night. The peace and quiet we experience is almost as loud in the absence of the constant noise as it was when it was here. We decide for everyone to have the next day off and allow for some relaxation and recuperation before we set off on the next phase of our sanctuary. Ah, sanctuary. How sweet that sounds. 
Robert asks the next morning if he and Michelle can go down to the bay and hang out by the water for the day. Bree asks Robert if she can go along. I tell them I don't have a problem with that, but I want Gonzalez to go along. Dad, we can take care of ourselves, Robert says in response to my request. I know you can, but you're taking Gonzalez with you, I reply. Go ask her if she's willing to accompany you. Robert returns a short time later with Gonzalez, Michelle, and Bree in tow. He asks if I'd like to go along, but I know he wants some time with Michelle without his dear old dad around, so I make up some excuse for staying. I take Gonzalez to the side and tell her to make sure she keeps them safe. For her to come back at the first indication of something that doesn't seem or feel right, I tell everyone that Gonzalez is in charge and that what she says goes. They depart within the hour with the sun shining down on this glorious beginning of a new day. The wall blots out the view of the immediate area, but it's nice to see it anyway. The mountains still peak above it to the east and west. Their Humvee departs, and I watch them disappear over the hill. I look over at the helicopter sitting by itself in a corner of the parking lot and think about taking it up. When out on practice flights, I make sure to drop by Fort Lewis for fuel before heading back, so I know it has almost a full tank. The thought of taking it out for a pleasure flight seems appealing with the morning sun casting its yellow rays down and warming the air. It seems like a different place now, almost a feeling of home. I head back inside after basking for a while in the sun's warmth and watch several flocks of birds flit about the field surrounding us. The days are getting shorter now, but it is still in the late summer and the shortened days aren't noticed as yet. I walk over to the base radio area and the maps that Frank has set up, wanting to check in with Gonzalez. It's only been a short while since they left and... I'm feeling like the worrisome father, but I want to assure myself nonetheless. The radio crackles as I draw near. Base! Gonzalez here! Base here, go ahead! Kathy, who is on radio watch at this time, says in return. We have a vehicle that started following us. Large red pickup truck! Gonzalez's voice comes through the speaker. Tell her to turn around and come back, I tell Kathy, motioning for her to relay the message. Before she can press the mic button, Gonzalez speaks again. Oh shit, they're trying to force us off the road, she says with her voice higher pitched. Her mic is still pressed, but it is evident that she's talking to someone else by the subdued nature of her voice. Turn the wheel to the... And there's a click over the speaker as the transmission ends. Epilogue he rises as he has on many nights previous. The breathing of his pack within the darkened room fills his ears. He knows instinctually that it's time to rise, time to hunt. The past nights have been repeat episodes of the previous ones, searching for the meager food still remaining in the area. Recently, the nights have taken on some differences. Several times, while running through the darkened streets, Flashes of light reach out from places as they trot by. The flashes startled him, and he searched for their sources the first few times it happened, without finding it. Several loud explosions erupt occasionally in the distance. One night, while investigating the source of one of the loud bangs that rang out in the night, he found members of a small pack lying in the street, and on the raised concrete sidewalk, their bodies mutilated beyond recognition. He knew something new was afoot in the area, but lacked the cognitive skill to know what it could be, just that it was. He didn't know if he should be doing something different or if the new sounds or flashes of light were dangerous. Seeing the other pack scattered about on the ground, he knew that anything that could bring down an entire pack must be dangerous and avoided but he had no idea what it was that did it. Food remained high on his priority list, but safety of the pack wasn't far behind. He did notice the smell of smoke that was now predominant in the air, making it hard to locate food unless it was close. 
He once ran across a large area that had been burnt to the ground, the large swath of ash and blackened area stretching far across ahead of him and running out of sight in each direction. He did know, in a way, that the other two-legged ones, possibly the ones the other packs were trying to get at in the large structure, were responsible for this. On this night, as on the others, he makes sure his pack is awake. One male tries to couple with a female as she rises. He grunts, shoulders the male, and sends the image that now is not the time. They must start the night hunt. The other male grunts in frustration, but follows him out of the door. They make their way from their lair in the back and across the smooth floor. The smells of rot are strong in this area, but he ignores it and makes his way toward the broken door leading outside. Stepping through the broken glass beside the actual doors, the light smell of smoke replaces the stench inside. He stops just outside, hoping for a scent of food close by, and listens. Strangely missing are the shrieks, indicating that other packs are still trying to get to the food in the large building a short distance away. His mind momentarily wonders as to the reason why, but then is forgotten. Not smelling any nearby food, he grunts and starts trotting ahead, deciding to start to his right, distancing himself from the large two-legged enclosure. Too many other packs will congregate there, so his best chance of finding food is away from there. A few steps into the parking lot and his world is suddenly and violently intruded upon. A large flash with an accompanying explosion barely registers as he's catapulted forward. He feels himself slam into the ground, and all goes dark. He awakes with a panicked feeling that a lot of time has passed while he has lain in darkness. The fear arises from not knowing what happened, an instinctual feeling of survival— it also comes from not knowing how long he has been out and fearing the painful light will be in the sky soon. His head is pounding, and he isn't able to think very well. He reaches out with his mind but can't sense any others of his pack nearby. He opens his eyes and raises his head. Relief, well, what he feels as relief, comes as he finds it is still night, and death from the light in the sky hasn't found him. Pushing himself to his knees, he glances around. The other members of his pack lie on the ground around him, still, not moving. There is a lingering smell not unlike when the other two-legged ones made those noises with their sticks that caused the death of some of his pack in nights previous. As he looks around, there is a noiseless click in his head. A warm flush rushes through his mind. Images and sounds come in a flood. He grabs his head not from pain, but from the multitude of noise that seems to be dancing inside. Another noiseless click, and he looks up in wonderment. He suddenly senses other packs of night runners as they run through the streets and fields. The ability is no longer confined to short distances. He knows he can push and receive the images of their communication over a greater distance. He also has other memories of before being transformed. That's how he thinks of it, being transformed. He looks up at the large red S on the building that he and his pack, or what was his pack, laired in, and knows it's a Safeway store. How he knows that now or rather, how he didn't before, confuses him. Not all things come back into memory. How to use items and knowledge of certain things remain hidden. He doesn't know what a gun is or how to lock or unlock a door, but his mind is still flooded with some memories. He knows they walked into a trap that killed a lot of his pack members. He realizes he has another language in his mind, as he gazes up at the Safeway sign above. The others running in packs won't know it, but he knows that the other two-legged ones have this language. He knows he was once one of them. 
He also knows that part of him is gone. He's now one of the transformed. The name Michael Benson rings in his mind. He knows that name. He knows it is him. He remembers. The End This has been a John O'Brien production of A New World, Sanctuary. Written by John O'Brien. Narrated by Mark Gagliardi. Copyright 2014 by John O'Brien. Production copyright 2014 by John O'Brien. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.